Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen. Amen. Namaste. Oath or affirmation, announcements by the Speaker, bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers, reports from committees, Prime Minister's questions, urgent questions. The member for Barataria Sano. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. To the Attorney General, will the Attorney General confirm whether or not it is the government's intention? to file an appeal against the injunctive relief granted to former Commissioner of Police, preventing the Prime Minister from laying in the Parliament any of a purported report on the issuance of legal firearms by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In answer to the question posed by the member for Barataria San Juan on the 13th of December, 2022, yesterday, the Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago by my office filed Notice of Appeal P3112 of 2022 between the Attorney General, Prime Minister, members of the National Security Council against Mr. Gary Griffith. And the application for an urgent hearing was filed today. Madam Speaker, can the Attorney General indicate to this Honorable House the fees paid and or invoice in relation to this matter to the attorneys at law and record for the state? I consider that out of order based on the question asked and the answer given. <laughs> Member for Oropu, yeah, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, to the Honorable Attorney General, uh, Mr. Attorney General, do you consider it an appropriate use of taxpayers' money? Yes. Let me repeat that. Ms. Madam Speaker, could you ask? Okay, so members, allow the member for Oropuch East to exercise his right and responsibility as a member of parliament. I will determine if the question is in order. Member for Oropuch East. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, do you consider it an appropriate use of taxpayers' money to pay lawyers to challenge the injunction, bearing in mind the judge's intention to give a final decision in this matter in three months by March 2023. It is an appropriate use of taxpayers' money to challenge a decision which is patently wrong on face. Member Fanafarima. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Finance, in the light of the Central Bank November 2022 Monetary Policy Report, released this week, which included, which indicated rising fuel prices were significantly impacting inflation and food prices through increased transport, transport costs. Will the minister state whether the government is prepared to immediately remove VAT from the sale of fuel at the pump? Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, it is always Unfortunate when honorable members opposite do no research, do not read, do not bother to understand anything, check nothing, misquote, misinterpret, misstate, and also make statements that make no sense. With respect to the impact of increased fuel prices on inflation, if the honorable member had bothered to check one would see the actual component of fuel itself in the inflation calculation is small. What happened, as happens often, is after the fuel prices were raised, which had a very small effect on inflation, 
transport providers took the opportunity to increase their prices exponentially. It was a case of price gouging. The effect of the fuel price was less than 1%, but the transport providers doubled and tripled their prices. Minister, is the minister denying the actual words of the monetary policy report, which says, the central bank report, which says, subsequent increases to maxi and taxi fares and transportation costs in general can have a more substantial effect, an inflationary effect, and, and cost of living expenses. Minister Finance. Madam Speaker, that's exactly the point I'm making. The actual increase had a very small effect on the inflation number, but subsequent increases in taxi fares and transport rates is what caused the problem. That is what happened, and unfortunately, that is what happens in this country. The cost of fuel may, for a trip may go up by 10 cents, but the taxi fare may go up by a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. Unfortunately, that is what happens in Trinidad and Tobago. Member Fanaparima. Is the, is, is, is the minister denying that the, the, the increase in prices in, in, in gasoline led to an inflationary spiral, spiral, whatever the cost, and therefore a reduction in the cost by VAT of 80 cents per litre of premium gasoline will have a significant impact on the pockets of consumers in this Christmas? Minister Finance. Madam Speaker, I'm grateful for the opportunity to point out that in 2022, the fuel subsidy liability for the government was somewhere in the vicinity of $2 billion, and in 2023, it could be a billion or more. The VAT collected on fuel is less than $200 million, and therefore, the VAT is a fraction of the taxpayer's money, because the fuel subsidy is taxpayer's money. So you're taking from one pocket to put into another pocket. It's over a billion dollars we spend on fuel subsidy, and therefore I am afraid that that request cannot be entertained. Questions on notice. Requests for leave to move the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent public importance. Statements by ministers. Personal explanations. Introduction of bills, motions relating to the business or sittings of the House and moved by a minister, public business, government business, bill second reading. The Attorney General. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. I beg to move that a bill entitled An Act to Create Measures to Regulate the Business of Dealing in Scrap Metals and Other Related Matters be now read a second time. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, the scrap metal industry in Trinidad and Tobago and worldwide is big business. In 2020, the global trade of scrap metal was valued at approximately US $128 billion. The largest generators of scrap metal include the United States of America, Japan, and the United Kingdom. The largest importers of that commodity are China, Turkey, and India. The growth of this industry globally has also been reflected domestically. According to data from the Central Statistical Office, scrap metal exports rose sharply from approximately Trinidad and Tobago dollars 82 million in 2009 to an estimated 285 million Trinidad and Tobago dollars in 2021, an increase of 248%. Significantly, this industry provides viable business opportunities for a number of small and micro industries in Trinidad and Tobago. It promotes the country's socioeconomic objectives, including job creation, export promotion, income generation, foreign exchange earnings, as well as 
the added benefit of a cleaner environment by the removal of derelict items and hazardous waste. This exponential increase in exports has also, unfortunately, involved a concurrent increase in the larceny of various metals that support the country's critical infrastructure on a scale which has threatened our very national security capacity. The telecommunication services of Trinidad and Tobago, the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission, and the Water and Sewerage Authority are among the utilities severely affected by persons who have stolen millions of dollars worth of cable and iron pipes. During August 2022, Madam Speaker, it was reported that the police recovered Trinidad and Tobago $1 million in iron and steel poles belonging to the Ministry of Works, which were found at one scrap iron yard in central Trinidad. At the end of July 2022, persons stripped out TSTT's underground fiber optic and copper installation in San Fernando, interrupting communication services to tens of thousands of customers. Persons also unlawfully entered Wasser's California booster station and stole electrical cables. The estimated cost of damage was $400,000. The Ministry of Public Utilities reported that TSTT spent $15 million in restoration works and TNTech spent $3 million as a result of the larceny of cable and iron. The private sector, including the Downtown Owners and Merchants Association, in June 2022, call on the police to take action as copper thieves were caught targeting businesses in Port of Spain, among other places, our capital city, Port of Spain, hacking away copper lines attached to air conditioning units on rooftops. Significant also in the scourge of illegality associated with this industry is the proliferation of illegal scrapyards, money laundering, and concealment of illegal firearms. The history, Madam Speaker, of attempting to regulate this industry dates back to 2013. And what we are engaged in today is simply an updated, robust culmination of more than 10 years of study for the attempted regulation of this important industry. In 2013, there was an approved scrap metal policy for Trinidad and Tobago. Consequently, the Old Metal and Marine Stores Amendment Bill 2013 was prepared, further revised in 2015 after consultation with the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Given the rapid changes to the industry and the new developments emerging during the last decade, however, the Ministry of Trade and Industry undertook a further review of its 2013 policy. This involved consultations with key industry stakeholders, including, as far back as 2015, among others, the Trinidad and Tobago Scrap Iron Dealers Association, the Environmental Management Authority, the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, the Ministry of National Security, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, and the Ministry of Health. Their comments and feedback were incorporated into a revised scrap metal policy for the period 2022 to 2027. Madam Speaker, honorable members of this August House will recall that on the 12th of August of this year, as a result of the very rampant illegality in this industry, which had in threatened, as I've said, our very national security infrastructure. By legal notice 164, issued by Her Excellency the President under the Customs Act, this government was constrained to shut down the scrap metal industry until the 28th of February, 2023. By legal notice 183, passed on the 8th of September, 2022, limited exports were permitted on that banned export of scrap metals, subject to specified conditions being complied with by exporters who, at the 12th of August 2022, had already obtained export permits. Those conditions were to provide full disclosure by exporters of all supporting documents in respect of the goods already cleared for export. Two, the provisions of names and addresses of the dealers from whom the scrap metal was purchased, and three, permitting inspection of the contents of the containers which had been cleared for export. Madam Speaker, without divulging more detail than is prudent, given the possibility of prosecutions which may flow, I am able today to advise this Honorable House 
that consequent on that legal notice, legal notice 183, which permitted customs and excise to gain entry into containers in accordance with those prescribed conditions, significant amounts of copper have been recovered from containers which at August 12th had already been cleared for export, and that process is ongoing as we gather here today. Immediately following on the issue of the first legal notice on the 12th of August 2022, as Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Madam Speaker, I passed a brief to the Law Reform Commission for the urgent development of a policy paper and a draft scrap metal bill 2022 for urgent reform of this important industry to enable me to take that policy and bill to Cabinet for its approval. The remarkable professionalism, competence, and urgency with which the Law Reform Commission, the Legislative Drafting Department, and other extremely competent legal professionals within the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Legal Affairs undertook this challenge must be acknowledged today. By their hard work, they have enabled me, Madam President, to bring that policy paper and draft bill to the Cabinet for its approval in the period November through to December 2022. Well ahead of the 28th of February 2023 deadline, which this government had originally committed to. I salute them. I salute the reality with which I am proud to associate myself today of being part of a team of this ministry of a very committed professional body of hardworking public servants who are committed to the future of a safe, thriving Trinidad and Tobago. The policy prepared by the Commission identified the several challenges presented by an antiquated law with no enforcement capacity. This policy, as approved by Cabinet, examined the operation of existing laws governing the industry in this country, noting that at present, the industry is principally regulated by the Old Metal and Marine Stores Act, with guidance provided in the Import and Export Control Regulations 1941 and the Trade Ordinance 1958 for the purpose of granting export licenses. The policy now, Madam President, Madam Speaker, I beg your pardon, is clear. Modern legislation is necessary in order adequately to address the multiplicity of issues with which this industry is grappling at present. The aim is to create a legislative regime that reflects the industry in a modern, well-regulated economy and which legislation strengthens current crime-fighting initiatives in relation to the criminal activities plaguing the industry. The policy accordingly accepts the need to repeal the current act and for the introduction of new legislation to regulate that industry. In order to give effect to the recommendations contained in the policy, the Commission prepared the Scrap Metal Bill 2022 approved by Cabinet, which is before this Honourable Chamber today. Madam President, the bill which is before this House today is the culmination of a significant process of consultation which had its origins under the auspices of the Ministry of Trade and Industry. In August 2022, the Office of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs established a Scrap Metal Industry Regulation Ad Hoc Committee comprising key stakeholders, including the Law Reform Commission, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Customs and Excise Division, the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, and the Ministry of Trade and Industry. The committee was mandated to address the, play, the issues plaguing the industry and to make proposals for reform after consultation. Since August 2022, Madam Speaker, stakeholder consultation was conducted in three ways. I emphasize that throughout, the Law Reform Commission, which was tasked with preparing that policy and drafting this bill, was provided with the responses of the stakeholder consultations and took into account the views and recommendations of the stakeholders finalized in the bill before this August House. The first consultation was very thorough, involving very pertinent feedback from the ad hoc, members, ad hoc committee members and their recommendations to modernize the economy, the industry. Secondly, through a questionnaire which was sent out in October 2022 to the Scrap Iron Dealers Association and other key stakeholders, 245 responses were received, all very pertinent. And thirdly, in November 2022, 
Along with the Minister of National Security and the Minister of Trade and Industry, I met with collectors and dealers to discuss the way forward. At this meeting, we informed stakeholders of the work of the Law Reform Commission, of the draft scrap metal bill, which had been prepared months ahead of schedule, invited discussion with stakeholders present, and followed up with an e emailed summary to the stakeholders that weekend of what the bill proposed with a further invitation to send in comments for the consideration of the cabinet when it met to review and approve the bill. Very useful stakeholder input was received in that way. The Commission also undertook a comparative analysis, Madam Speaker, of the laws of regional jurisdictions such as Guyana, Jamaica, Barbados, and internationally, the United Kingdom, as it pertains to provisions relating to the industry such as licensing regimes, types of licenses, information to be provided upon application for a license, the provision for a register of licenses, the powers of entry and inspection, as well as offenses and penalties. Madam Speaker, the laws in Barbados, Jamaica, and the United Kingdom are comprehensive and detail particular information that an applicant must provide in his application. This bill adopts much from and reflects those provisions. The jurisdictions examined also provide for a register which has the benefit of creating the forum where the appropriate information on all licenses issued can be recorded, updated, and checked. In line with the provisions of the United Kingdom and Jamaica, this bill also provides for the establishment of registers. With respect to the powers of entry and inspection, the respective jurisdictions provide various law enforcement officers with specific powers of entry and inspection of vehicles and sites that engage in the scrap metal business. The government of Trinidad and Tobago is cognizant of the fact that any regulatory regime is only as good as the enforcement regime that supports it. Hence, the approved policy recommends a power of entry and inspection. As it concerns offenses, the approved policy highlighted the need for higher penalties to encourage compliance with the law and also to act as a deterrent. Madam Speaker, I now turn to examine the bill itself. In brief, <clears throat> the bill seeks to modernize the law governing the scrap metal industry by repealing the Old Metal and Marine Stores Act, Chapter 84, Number 7, and introducing new measures to regulate the business of dealing in scrap metals. Therefore, the bill seeks to provide the line minister, that is to say, the Minister of Trade and Industry, with power to, among other things, issue, refuse, revoke, renew, suspend, or vary two types of licenses, a scrap metal collector's license and a scrap metal dealer's license, to establish registers of licenses granted, to appoint scrap metal inspectors to perform certain functions under the new legislation, to exercise a regulatory making power. The bill also makes provision to regulate how, with whom, and when a licensee may conduct business, such as no business with a person under the age of 18 years or outside of certain hours. And finally, creates numerous offenses to be enforced by way of administrative fines or with hefty penalties, both at the summary and indictable levels. Madam Speaker, I turn to examine the, the bill in greater detail. Part one of the bill contains the preliminary provisions such as the long title, commencement, and interpretation. I wish to draw honorable members' attention in particular to the definitions of authorized officer, deal in scrap metal, and scrap metal itself. Part two of the bill focuses on the new licensing regime. Clause three provides that a person requires a license to conduct the business of dealing in scrap metal. And clause four provides the qualifying criteria to apply for a license, such as age, nationality, and specified criminal convictions. Clause five seeks to confer on the line minister the power to grant, refuse, renew, vary, suspend, or revoke a scrap metal collector's license or a scrap metal dealer's license. A license may be issued subject to specified conditions, requirements, or restrictions, but will not be issued retrospectively, nor in relation to a dwelling house. It is to be noted that as a condition of this license, 
a licensee must consent to the entry of authorized officers on his scrap metal site during working hours to allow the officers to perform their duties under the act, such as inspection of the site, scrap metal records, scrap metal stored there, and generally to ensure compliance with the act. The consent of the applicants for met scrap metal dealer licenses or scrap metal collector licenses is important in that it means that the enforcement of the provisions of this bill will be done with the consent of the persons in possession of and managing those sites and therefore does not require this bill to be subjected to anything but a simple majority vote. Clause 6 will address the issue of applying for a license. This will be set out in greater detail in the regulations, including the application form, the fees, and the form of the license itself. Two points are to be noted. A license is valid for one year only, but renewable on application, and a person applying for a scrap metal dealer's license must name another person as the site manager of the scrap metal site stated in the application, so that that scrap metal dealer is not allowed to say, well, I didn't know what was going on on the site which I operate as a scrap metal site, because that dealer must employ a manager to manage that site to comply with the law. By clause seven, the minister will have the power to refuse an application for a license in specified circumstances. Example, the applicant is a person under 18 years of age or is an undischarged bankrupt or the application contains false or misleading information. Clause 8 will seek to confirm the Minister, Madam, Madam Speaker, the power to renew a license. This would be done essentially if the applicant had operated within the Act or the terms and conditions of his license or other matters which are to be set out in the regulations. An application for renewal must be made three months before the license expires to the Minister in the prescribed form and pay the prescribed fee. Clauses 9 and 10 seek to give the Minister a power to revoke or vary a license respectively, both in specified and prescribed circumstances. Note that a variation cannot transfer a license from one person to another. An application for a variation is made to the minister in the prescribed form upon payment of the prescribed fee and must set out the change required. An obvious case would be where a dealer has appointed a new site manager. Clauses 11, 12, and 13 allow for the application of the principles of natural justice. Simply, a person will have to have the right to be heard before the minister decides to suspend or to refuse to grant or not renew or revoke a license. And if the minister does not grant nor renew or revokes a license, the minister must notify the person of his decision with reasons for the decision. In other words, the decisions must be made on a rational basis and on rational grounds. Clause 14 is a prohibition against the transfer or assignment of a license, which will also not pass to a new owner who buys a scrap metal dealer from a licensed dealer, who buys a scrap metal site from a licensed dealer. I beg your pardon. Madam President, Madam Speaker, part three of the bill sets out the provisions to regulate how a person can conduct the business of dealing in scrap metal. Clauses 15 and 16 provide that a scrap metal collector's license is required to transport scrap metal. The license must be prominently displayed in the motor vehicle being used to conduct the business. The collector must obtain personal information from the person from whom he purchases or receives a scrap metal, and he must get a signed and dated statement from that person that that person is the owner of the scrap metal or has the authority to sell it. Clause 17, on the other hand, seeks to provide the rules applicable to a scrap metal dealer in the conduct of his business, such as possession of a valid scrap metal dealer's license, satisfying certain prescribed conditions, prominently displaying a copy of his license and a business, nine, a business sign with his name, etc., at the scrap metal site. Clause 18 seeks to set out some conditions applicable to both a collector and a dealer, such as receiving or buying scrap metal only during 6, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., sorting or loading scrap metal at a scrap metal site only during 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., 
No scrap metal business with or employment of a child. No scrap metal business with a person who appears to be under the influence of any intoxicating liquor or drug. And loading a freight container only at a licensed scrap metal site. Clause 19 seeks to impose the duty on a scrap metal dealer who buys or receives scrap metal to keep that scrap metal at the scrap metal site without selling or altering for 15 days. That is an obvious stipulation which will permit persons who fear that their scrap, their premises have been stripped to be able to go to a scrap metal site, alert the inspector, the ministry, and have the scrap metal inspected within 15 days of it being stored at that site. Clause 20 also seeks to impose another duty on a scrap metal dealer who wishes to operate from a new business address. That scrap metal dealer must apply for a new license for the new scrap metal site. Clause 21 will impose a duty on both scrap metal collectors and dealers to keep proper records of their scrap metal business at the time of each transaction, and the record must be in writing or electronic form. By Clause 22, the record must be kept for at least six years. Part 4 of the bill addresses the issue of exporting scrap metal, Madam Speaker. It is to be noted that this bill does not make specific provision for an export license for scrap metal. That is because by clauses 23 and 24, a person wishing to export scrap metal will be required to get an export license under the Trade Ordinance 1958 from the Minister of Trade and Industry because scrap metal except copper will be added to the export negative list. And may I interject at this stage that the bill that has been passed eliminates copper from the definition of non-ferrous metals, and there is going to be no capability to deal in copper as part of scrap metal until the government revisits this particular issue, and that is not likely to happen for at least another year, while this new legislation, if passed by this House, brings the regulation of the industry into manageable proportions. The export negative list provides a list of goods requiring a license for export from the minister. The exporter must give at least seven days written notice to the minister and to the commissioner of police so that the relevant officers can be present to inspect the loading of the scrap metal and certify that it is fit for export. Part five of the bill deals with inspections. By clause 25, Provision is made for inspection of premises by authorized officers, as defined in Clause 2, who may enter and inspect the scrap metal site, scrap metal on the site, records or vehicles or containers on the site. Entry may be made at a reasonable time when the site is open for business with or without notice to the site manager. By Clause 26, a police officer may stop and search any person whom he suspects is in possession of stolen scrap metal and if necessary, arrest the person and seize the scrap metal for investigation. Part six of the bill deals with scrap metal inspectors. They are to be designated as such by the minister under clause 27, and clause 28 sets out their functions. Part seven of the bill provides for the creation by the minister of a scrap metal collector's register, a scrap metal dealer's register, both of those being public registers, and a private register. These matters are provided for in clauses 29 to 31 as follows. The registers may be in written or electronic form. The public may inspect and get a copy of an extract from any of the public registers. The minister may disclose data in relation to a private register in very limited specified circumstances. The minister will have management of the registers and must ensure that the information therein recorded is correct and updated. Where there is a change in any information in relation to the scrap metal business of a collector or dealer, that dealer or collector must inform the minister who is required to make the necessary change to the register. Part 8 of the Act, Madam Speaker, speaks to provide for the use of administrative fines in lieu of criminal sanctions. 
By Clause 33, the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Trade will have the discretion to offer to a person by notice the chance to pay an administrative fine within 21 days. The offence and the fine will be set out in the regulations. Part 9 of the bill. Clause 34 sets out a number of general offences which will be punishable summarily or on indictment, such as knowingly given false or misleading information on an application for a license, operating as a scrap metal collector or as a scrap metal dealer without a license, operating as a scrap metal dealer or scrap metal, at a scrap metal site not listed in your license, failing to display your license, displaying a false or invalid license, failing to keep proper records, knowingly falsifying information on the export documentation, documentation for the export of scrap metal. Part 10, Madam Speaker of the Bill, seeks to deal with numerous miscellaneous provisions under clauses 35 to 41, such as a general power for the Minister to vary time under the Act, a right of appeal to challenge any decision of the Minister under this Act to the Court, a power to the High Court to suspend or revoke a license upon conviction, a transitional provision to address current licenses a power to make in the minister to make regulations and repeal of the old metal and marine stores act amendments madam speaker as i have said before and i saluted the officers within the ministry of the attorney general and legal affairs for the remarkable time period within which they have brought, enabled me to bring this bill to this House. In due course, Madam President, Madam Speaker, there is still work to be done. As a result, at the appropriate time, the government intends before this House to move a number of amendments to the bill. This bill up to this point in time, as complete and as comprehensive as it is, still been a work in progress. But it has been brought to this House because the government recognizes that there are persons in this industry, legitimate, bona fide members of the community who earn a living from this business, who need to return to work, who need to return to earn money from this industry. And it is for that reason we have brought this bill before this Honorable House for passage today. We will be proposing today as part of the work in progress at Clause 2 to expand the meaning of an authorized officer to include a constable appointed under the Supplemental Police Act. My ministry has been in active consultation with the Ministry of Trade and Industry. The government appreciates that it will take some time before the Lion Ministry can train and appoint scrap metal inspectors. Hence, the proposed amendment is to provide additional enforcement personnel to the Ministry, those personnel already existing in law, supplemental police, whilst it puts in place the procedure to appoint properly trained scrap metal inspectors and to allow for the introduction by the Minister under Clause 40 of comprehensive regulations. There is an editorial amendment that is proposed at Clause 5. In Clause 7, the government will propose that the minister may also refuse a license where he is of opinion that the applicant is not a fit and proper person as prescribed. In Clause 11, we propose to expand the power to undertake an inspection prior to suspension from only scrap metal inspectors to all authorized officers, which will include supplemental police officers. This amendment is necessary to allow for the operation of this provision whilst the Lion Ministry establishes the procedure to appoint scrap metal inspectors. In light of the prior consent envisaged by this bill to be given by licensees to permit the entry of authorized officers on their scrap metal sites, we propose to amend Clause 25 to make it clear that these authorized officers may enter scrap metal sites without a warrant and with or without notice to the site manager in order to perform their duties and under the Act. 
They may also use reasonable force if necessary to perform their duties. A police officer would, however, need a warrant to enter a dwelling house if he reasonably believes that an offense under the act was or is being committed at that house. The government proposes in clause 27 to allow the minister to be able to designate any person as a scrap metal ins inspector and not just public officers. This will expand the pool of persons from whom the minister may consider for appointment as such officers. Finally, Madam, Pre Madam Speaker, the government proposes to introduce a new transitional provision at clause 39 to allow licenses in existence under the current old metal and marine stores, which is being repealed should this house pass this bill today, to allow those licenses to be deemed to be scrap metal dealers licenses under this bill when passed into law and to be valid until the 14th of April 2023 or such later date as the minister may by order determine. In order to benefit from this provision, however, the license holder will have to make a declaration that he consents to the entry of authorized officers on his scrap metal site. The form of the declaration will be inserted in a schedule to the Act to make it easy for license holders to comply with this condition. The date of the 14th of April 2023 was appropriate given that it is the same date already set out in Legal Notice 2015 of 2022, which extended other periods of time specified in Section 4A1 of the current Act which is to be repealed. The Minister will also be empowered to impose terms and conditions on these transitional scrap metal dealers licenses and to specify those scrap metal sites to which they apply. The deeming of existing licenses to be scrap metal dealers licenses would make existing license holders scrap metal dealers under the Act. This is consistent with the discussions we've had with stakeholders to permit the industry to reopen under this bill once passed into law in the shortest time even whilst we build out the further regulatory regime, which is a work in progress. This way, Madam Speaker, the government is able to bring certain enforcement and other provisions of this bill when it becomes law, which relate to the right regulation of scrap metal dealers into force before the full proclamation of the act. For example, authorized officers would be able to begin entering and inspecting scrap metal sites, charging scrap metal dealers for offenses under the act, and monitoring the loading of containers for the export of scrap metal. This amendment will also ensure that the current licensed scrap metal dealers will be able to operate once this new Section 39 comes into force, but for a limited time and to be supervised by the more comprehensive regulations when those come back before, when those are promulgated by the minister, which is subject to negative resolution under Section 39. 40 of the bill. Madam Speaker, in conclusion, the current act, the Old Metal and Marine Stores Act, Chapter 84, Number 7, is clearly ill-suited to address the growth and resultant challenges in the scrap metal industry in Trinidad and Tobago today. The act came into force on August 26, 1904. This bill seeks to provide a modern regulatory framework to manage the scrap metal industry, especially in light of the archaic nature of the current act. The government is confident that the bill will address the many challenges, including criminal issues currently facing the industry, whilst giving a lifeline to the small business people of this country who rely on this industry for their livelihood. Madam Speaker, I beg to move. Honourable Members, I shall now propose the question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled an act to create measures to regulate the business of dealing in scrap metals and for other related matters be now read a second time. Member for Miaro. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to join in this debate today and respond to the Honorable Attorney General. 
Madam Speaker, let me say from the outset that we on this side fully, unequivocally support the regulation, the regulating, and control of this scrap iron industry. But it must be grounded on good law that is reasonable and fair. Madam Speaker, the basic rule in crafting proper legislation is that you do not judge policies based on your intentions, but you judge policies based on their outcomes. Madam Speaker, one would have thought that when this industry was closed a few months ago, it was done with the premise that it would have put a hold on criminal gangs who were engaging in a serious amount of theft, as indicated by the Attorney General in terms of our uh, telecommunication infrastructure and so on. But Madam Speaker, six months later, there has been no indication that those who have engaged in those activities have been brought to justice. And while doing so in terms of the shutting of the industry, hundreds of families have been placed on the breadline. Madam Speaker, let me say this bill and how it's laid out and presented is possibly a victim of government's approach to the drafting of legislation and to governance generally in a very mismatched type of way. Madam Speaker, with only a few days left in this year and the government not having accomplished much with respect to their legislative agenda, this ill-advised and, might I say, a bit sloppy version of the bill has been brought to this parliament, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this bill is a bit half-baked and ill-considered. That the only explanation that the government is racing to deliver on its promise in presenting legislation in this calendar year of 2022, and Madam Speaker, it is evidenced. The Attorney General came today with a number of amendments which he proposes for today. So clearly, the rush over the last couple of weeks or couple of months to get this legislation in place, only today the Atten Attorney General has identified some key issues that he tends to bring amendments to, I guess, when we get to the, the committee stage, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this industry, as indicated by the Attorney General, is worth about $220 million each year. And um, my intention today, Madam Speaker, is to go through a bit of the clauses which were presented today, not in too much of detail by the Attorney General. And I may touch the surface of many of them, while my colleagues who would come after me may drill down on matters of labor, constitutionality, and some other areas of general law. But Madam Speaker, the biggest thing for me is that this bill is really burdened with red tape in terms, and it doesn't match our entrenched culture as a society. And I will explain those things as I go on in my presentation today, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, you would recall that the government received several proposals from the scrap iron dealers and other stakeholders for the legitimate and efficient administration of the industry. Generally speaking, Madam Speaker, those measures from the players of the industry met best international practices. I can inform this House that through the Dealers Association, although they were engaged in several conversations with the cabinet appointed body to look at this industry, my information, Madam Speaker, is very few if any of the recommendations as put out in the legislation today are hinged from some of that conversations that were made with the dealers, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, even worse, one would have thought that the government, in pioneering legislation to determine the future of an entire industry, would have had the good sense and decency to share the legislation with the stakeholders and allow time for digestion and feedback. Madam Speaker, I am informed that the Dealers Association may have only laid eyes on this bill, just like us last week Friday. So that to me, Madam Speaker, would not have given the main stakeholders the time to digest what is being put forward before this parliament today. Madam Speaker, 
This is how you rule with a bit of um, disrespect and a bit of lack of empathy, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the bill is not good law, and we really ought not to support bad law, and I would proceed to give some examples as we go along. Madam Speaker, this industry is really important to Trinidad and Tobago. It's very important in terms of the fact that, you know, as indicated by the Attorney General, um, it has substantial benefit in terms of international trade. And when you look, there's an expected output in the industry of over 748 million metric tons of scrap metal by 2026. Also, this industry, it leads by pursuing in this industry, Madam Speaker, it leads to a reduction of CO2 carbon emissions, which is a significant part of our energy saving and environmental impact. Madam Speaker, the potential is huge for Trinidad and Tobago, so we must pursue it. And clearly, I'll just remind you all of the standing orders. 53 for members who are not speaking. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would like to begin, begin my analysis with a few comments on part one, which provides some legal interpretations of relevant terms and seeks to place them into context. Clause two, Madam Speaker, lists a public health inspector of a regional corporation as an authorized officer. But Madam Speaker, my concern here is that a municipal corporation, PHI, is a contracted worker whose term typically runs for two years. So my concern is, is, it really begs the question of what happens to a PHI who is no longer employed while a matter in which he may be a central figure is before the courts. What happens to him and his testimony? Given that officer, that power, and his contract is not renewed sometime down the road, would that lead to collapse cases in an already struggling judicial system, Madam Speaker? Would justice be served? Among the definition, is also, as, as indicated by the Attorney General, is the scrap metal inspector who will be appointed by the minister in accordance to Section 27. For one, a scrap iron inspector would simply be someone designated by the minister, but is he going to be appointed by a decree, but not as a result of specialist training or experience? But today, the Attorney General has identified that he will be focusing on some training and so on for these officers. And in the meantime, he is going to use supplemental police who may have a little more training than those new ones. So I look forward to seeing that amendment coming from the Attorney General uh, later in the proceedings today. Um, Madam Speaker, Another issue that I have is that, you know, they, they speak about these, these inspectors um, being public officers. Now, we all know that public officers are appointed by the Public Service Commission and not by a government minister or cabinet. They can do contract employees. The question here, Madam Speaker, is what is the benefit in terms of, you know, you have public officers. Are they going to be moving across the public service? Where do they're going to come from? What are their backgrounds, their skills, their experience? Because clearly, under the legislation as it is, they can't be contracted officers, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I were to go to part two, clause four, section three. Clause four, three comes, in my view, Madam Speaker, into conflict with four, one, based on the wording. And if you were to just follow me for a couple of minutes, Madam Speaker, 4.1 sets out to explain who is eligible to set up a scrap iron business in Trinidad and Tobago. Besides being a national or resident within a minimum age, a limited liability company must have at least 38% native, which I suspect is Trinidad and Tobago shareholdings, as set out in 4.1a, and the balance, I assume, can be foreign ownership. So, you know, you don't have a foreign company owning a large scrap iron business in this country. But, Madam Speaker, if I were to draw back your attention to 41A, numeral, numeral III, 
It also states that a citizen of a CARICOM member state other than Trinidad and Tobago is eligible. So if 4.3 instructs that 38% shareholding must conform to 41A123, numeral 123, am I to assume that 38% can be owned by a member of a CARICOM state and the other 62% by an entity outside of Trinidad and Tobago? Madam Speaker, this may be a drafting error if I'm reading it wrong. Well, the Attorney General can correct me. But I don't want to end up in a problem where, because of how it is worded, we end up with a foreign company having 100% ownership in, in a very um, important industry like the scrap metal business in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'd like to draw your attention to part two, in particular to clause 4.4. Four. This stipulates that a licensee must agree to permit access to his or her property by an authorized officer by virtue of the granting of the scrap iron dealer or collector's license. I would like to know, Madam Speaker, if there is a constitutional issue here, are we eroding a constitutional right by pinning unwarranted and unnecessary searches or entrance into your place of business and pinning it to the granting of the license? That is something perhaps we'd like to explore as the debate goes further. Madam Speaker, this provision raises the issue of abuse by abuse in law by rogue officers who may initiate unlawful searches and conduct illicit activities. But I must stress, Madam Speaker, that the overwhelming majority of officers who carry out their public duties under various law are honorable, dutiful, and professional. But it is foolhardy as well, Madam Speaker, to ignore the fact that there are crooks in the system. Licensees, therefore, could face unwarranted and illegitimate searches and be criminally set up, as they say in colloquial terms, Madam Speaker, and they can get themselves in a heap of problems based on these persons, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, under the proposed law, the license holder is being held responsible even for an unlawful search by a criminally minded officer. And these are the reality of our culture here in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, we continue to see the occasional abuses of the law by people in this country, people of authority. The unchecked mandate given to officers must be viewed in that context, so I would like to explore whether there's a constitutional issue by allowing them that unfettered right through the granting of the license. Well, so if I could allow, ask you to turn your attention to clause 4.5. Now this 4.5, it's, it's, it's very vague and it highlights the point that I made that the legislation may be hastily designed. The stipulation is that the minister may require any further information to be submitted without, within a specific time. Madam Speaker, I therefore ask, what is further information? Is it the blood type of the licensee? Is it his polling or electoral division? Madam Speaker, this ambiguous language may be the, either the result of poor drafting or a bit of negligence on the people's part who put it together. Surely, Madam Speaker, even this government should know that such unclear and dubious terms are unacceptable in, le in legislation. I would hope that this too can be revisited by the Attorney General or some comment be made on it to bring further explanation. Madam Speaker, the government must indicate the specific range of subjects in which the minister may have an interest. Those matters must be appropriately listed. Further, there must be stipulated minimum time period for the licensee to deliver an official request. It cannot be based on, you know, an arbitrary notice that I've given you one week, or two weeks, or five months, or six months. My view is that there should be fixed time frame, and if the, license, the licensee wishes additional time based on the issue, he can then apply for some additional time. Madam Speaker, an example could be if a minister 
demands that the history of a licensee inventory be provided within 24 hours. That could be a problem, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm not suggesting in any way that any minister would be mischievous, but in the conduct of his duties, he could insist that substantial material be furnished in a period of time that makes the exercise impractical. These are the reality of, of our existence, Madam Speaker. We must prevent that in the legislation. Madam Speaker, if I ask you just to turn to Clause 5, Section 1, which gives the Minister widespread powers to grant, revoke, refuse, renew, and suspend a variety of li or very licenses, sorry. On the face of it, Madam Speaker, it is my view that these powers are too excessive and far-reaching for a Minister of Government. When you consider that the Minister could act in his own deliberate judgment, the powers become worrisome in the hands, and I'm not saying of this administration, but any administration going forward into the future who thrives on vindictiveness and a type of discriminatory type of system, that is what we must prevent in when we draft laws, Madam Speaker, that we don't give a government today or in the future that type of power. Madam Speaker, there are no conditions that are being placed on the restriction, or no restrictions placed on the minister in the legislation. Madam Speaker, the minister is not duty bound, in, in my reading of the legislation, to accept expert advice. The minister does not have to explain or justify his or her action as far as the legislation goes. The relevant minister could act on the basis of impulse or partition, or partition bias or favoritism, which is something that is widely alleged throughout our, our dynamics in our society, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I think this is an unjustifiably unjust, wide berth that has been granted to a line minister, and we are going to register our opposition to this particular piece of legislation. Madam Speaker, if I ask you to just turn your attention to Clause 5.5, 5, which is totally unreasonable in my respective view, it states that a license shall not be granted in respect of a dwelling house. Now, I heard the Attorney General speak on the issue of dwelling houses, and there should be some provisional arrangement with licenses to, for continuance going forward. But this is the point I want to make about the dwelling houses, Madam Speaker. The dwelling houses, historically, and its compound have been used by the vast majority of small scrap metal dealers over the years. So, and I mean scrap metal dealers, very few of them own large fancy buildings with a lot of, uh, you know, land around it to conduct the business. They are not corporations, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, this culture that we have in our society, are we going to tell these scrap iron dealers, even if they are given a moratorium until sometime April next year, how are they going to move? How are they going to avoid coming into conflict with the law of operating the scrap iron business within the confines of their dwelling house? Madam Speaker, the minister probably, or somebody who is responding, could indicate a bit of justification for debarring the use of the premises around a dwelling house. Um, you see, we don't want the government to be accused uh, of acting in an arbitrary or uh, prejudicial manner. Um, if a valid and accepted justification can be presented, will the minister consider granting a provisional license given a fixed period to these scrap iron dealers who are operating in their dwelling houses or in the, the, the vicinity of their dwelling houses a, a, a fixed amount of time to exit their premises and perhaps look at another location to conduct their business. Perhaps it may be well within the state's um, facility to zone perhaps non-arable state land as alternative locations for these licenses, licensees who are operating in the confines of their dwelling homes to set up their collection yards. That is going to help tremendously the smaller operators at the end of the day, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I were to ask you to look at Clause 6.2, this is also questionable. It stipulates a one-year duration for the license. My question is, Madam Speaker, why one year? 
There has been no rational, perhaps in the Attorney General's wind-up, he could perhaps identify why one year was chosen for these licenses. Madam Speaker, the short term is particularly problematic in our highly bureaucratic public service, which the government has been pushing its digitalization at snail space over the last couple of years. So, Madam Speaker, the principle behind the moves really escapes me, Madam Speaker, assuming that you know, there was some thought process in, in putting these licenses for one year. Madam Speaker, if I were to ask you to look at clause six, three, four, and five, clause six, section three, four, and five, which calls for the naming of another person as a site manager. Madam Speaker, that in itself, to me, it looks like a prescription for chaos, and I'll tell you why. It is difficult to understand the need to insert another named person on the license for someone who does not share a vested interest in the business, Madam Speaker. So you have the owner who has his interest, his investment, his property, his time, but now we are asking to put somebody who does not have a vested interest in the business on the license, and you can run afoul of the law if that person is not named or if there is someone else as a site manager and that name is not listed on the license. Madam Speaker, a site manager is a salaried employee who can leave, who can be terminated for cause in a moment's notice. This scenario, Madam Speaker, is unlike what obtains in, as far as I'm aware, in any other type of business activity. It appears to be a case of calculated and forced entrepreneurship, Madam Speaker. What makes the scrap metal industry so peculiar that a named person must be indicated in the application form of the license? Now, I can accept that a position or a classification of a key position be described and mentioned in the law, but to name a person outside of someone who has a vested interest as a holder in the license. I think it's a, rep a recipe for disaster, Madam Speaker, and perhaps the Attorney General could take a look at that one more time. Um, this provision, Madam Speaker, could make the license holder expose, exposed to possible extortion or unnecessary demands, financial or otherwise, from a site manager. Because, you know, the license could well be holding you know, there's a term they say holding a tiger by the tail in having a partner only to fulfill the obligation of the law as well. So I, I think this requires a bit of revisiting, Madam Speaker, and I know the Attorney General has indicated today that it is a work in progress. I'm hoping even after today, in his review, he can look at some of these issues which are real cultural issues that we have to address going forward. Madam Speaker, Clause 7 is... Again, further proof of a bit of um, lack of consideration in my respectful view in, in drafting the clauses in this bill. Madam Speaker, in Clause 7, the minister has been authorized to refuse to grant a license if he is of the opinion that issuing such license would be contrary to the public interest. Now, let me tell you where it gets a little tricky. Is the minister going to be guided by his opinion with respect to the public interest, if not substantive facts. The bill does not spell out the, the core matters, Madam Speaker, of public interest by which the minister must be guided. And I'll give you some examples, Madam Speaker. Would these key interests pertain to the environment, geographic location, spatial planning? Madam Speaker, in terms of the public interest, and I have to ask the Attorney General, who is going to determine the minimum size of a scrapyard? One lot, one acre, 10 acres? Who is going to determine, Madam Speaker, the geographic location? Can we set up a scrapyard in the middle of Port of Spain or the middle of San Fernando? Can we use the lands that is adjoining the botanical gardens to put a scrapyard? What about next to a school, a church, or a hospital? Can we use a site for a scrapyard that sits on an aquifer or a water table. So those are the areas where I see definite 
that a minister could say no. In the public interest, we say no. But I suspect those are very broad areas that we have addressed in other legislation. I know we looked at it in the cannabis legislation that we can put in terms of the definite law that a, a, someone who is applying for a license knows that if you are in, in, in breach of these areas, you're going to get pushed back, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in absence of such details in the legislation, the government could face accusations of being prompted by subjectivity instead of specifics. Madam Speaker, in the process, an applicant could be denied the opportunity to make a living or look after their family, and that could have serious consequences for any government. Madam Speaker, Clause 8 authorizes the minister to renew a license if there were no changes in the circumstances that existed at the time the license was originally granted. Now, Madam Speaker, this creates a spectra of an applicant being denied renewal if, for example, the site manager has been changed. A slight change of circumstance, no matter how justified, could rule out a renewal. Now, in the legislation, I saw where, where the law does provide for the minister to make an update to the licenses, but, Madam Speaker, the reality of the industry is that the participants, very few of them are folks who have perhaps a very strong and, 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 and long uh, educational background of MBAs and first degrees and so on. And you may end up in a situation by virtue of, you know, the fact that, you know, you have a process, a paper process, a paper filing process. Um, some of those people may miss those updates and changes and then they can be subject, subjected, as seen in the section on offenses, very steep fines and issues with regards to jail time as well. So. I don't know how the, the, the Attorney General can relook at some of that in terms of how would you make it easier for the, these um, updates, the changes of the licenses, which could hamper um, some, some of their, their renewals at the end of the day. Madam Speaker, Clause 8, Section 2 states that an application for renewal of a license must be made not later than three months before the expiration of the current license. This seems to suggest that the real life of a license is really nine months, since the licensee must engage in the reapplication process in the final three months of his or term. Again, Madam Speaker, this brings into question why a one year, because again, we are adding more bureaucracy in terms of these renewal and these applications, Perhaps that is something the, the Attorney General could look to revise that and, and, and extend it beyond one year rather than having all this bureaucracy dealt with in such a quick time period, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I were to go quickly to Clause 9, which empowers the Minister to revoke a license if the licensee is no longer eligible to carry out the business. This authority to revoke based on eligibility is separate and apart from conditions listed in Clause 9, B, C, D, and E. So the relevant question that I have, Madam Speaker, if in Clause 9 you've identified B, C, D, and E, which is standard reasons not to, um, sorry, to, to have your license revoked, what it is in, in, in A that will make a license holder ineligible outside of the factors identified in B, C, D, and E. So I, I, I am a bit um, <clears throat> lost in terms of what those issues around eligibility are going to be, if not what is stated in B, C, D, and E. Madam Speaker, perhaps the Attorney General could uh, answer that question in his wind-up. Honorable Member, you have about 35 seconds left of your ordinary speaking time. If you wish, you are entitled to 15 more minutes sure. to continue. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Thank please you. proceed. Madam Speaker, I'd like to turn your attention to Clause 11, in particular, Subclause 2, which stipulates that the minister must inform a licensee of reasons of his license being suspended. The licensee would be required to remedy the breach in the time specif specified on the notice. 
Madam Speaker, my view is that they should have fixed time in law for remedying all breaches, no matter what the size and the shape, and as indicated before, if the licensee requires additional time based on the breach, he must then notify uh, the minister or the body that, listen, I need an additional two or three months based on this particular breach. Madam Speaker, if we were to turn to part three, clause 15 states that no person shall transport scrap iron unless he or she holds a license granted by the minister. Now, Madam Speaker, there is a, there is a situation that is going to arrive here. What if someone is delivering scrap to a dealer? What about someone who is clearing his property of scrap from a torn down building and they are moving the material through a third party transport company? That person is transporting scrap iron, but he does not have a license. So he comes in to the arms of the law in terms of the breach because clause 15 is stating that you must have a dealer's license in order to even transport scrap metal, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, what about a public agency? Let's say like the municipal, the regional corporation, they do have bulk waste, bulk, bulk waste days where they move old stoves and freezers and so on. Would they come into conflict of the law if they do not have this license to transport metal, scrap metal, Madam Speaker? What is their legal risk in terms of their bulk waste scavenging? So that is something that I feel that the minister must look at in terms of how the transporting should happen. Madam Speaker, sec, uh, clause 16.5 debars an operator from purchasing or receiving scrap iron without verifying the person's full name and address and a signed and dated statement of ownership. Madam Speaker, is this document that has to be signed, is it going to be a statutory declaration from a JP or a commissioner of affidavit, or, or is it some, a piece of paper in the back of an envelope that you are going to sign? The law is not clear in terms of you know, what this document ought to be, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in absence of something definite, there could be a, a waste of precious time and money, and again, more red tape, as you know, we, we discussed earlier. Madam Speaker, I want to touch quickly in the couple of minutes that I have left. Uh, clause 18D, which debars anyone under the age of 18 from being involved in this activity. Madam Speaker, a lot of family businesses have children and grandchildren who work inside of these businesses. I do not know if the legislation is specifically looking at those persons or, or an employee who is on a payroll, but I know in a lot of family businesses, you do put your, your grandchildren and your young teenagers and so on who may not be doing very well in school, but they stay in the family business. You put them on the payroll to register them for NIS and so on. So they now become employees of the business. That is a cultural reality that I feel that the legislation is not dealing with and having this issue of uh, less than 18 would put a lot of families in a bit of conflict and bring them in front of the law by just having the family business move forward, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there's other issue about debarring someone who's at the age of 18 because at 17 he can drive a car and at 16 the National Insurance Board sees you as an employee because they accept you in their system for national insurance. So that is something that I think could be revisited to see how real this issue of the age of 18 or whether we want to look at family members who are working in a family business. Does this interfere with the law as proposed, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, the other issue, 18E, talks about the influence of drugs and alcohol. Now, let me make it very clear. I, we on this side, we don't condone any substance abuse, but we would like to, we'd like to ask, who determines the employee who is under the influence of drug or alcohol? Would an inspector make that determination? And if so, what criteria would he be guided by? Would he ask for a blood sample or a breathalyzer test? Would a charge be proffered on that person? What is the offense and what is the penalty? So, so Madam Speaker, how would this be enforced? So those things are not clear in the legislation. Perhaps the Attorney General or the next speaker could clear some of that up for us. Um, clause 18.3 states that the loading of scrap iron into a freighter containers must be done at the site of the license holder. But it comes back down again, Madam Speaker, when these containers are filled, 
and a trucking company has to take it to the port, does the trucking company run afoul of the law by transporting this metal in this container and they don't have a license? Perhaps the, the, the attorney general could look at having a transportation license by itself for third party operators who are in the business of transport who would cover them from running afoul of the law for moving this type of metal, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, and lastly, before my time is up, um, this issue with regards to 24, clause 24, which calls for the most extensive and precise in the identification of someone engaged in any business. Madam Speaker, the law is asking you, someone who is selling this scrap material, to provide ID. It could be ID, passport, and imagine they want you to describe the color of their hair, their eyes, any distinguishable features or marker. But I'm thinking the way how the law is written, it seems that they want, to, want you to draw a, a copy of the person and perhaps color them with crayon as well. So, so Madam Speaker, I think what's going to happen is that the way how the bureaucracy is designed, it's going to stop people from being able to legally sell their scrap material. It's going to put metal dealers in a bit of a bind that they will be hesitant to buy this material. And next thing, the material will end up in landfill. It will end up in rivers because nobody wants our old fridge and stove in front of the home. They drive down the road this evening and throw it in a river and we end up with the issues of flooding and so on. So, so Madam Speaker, you know, the issue of the bureaucracy that is identified, I think with the best of intentions, I know what the Attorney General wants to do, really put some controls, put some systems that we can hold this thing together. But the bureaucracy could work against us, Madam Speaker. And I hope uh, during the course of this debate, Madam Speaker, some clarity could be brought to some of these amendments. And with those few words, Madam Speaker, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Minister of Trade and Industry. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, and let me say it's always a pleasure to come to this honorable place. And yeah, let me say that it's always, I'm always pleased to come to this honorable place, and I'm absolutely pleased to contribute to this bill, which is before the House today, which is intended to repeal and replace the existing Old Metal and Marine Stores Act. Uh, and create a new and well-regulated scrap metal regime for Trinidad and Tobago. But before I go into my full contribution, I would just like to say a few words on, um, based on the member of Fumayaro's contribution. Firstly, I want to correct the records because he's here. He, he said that we are here six months later dealing with this, and I want to correct this because it's not six months. We are here in just over three months. The ban was a six-month ban, but this government did everything possible. The Honorable AG, the Law Reform Commission, the CPC, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and worked on this, and they've brought this before, before the Honorable Place in, in less than four months, just over three months. So I correct the records, it's not three months, not six months. Again, he questioned whether or not we listened to the proposals from the scrap iron dealers. And I think that the AG dealt with that in terms of the number of consultations that we've had, not only with the Scrap Iron Dealers Association, but with all associated persons and entities involved in the trade of scrap iron. And I can tell you, even before we started or we completed partially the legislation and before we came up with the draft, the Ministry of Trade and Industry from as far back as 2019 has been in touch and has been consulting with the Scrap Iron Dealers Association and they know that and other members associated with the industry. So you are wrong on that as well. And what we have brought here today what we have brought here today before the House is really very modern law. 
law for the future, and I cannot understand what difficulty the member for Mayaro would have with the very detailed laws which have presented today. We don't doubt the importance of the industry, but we make the point that the problem which we had before must not now exist. And therefore, the industry must be one that is well regulated. And here we are with well documented law for the modern law for the future. What we want to ensure is that we have an industry with zero crime and zero corruption. And this is the nature of the, uh, of the law which is brought before us today. I mean, the member for Mayaro struggled in his presentation to bring up all sorts of concerns and nuances. Not all of them are valid, and therefore, where valid, I can tell you that many of the issues raised would be captured in regulations. You can't place all of the details, the minute de details, into the law. So there are regulations to be brought, and the AG has given us a date of August 14th, by which the regulations will be brought, and by which, by which we would have full implementation of the law through the Ministry of Trade and Industry. The, uh, the member brought up again the question about inspectors being public officers. The AG did raise that there is, in fact, an amendment which deals with this particular issue, where the minister by order, there's a new, we are now deleting public officers and we are substituting with the words any person. And it is precisely for that particular reason to avoid um, the, the, uh, the, the, the problems which may um, come up with the, with, the defin with, with the definition of who is a public officer. Hence the reason why we have gone with the, with the more generous words, any person, which would then give you the opportunity to use contract officers as well. So the new clause will, will now read, designate any person to be scrap metal inspectors for the purpose of this act to inspect scrap, scrap metal sites at reasonable times uh, but, uh, to ensure compliance with this act or any conditions, restrictions, or requirements subject to which a license in, 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 is granted. So we, have now we are now using any person. Again, he criticized um, the fact that the Ministry of Trade and Industry is being, gra um, is being granted, powers that, granted powers that are too wide. And, um, and I'm not sure what exactly the minister, the MP wants, have in regard to the fact, to the kinds of issues that we have had um, that, that, that existed before and which brought us to this position where we really have to review, the, where we have had to review and replace and repeal the entire piece of legislation before us. So they, I can give you the assurance again that there will be no, as he suggested, as he wants to suggest, there no, will be no question of acting on impulse or fear favoritism or anything like that. The, the law is detailed as it is, and in fact, detailed regulations will be developed, and that is going to be based on sound government policy, some of which I will give you a sense of if I have, if I have the chance, but I can tell you that the Law Re Review Commission has in fact sound de developed sound policy already which has to be revisited, yes, but they've already done a lot of work which will guide the regulations that are now to be formulated, right? We, the Ministry of Trade and Indi of Industry will in fact be developing a very dedicated scrap metal unit and therefore there's no, the, the issue of the one year will not, be an, will not become a problem because we are already at an advanced stage of digitizing the processes that would be involved under TT BizLink and therefore the operations and the renewals would be, would be well handled within the, um, within the year that is now put forward in the bill um, on account of it being very efficient through TT BizLink, which we're all familiar with. That the question of the site manager, absolutely necessary, and I c couldn't understand why you would have a problem with that. Dealers are not always on site. They are engaged in all sorts of, um, as, and the definition will tell you that. Dealers are involved in 
in, the, in all sorts of activities along the value chain. And therefore, it is absolutely necessary we, that we have the site managers who will really understand what's going on in the business and will, re, re, and will be required, and who will be required to ensure that what is, what, um, what is legislated and what is in the regulations will in fact be followed. So site managers, absolutely necessary. Um, he seemed to have a question with dwelling houses, and I'm not sure what really is his concern there, but what I would give the assurance to the, the, to the scrap metal dealers and, of course, to the public as well, because I don't think anybody wants to have a scrap metal um, dealer operating a scrap metal site next to their residential home. So we want, we will be all, I think the population will be concerned about that. And this is why you have to have the necessary land use permission from town and country planning, and that must be submitted if it is, uh, uh, that must be submitted in order to obtain a dealer's license. So that, again, is, is very clear uh, in terms of dwelling houses. Uh, Member for Mayaro, I'm really sorry for you here. Um, you, you, what you would like is for us to have child labor in the, in, 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 involved in this industry. And I want to see, and you call it cultural, but I want to say that this is not the position of the government. Absolutely not the, the position of the government. It cannot be cultural that we would have children 14 and 15 and 16 years old engage in scrap, um, in scrap iron dealing and, and collecting and so on. When you know the sort of nefarious activities that, are, that have been in operation alongside this industry. Very, very poor reflection on you there, um, member, and I'm quite surprised. But I want to say that the government is aware, is aware of the importance of the scrap iron industry to the economy, and therefore the ban that was placed was purely temporary, and it is re really to treat with the prolifer pr proliferation of crime and criminal activity, and of course, more particularly, the ramp up rampant theft of infrastructure that we were witnessing uh, um, within the industry. But it was always our intention to strengthen the existing scrap metal legislation. And as of 2019, the, the Ministry of Trade and Industry had begun its, res its research. And certainly, um, our, our outlook is to see beyond even what we are doing now um, as to whether or not the industry can, in fact, be further developed along the metal recycling value chain. This is where, ultimately, we would like to see the, um, the, the, the um, industry go. So, I want, and again, I don't know if I, I came in a little later, I'm not sure that they, if, whether the, the AG drew reference to the fact that there are a number of countries globally that have been in the same position as us. Even around us in our neighboring countries, Bahamas, Jamaica, Guyana, they have all had to impose similar export bans to treat with the same criminal, um, uh, same, same criminal issues within their scrap, um, um, scrap metal industries. And I can tell you outside of the region, countries like South Africa, Kenya, have all again had to institute the same bans and so on. And again, in the, in, oh, and in the UK, in the case of the UK, they had a ban as well because they then wanted to treat with the fact that they will not use cash at all within the industry. So it's a global issue. There are global issues asso associated with the industry. And what is consistent is that prior to the expiration of all of these bans in these various countries, every country has developed and modernized the legislative and the regulatory framework governing the industry. And this is what we are doing at now uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. So it will, this bill will bring focus to a new and well-regulated industry. And again, set the foundation again for possibly expanding the industry along the value chain. Now, and we, 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 I started off by speaking, and this is started when I spoke to, when, when I began my actual presentation, I, I was, I addressed, uh, I spoke about the importance of the industry to the economy. And one of it, and we acknowledge, is em employment. And so I would tell you that the industry contributes to the livelihoods of thousands of citizens, and we recognize that, thousands of citizens. I can tell you, though, there are about 160 scrap metal yards across this country. Problem, only 81 of them are registered. So the, ne so, so the other 80, and that's an estimate that we have, are unregistered. 
And that therefore tells you that this is a serious issue, serious problem that must be dealt with. But we understand the implications for employment. But, and so therefore, we are called to deal with it. If half of the, uh, of the sites within Trinidad and Tobago are unregulated, it cannot be left as, it, as is. And I'll tell you, these are across the country, and we sought to understand where they are. And people think that they're only in Claxton Bay and Chaguanas. Well, Claxton Bay has about 50 yards. Um, Chaguanas has about 40. In Arima, there are about 20. Port of Spain, there are another 12. Pinal, another 10. It's across the country. Gasparillo, Williamsville, there are another five yards. In Port Point Fortin, another four yards, and so on. We have done the work to understand really what is going on and the basis for which we must put in place this, this level of um, law and regulations as well. So significant employment, and apart from that, I'm saying that the thousands I speak of would include all of the unregistered collectors, those, and there must be at least 500 of those. There are also those recyclers themselves. There are re-exporters. There are those involved in the logistics and provision of services related to the industry as well. And of course, we are all aware of the itinerant ones who go around on a Saturday morning calling, um, calling out for scrap iron and so on. So we are well aware Again, it's unregulated largely, and therefore it must be the focus now must be on having must be on having um, this industry fully regulated. The other the other big plus is the export capacity, and AG would have spoken a little bit, I think, about the uh, the importance of it globally. And I want to just bring some statistics um, to the population and utilizing data from the World Integrated Trade Solution, it is estimated that global imports of scrap metal, and that's both ferrous and non-ferrous, uh, including copper, in 2021 was valued at US 117, US 117 billion dollars. That's, that, that's the length and breadth of this industry. 117 billion US, and I asked them to look at 2019 because I thought it, it, it perhaps the numbers would have been down during the COVID period. But no, in 2019, it was just 75 US billion dollars. So it tells you this is growing and expanding, some for good reasons, some for not. But the point is, um, again, we have there is the importance of it being properly regulated. So China is the biggest ex em um, ex importer of, um, to the extent of 15 billion. Turkey. India, Germany, all substantial importers, South Korea and the US at, 70, at $5 billion. Alternative, alter, uh, alternatively, the value exported globally then from the figures from the same source was uh, in 2021, $106 billion, with the largest exporters being the US at $16 billion US, uh, Germany, you, the UK, Netherlands and J Japan. So it means what I'm saying to say what I'm saying, uh, Madam Speaker, is that countries across the globe are involved in this kind of industry, and there's no reason why Trinidad and Tobago should not be. The fact is, we must be, but we must be very, re very much regulated. And another plus, again, um, is that the use of scrap metal is used in manufacturing, and therefore, again, along the value chain, we would love to see that much of it is could be but maybe better use here than exported to be used in somebody, someone else's manufacturing process. Again, the other, um, the other um, positive about this, this industry is that uh, is, it, it relates to the environment because the scrap metal recycling reduces the use of chemicals that are needed for ore mining and uses significantly less fossil fuels. So again, very important in terms of um, climate change, et cetera, but also, as we know, well know here too, it rids the country of waste and junk, which is hazardous in many ways as, as well. But in Trinidad and Tobago, according to the CSO, we, um, our scrap metal exports have now um, increased substantially from uh, 152 million TT in 2017 to $284 million in 2021. Um, with about 16 exporters of scrap metal in 2021. And I'll tell you, the exporters in many instances 
are not the dealers. Many dealer, dealers are involved in the business of dealing, and, I, and I'll come to the definition of that. But um, there are few, fewer huge exporters that are involved, and they too need to be regulated because a lot of the nefarious activities, not just among the dealers, but also among those big exporters as well. So again, highlighting the need for this very, um, very detailed law and very detailed regulations to come as well. So the exports have been significant, and despite the ban, it, had, it has lowered, yes, but it is still a substantial. When I looked at the 11-month period, um, um, January to November of this year, it was at $193 million. So very valuable to the economy in terms of, of earning foreign exchange as well. As a matter of fact, when I look at, looked at the non energy figures, you'll be surprised. It is in the top 10 in terms of non-energy exports. So important, and therefore it must be well um, regulated. So um, I want to say that, um, again, the data is very clear that the, um, the industry has provided significant income earning opportunities for individuals, micro-businesses, small businesses, etc. And uh, um, and therefore, we want it to be um, to remain as a viable industry for them, and and contribute to the achievement of all of the socio-economic objectives and export diversification and foreign exchange generation and so on. And I want to tell you that all of this fits nicely within our our vision 2030, which is about theme four, building, global, among other things, building globally competitive businesses, and theme five, placing the environment at the center of social and economic development. I, I want to speak a little bit about compliance with international environmental agreements, but because my friend will never seek to bring up these sorts of concerns, which are very, very important to the industry, especially as it's growing. So the, I said before that the industry plays a great role in terms of preservation of the environment and the protection of public health and the management of old and hazardous metal waste. And so therefore, it takes into account our national environment, uh, uh, environmental objectives and international environmental obligations. So it's important to note that Trinidad and Tobago is a contracting party on the control of transboundary movements of hazardous waste and their disposal. And therefore, the main objective of the Basic Convention is to protect human health and the environment against the adverse effects of hazardous waste. And its scope of application covers ha hazardous waste, including, including non-ferrous metals. Again, so we, it is very important, again, that we are compliant with the, um, the Basic Convention, uh, uh, f for which, to which we are a contracting party. And therefore, uh, again, we, um, we must be in compliance with regard to all of this transboundary movement of these hazardous wastes and so on. And it, we must ensure that the waste is managed and disposed of in a very environmentally sound manner. Hence the importance, again, on the environment. Um, so the... I don't think that it's necessary for me to go in too much. I think the... the, the, the um, the AG, the move of the bill, would have spoken about the, 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 the policy development and uh, those who were involved, the LRC, the Ministry of Trade, the, all of the de scrap iron dealers and so on. And uh, um, so I want to say that what is before us is really very comprehensive. And I want to em emphasize that. Uh, because there seems to be some flippancy in terms of what the expectation of the opposition was. It has to be, and therefore what we've brought to you today and worked very hard at is very comprehensive legislation which adequately reflects the views and recommendations of the stakeholders and which, we, uh, and, and which also ensures that we, the Trinidad and Tobago is compliant with our international agreements, etc. And therefore, I think what is presented is favorable to all of the stakeholders once they, once they make up their minds and that if I want to be in this business, these are the rules. This is the law, these are the regulations. If you break the law, if you do not comply with regulations, there are serious repercussions for it. And there's good reason for that. 
and therefore the Ministry of Trade and Industry would be want would want to um, to completely um, support the AG, the Attorney Attorney General, in the presentation of this bill that is before us, because again we want to see the de the, the developed industry, and of course we want to be ensure that criminal activity is um, indeed stamped uh, um, stamped out. Now. And it's a way forward, because I'll tell you, the, the bill, the, 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 the current act, is re there are several sh shortcomings associated with that, with that. And therefore, it really is outdated, being a more than 100 years old. And if you go even to the definition of old metal, you would find that it doesn't even categorize what's ferrous and what's non-ferrous and so on. It just refers to old metal. So it's completely inadequate. And, of course, the criteria for granting a scrap metal dealer's license is, is very, very lenient. It just asks for a police certificate. Uh, they go before a magistrate with the police certificate and the inspection by fire and the TPS and public health, and that's it. Um, and so it's, it's again, too lenient. Uh, there's no requirement to license mobile scrap metal collectors, which is something that must be addressed. And of course, there's a proliferation of unlicensed scrap metal sites, as I said before. And um, the current regime also does not provide the environmental and the public health standards, which licensed sites must comply with. And, uh, and of course, there has always been the issue of the inspections, which must become a thing of the past and will become a thing of the past as well. So again, so this current legislative framework will therefore correct all of the issues and, the, uh, and um, with, the, uh, with the old bill. Again, uh, there was nothing in the old, uh, in the old bill, or the, it still is the current bill to guide the purchase and the collection of scrap metal. It's all inadequate and ineffective and so on. And many scrap, buy and, uh, scrap, scrap metal dealers do not properly store. That's another big issue. They do not store their, their loads properly when being transported. I know minister has a problem with transport. The M, sorry, not minister, the MP for Mayoro uh, does have, has a problem with transport. But again, the reason why we have to, t to, to impose these restrictions is because many of them do not properly load the, 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 the goods which they are transported. And therefore, they are in breach of the regulations under the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Acts as well. So again, I'm just highlighting uh, um, all that, that was needed to be corrected and of course the, fa the, the increased penalties and fines under the current act, the old act, are insufficient to deal with the criminal activity and therefore I, I'm strongly in support, the Ministry of Trade is strongly in support of the increased fines and so on. So I can tell you that uh, the, I'm very pleased with some of the new aspects. Madam Speaker, may I ask the... Oh, Minister, you have um, you, your ordinary speaking time ends at 3.22, so you have about five minutes left. You're entitled to 15 minutes extended time if you wish to continue your contribution. I certainly wish to continue, Please. and I thank you, Madam Please Speaker. Please proceed. There are a couple of things that I want to elaborate on that are new to this bill, namely the, the question, the, the inspectors, the collector's license, which is entirely new. And um, I think I may speak a little bit about the export license time permitting as well. And so the difference, one, one, so there are three types of license associated with the bill, which will be the collector's license, the dealer's license, the collector's is new, and of course the export license under the Trade Ordinance Act as well. As I said, um, so this scrap metal collector is distinct from a scrap metal dealer and was not at all caught under the old, under the old, or what, or I'll still say current because we haven't passed the law yet. And therefore, the clause 16.5 states that a scrap metal collector is required to verify. So there are no details and therefore this collector must have a license Right? You don't want to know that anybody is entering your premises, and you don't know um, who he is, what he's associated with, or anything like that. So, th therefore, um, there are specific requirements for collectors, and Clause 16.5. Uh, states that a scrap metal collector is required to to verify his the full name and of the uh, and, uh, and address of the person he's getting the scrap metal from. I can tell you. As Minister of Trade and Industry, sometimes I check on the work of the Trade Licensing Unit, and 
many times I have seen where persons have sought to get their, these licenses, export licenses, and I've asked for the list, the accompanying list of sources of, uh, of, sources of these um, purchases of, of, of um, scrap. And when I look at it, I'll tell you on one occasion, I saw the very same list repeated the same Sandra, Jane, and Mark purchased uh, uh, repeated in, um, for another export license. And this is why we, we have to be so strict with this. So the full name of the, and address of the person from whom you're getting the scrap metal, uh, signed and dated statement from the person that he is either the legal owner of the scrap metal or is legally entitled to sell it. Also, the, it, the 16.5 prohibits the collector from offloading, storing, packing, or sorting scrap metal anywhere but at a scrap metal site specified in a scrap metal dealer's license. It also requires the scrap metal collector to verify the information obtained under the... Un, um, Verify the information obtained as well, and also, um, yeah, and 16.5, by referring to documents, data, or other information from reliable sources, such as valid, you know, valid national IDs, et cetera, and so on. So again, it puts some, um, some measure of strictness into how these collectors operate. And this would, and then of course, I think we would be more familiar with the dealer's license. And I think the Honorable AG spoke a little bit more about the um, about the dealer's license. And I would not go there. The, um, so let me say now that the Ministry of Trade and Industry will now have the responsibility of the granting of the dealer's and collector's license. Um, so this is now being moved away from the magistrate's court and it will now allow the minister to grant, refuse, re um, renew, vary, suspend or revoke a scrap metal collector's license and scrap metal dealer's license. I know my friend from Mayaro had a concern about the, f uh, the fact, uh, a concern that the, the, it, things will operate in a very free-for-all environment and I can tell you, absolutely not. And I had sta said to you that even now, now, in the original policy, which is the basis for this, um, for the for the, the the bill which is before us, there are details on the um, on the on the on the reasons for revocation. There are details again on the conditions to suspend the license. And of course, we are going to be refining these and going into them. And of course, the conditions to refuse a license as well all very important. Like for instance, we will refuse to grant a license uh, under section six, we refuse to grant a license to any person who is under the age of 18 years, and I say that again, who is an undischarged bankrupt who has been convicted during the period of five years immediately preceding the date of the application, so that all of these, there are details that are to be built out. What is not in the legislation, you would certainly find in the regulation. And again, a most important figure, not there before, is the scrap metal inspector, and very, very important, Clause 28 provides the duties of a scrap metal inspector. I mean, I've already indicated the importance of a well-regulated regime and compliance, and that is the role of the scrap metal inspector. Uh, that, post, that inspector will have the focus on inspecting the scrap metal sites and the collection of activities and the monitoring for compliance and so on. And the inspector will also collaborate very, very closely with the other authorized officers that are named, be, be it the officers from the Trinidad and Tobago Police so Service, from the EMA, from the public health officer, from um, public health of, uh, officers associated with the municipal corporations and so on. So all of this is similar to what obtains in our neighboring jurisdictions. And you can go back and research and look, have a look at it. All of this is what obtains now. And we've drawn from the legislation of Jamaica and Guyana and so on. So the scrap metal, and, and, and you will see there that the scrap metal inspector will operate out of the scrap metal unit under the Ministry, Ministry of Trade and Industry. And the unit will be the body that is responsible for the implementation of the scrap metal in industry legis legis legislation. And so this scrap metal inspector, he will, as I said, examine the scrap metal sites, facilities, et cetera, so, uh, um, 
interview the staff working at the scrap metal site, take samples or photographs of the scrap metal, inspect the motor vehicles or containers used for the storage of scrap, tag any vehicle or container which the inspector believes to be in contravention of the, uh, of the new act. Uh, we also give directives to, to any operator of any vehicle or container used for storage and transportation of scrap if they're not operating in a proper, proper way. And of course, the inspector would be involved in the review and, uh, and, and, and the extraction of records and documents where necessary as well. And I, I, I detail these because, Madam Speaker, I really want to show the rigor and the powers included in this new bill to allow for proper enforcement and to really encourage compliance with the industry. The only way it will grow and develop into something else better than it is now in just, uh, just um, trading, collecting, and, and exporting as it is, is the only way is via public regula um, is via proper law and proper uh, reg regulations. So again, let me just say the export, um, with regard to, ex to the export, nothing changes there. It requires an exporter of scrap metal to obtain a license from the, from the Minister of Tra Res Responsible for Trade and Industry under the old trade ordinance uh, um, um, of 1958. I want to say though, what's different about that, about the export, is that the bill introduces this fit for shipping certificate, which will be issued by the scrap metal inspectors and signed by the um, police officer that is present and so on. And I think AG spoke to the process, which would involve seven days written notice and, um, and with written notice specifying the location and time of the loading, uh, requiring the, uh, the commission of police to ensure the relevant officers are present. I'm talking about um, uh, whomsoever the, um, the commission of police may send, maybe a constable or a, a definitely a member of the TTPS, and so on. Of course, Clause 24 also restricts the loading of a freight container to the scrap metal site specified in the license of these uh, um, in the license of the scrap of the licensed scrap metal dealer, and so on. And of course, it requires the fit for sh um, fit for shipping certificate as well. Right, very, very important. Um, AG would have spoken about the um, record keeping. Again, a responsibility that the, that the Ministry of Trade and Industry would have, both with regard to public registers and also, um, and also a, a private register as well. But again, the minister has, with responsibility, has therefore has to therefore establish and maintain for each type of license granted, being the dealer's license, the collector's license, collector's license, and also the export license as well. There must be public um, registered registers for that. Also a private register as well, in, um, in, which could be in written or it could be in electronic form. And I can guarantee you that eventually it will be in electronic form sooner rather than later. Again, all of this is to ensure um, th that th there is conform uh, conformity with the law and um, and of course the public being able to to, to verify anything through these public um, through the public register. So I want to say as well um, in a little time that um, that I have. I want to speak to the. Uh, let me just tell you what is going on at the Ministry of Trade and Industry right now to, to facilitate the immediate implementation of the Act, right? So that we are working very closely with the CPC and the Law Reform Commission to prepare the regulations for the scrap metal industry, and this is expected. This will be before uh, the Parliament, well before the deadline, the instituted deadline of August 14th. And therefore, before that, a note will be taken to Cabinet with the draft preliminary regulations and um, so that we have the approval to take this to CPC to prepare, to the CPC to, to, to prepare and so on. And these regulations will include all of the prescribed forms and of course the fees, the, all of the procedures as well. There will be an established scrap unit within the Ministry of Trade and Industry within the Trade Licensing Unit and, um, and, that, and that scrap, um, that unit will be able to deal with all of the um, the, the, the 
all of the matters be, that are required uh, in terms of as laid out in the law and the regulations. Of course, it will have, there will be functions for the officers under that particular unit. There will be an organizational chart, et cetera. It's going to be a proper unit um, un, um, established uh, under, the, under the Ministry of Trade and Industry. So there's much work um, to be done, uh, of course, including the hiring of the scrap metal inspectors, which, or, which ha will have to be recruited. I want to say, in the short time that I have again, um, I want to just speak to the outlook again. Uh, uh, yes, we are engaged in, de in dealing with the, um, with the collection the dealing, what is known as the dealing, the export of scrap material. Uh, but I want to again emphasize and look to the future uh, where the use of recycled material in manufacturing is becoming more and more popular due to its environmental, its energy, and of course its financial benefits. And therefore that's where Trinidad and Tobago must look and in particular, the use of scrap metal has really proven to be a low cost and energy efficient substitute as a manufacturing input, and therefore is among the few materials that do not degrade or lose their chemical or physical properties during the recycling process. And is very much useful to many industries and many sectors globally. So scrap metal is in high demand as for consumer products, as well as inputs into the construction sector, into the uh, manufacturing of engines and engine parts and ship repairs uh, and, and into ship repair as well. So whereas now we are operating at a rather rudimentary level and, it's, and, and where everything is manually done, collected, sorted, packaged and for export and so on, we really want to benefit greater on, out on the additional value and that additional value will, be, be, it will bring more revenue, additional re revenue. So again, this is, we would continue to have these discussions with the all those associated with the industry. We want to have more value added extracted from the industry and um, rather than just exporting bales and bales of ferrous and non-ferrous scrap metals, right? So it is expected that this legislation which we have brought here today it will drive the transformation of the local scrap metal industry. And in the first instance, what it will facilitate is a, real a well regulated industry, one that is critical um, uh, for the industry's incorporation into the circular economy. And in the initial stage, I give you as the assurance as well that we are undertaking some studies. One of them is a, called a waste characterization study. Um, and that is with a view to implementing activities that are targeted to enhancing the sorting and the collection of scrap metal. And all of these kinds of um, learnings is what we would share with the members of the industry uh, to ensure that technology is introduced into the sorting processes and so on. Again, having a more modern industry and of course greater focus being placed on the promotion of the higher value added downstream activities and activities including compacting and dismantling and shredding, milling and blending, purification and so on. There's every possibility that we will support and encourage the further, I mean once we get this thing rolling and operating effect effectively and efficiently, and we want to look again, as I said, to the further development of the scrap metal industry. But there's no need for, the, for me to ad address the, trans, the, 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 man, the management of the transition. I think that was well handled by the Honorable AG uh, and, and so on. And he's laid a date of April 14th and given the justification for that date. And, but certainly we are looking forward to full implementation but at that time with, with applications coming in subsequent to April 14, 2023, being submitted to this new scrap metal unit. And of course, to be all to be inspected and so on by the new, what is the new scrap metal inspector. So I'm very, very pleased uh, to, to be associated with the legislation which is before us. I want to say that this government remains committed and, and, and steadfast to de developing new and viable emerging sectors in its effort to advance Trinidad and Tobago's diversification. And this is one. To this end, this industry, this scrap metal industry, has been identified as one with potential once 
properly regulated. It's one that would, for which um, there can be growth and further development and really have a tr transformative effect on our country's um, non-energy sector as well. So with this, ma uh, Madam Speaker, I want to commend this, um, this legislation before this Honorable House and add my full support to, to the bill before us. Thank you very much. Member for Shagonas West. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute in this debate. Madam Speaker, there are just a few matters which I would wish to commence uh, in response to uh, the Honorable Minister of Trade and Industry. And I know that some of the comments made, uh, in which I wish to respond to, were made by the Honorable Minister in response to Member for Mayaru. I start off by adopting and endorsing the contribution of the Honorable Member for Mayaru. And I would like to thank him for that insightful and a reality-based contribution, not an airy-fairy style of contribution to what is a very important topic. Now, I know that the Honorable Minister started off by saying that, to correct the record, that the government is here in three months and therefore wish to correct the record. It is not six months as proposed or probably suggested on this side. But I think that that has to be looked at in the context of the government having a report. And this is the scrap metal policy for Trinidad and Tobago originating from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And I think the Honorable Attorney General would have made reference to this report from sometime in 2013, but certainly the copy that I am looking at has a published date of 2nd March 2016. And I want to say that this was a very comprehensive report. And when you look at the executive summary, the very problems that were considered in this report are those said problems that continue till today. And you know, when you look at the executive summary, it says despite these benefits of, of the, the scrap metal industry in terms of its contribution to business, local business, there are many issues that have been raised by stakeholders relating to procurement, pricing, and the marketing and distribution of scrap metal that continue to stymie the development of this industry in Trinidad and Tobago. It goes on under rubric heading focal areas of the scrap metal policy, and it speaks to um, issues further substantiated through the critical input of stakeholders, both domestic and international, who participated in the consultation. So even this, the reason why I'm saying this is because with this scrap metal policy, which comes about um, certainly by 2016, um, these issues that we are debating today they were in fact considered. The stakeholders identified inter alia unfair competition in the industry, an outdated old metal and marine stores act of 1904, theft, unemployment and lack of enforcement of environmental standards as the most critical issues affecting them in the industry. There is urgent need for a policy to be developed and I, I, I skip over to, to, to part of the rationale primary among the concerns that have led to the development of this policy document are the lack of proper regula regulations to manage and operate the scrap metal industry, lack of adherence to national environmental standards in the country, damage to the country's infrastructure, and demand from local dealers for a policy to regulate the industry. And why I raise this is because against that context, as though you're boasting that you have brought something in three months and not necessarily six months, we have had a scrap metal policy since 2013. If I am wrong with the 2013, I'm saying that this was certainly published by March of 2015, sorry, August of 2015. So I raised that there. Then <clears throat> the Honorable Minister spoke about 
what is being proposed here is modern law. Um, and, and, and it is modern law and went on to suggest that this is law for the future. I, I find this to be somewhat of an oxymoron that we are suggesting here. This is modern law and law for the future, but this law is not married with the regulations. And that regulations is yet to come. Now, we also spoke about um, <coughs> the members, well, member for Mayara would not bring up environmental concerns. But I think that when we are talking about environmental concerns, um, that, that is a debate that we will get into uh, as the, de the debate progresses. But it is not fair that, you know, to say that we do not have environmental concerns in relation to um, the, the scrap metal and, and, and the, what the components may do for the, the environment. Regulations um, have been stated, as I said, to be brought by August 14. And in as much as I am on that point, Madam Speaker, that regulations will come, we are not necessarily clear on when the industry will be reopened. And this is a matter of concern, obviously, for all of the stakeholders. Now, I want to say that today I heard the Attorney General make reference to that date, 14 April 2023. I'm not so sure, and maybe the Honorable Attorney General or any speaker after can give us some clarification on when this industry will in fact be up and running again, even if it is exclusive, excluding, sorry, um, the, the copper uh, metal, transacting with copper metal. But in a media briefing on Friday, November 25th, the Honorable Attorney General said he held consultation with stakeholders from the scrap metal industry earlier on that day on draft legislation which would permit the resumption of scrap metal exports. And I just want to quote what the Attorney General would have indicated on that day. I have been able to advise stakeholders, sorry, I'm quoting now. I have been able to advise stakeholders in the scrap metal industry that I took a draft bill to cabinet yesterday, which we hope is going to be passed into law later this year to introduce a new legislative regime into the scrap metal industry and therefore to bring forward the period of the ban under six months to end by the end of December 2022. Copper is taken off the export list of scrap metal for at least another year. The government will of course revisit that issue in the course of a year. Regulations are being built out to support the legislation that is coming into force. The reason why this is being quoted, and as I said, we can get some clarification. Um, when exactly will the ban be lifted? Um, albeit it will exclude the transacting with copper. So we just wanted to get a clarification of that for the purpose of the stakeholders. One of the things that I think was raised and, and, and was not fairly raised in response by the Honorable Minister of Trade, um, insofar as dealing with the contribution of Member for Mayaro, was suggesting that, you know, Member for Mayaro was saying, well, you can have 14-year-old and 15-year-old. Those numbers were never uttered by Member for Mayaro. What he spoke about was that you could have 16, 17, and we are talking about the figure 18 in this instant bill. But you do have, as a matter of reality, 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds. I don't know which you know, um, business um, or, or the industry in which the Honorable Minister of Trade assesses. But in Trinidad and Tobago, you do have 16 and 17-year-olds being recognized by the NIB, and they do work in groceries and supermarkets, they help you with your bags, they help you with your trolleys, amongst other things. And when you go to the bakeries, you have them there and they are trying to make some little, you know, pocket change, whether it is to support themselves in the course of their studies and otherwise. So, member for Mayara was really speaking about a reality that in some family businesses also, you can have the 16-year-old and the 17-year-old. And as I said, this is recognized by the NIB. It's not anything to do with child labor. And, and so I want to put that on the record. Nobody here is promoting that in so far as the, the, the Minister of, Honorable Minister of Trade was saying that, you know, we, 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 we are going in the realm of child labor. Now, one thing that I noticed that the Honorable Minister of Trade spoke about was that you, you, you have South African countries, and I think mention was made of Kenya as well, in terms of the industry and um, shutting down the industry and in a sense, pressing the reset button. I just want to make a, a simple distinction, but I think it is an important distinction. And that is, when you look at uh, South Africa, from what I have done in my research, um, as at the 1st of December 2022, certainly when you look at different media reports, um, the English web news, what they had indicated was that South Africa, and this was the, one of the news headlines, 
that it had become the latest African country to control the sale of scrap metal as it bans the export of copper and other metals in a bid to thwart rampant infrastructure theft. So this, this is, in as much as the minister mentioned that, what I wanted to make the distinction um, with respect to was that the government of South Africa had placed a six-month ban on exporting copper and copper alloy scrap, as well as most ferrous scrap. But what is instructive in, in how they approached the ban, it was not a total shutdown as we had seen here. What they did was that you had a ban which was imposed in three phases. The first was a phase of copper and copper alloy because what the government believed was that the theft of those metals was imposing the greatest economic cost. Then you had a second phase of, of um, which is proposed, it hasn't come in yet. The second phase will concentrate on ferrous metals. And, and so that is a distinction. And what you had there was the Department of Trade in South Africa um, said that the theft of those metals was becoming costly for the economy. So I want to make that distinction that when we are recognizing these countries, they did not just simply say, okay, shut down, and have a ban across the board of the industry. They actually went about it in phases because they were able to identify. And I think that obtains here as well, the copper and copper alloy metals are the, are the ones that cause, the, you know, um, causing the most amount of havoc. So I wanted to, to raise that please, and um, in response to the, the Honorable Minister. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I just raised that to, to rebut and I wish to move on to um, other matters, and, and one of the things I want to, to be careful with, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, as I proceed, is there is a, I, I do not wish, I, I know there is a, some 25,000 employees um, who one may consider to be at the, the lower end of the chain, um, the business chain in this industry. And I think I would like to be fair to them, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is really something that we have to be careful about in terms of how we project what our position is in moving forward with resetting the law, in regulating the industry. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I wonder if we take the time to ever wonder what happens to old stainless steel stoves and fridges, and the galvanized sheeting, and the bed frames, or even a toaster. These are some of the items that we take for granted. Someone might pick it up from a garbage area, they take it to the scrapyard, where it will be sorted or even recast eventually into something new. It ought not to be considered as just down and dirty work of recycling. There are those who get up every morning, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to what others may consider a wheeler dealer business daily, but it is fast paced for them. And by afternoon, they don't know what they may have collected or dealt with earlier that morning. So when you make, when they, in that business, they make a bad deal, they have to keep on moving. That's the nature of the business that they are in. But it is a lucrative industry generally. So across the board, it is something that is lucrative. And I want, to, um, before I get into the social aspect and, and why I would want this industry, workers in this industry, not to be stigmatized because of the criminal elements which you know, have infiltrated the industry, um, it is important to deal with the figures. And I know I don't think anybody is at odds from the contributions I have heard thus far in terms of the, the figures. But for the record, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to reference the CSO. So according to the figures provided by the Trinidad and Tobago's Central Statistical Office, scrap metal exports escalated from approximately 69 million TT in 2009 to an estimated TT 216 million in 2018, registering an increase of over 213% over a 10-year period. And this can be found in um, www.newsgov.tt.content scrap iron industry. Now, last year, US 43 million, which is the TT 290.51 million, in scrap metal was exported. An article in the Express newspapers, Mr. Deputy Speaker, cites statements by economist Dr. Valmiki Arjun, who indicated that from his research, usually over 350 
to 400 containers of scrap metals are exported each month. So the rapid growth of export within the industry occurred simultaneously with an alarming surge in the theft of scrap metals that support the country's infrastructure. The question is whether the act that is being proposed, which is obviously meant to regulate legitimate dealers whilst ensuring that the criminal elements are targeted is effective. Does it ac accomplish what it has set out to do? When we consider what is being proposed, or is it just here to appease public opinion? I, I don't think that that is what the industry needs. Metal thefts will continue as long as there are people, Mr. Deputy Speaker, desperate enough to steal because of poverty and addiction issues. And those causes have to be addressed as well, something we have not heard as, uh, of as yet um, with respect to this bill. When we are not talking about petty theft, but about an industry with criminals holding certain parts of the society to ransom, we consider that this surge in criminal activities was driven by the low risk of detection and the government's lack of effective framework to combat metal theft and to operate the scrap metal industry. This surge, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in scrap metal theft was also as a result of the government's failure to ensure adherence to national environmental standards in the country. So it is somewhat, again, of an oxymoron to hear the Honorable Minister of Trade speaking as though we on this side do not have any care about the environmental impact with this, when we speak of this industry. Now I get back to the social aspect, which I, I want to be very fair to those who participate in this industry. And, and to do so, I, I want to reference a Newsday article. It is of Sunday, dated Sunday, September 11th, 2022. And I will not read the entire article, but just certain excerpts, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And in this article, it is titled, Why Women Get Into the Scrap Iron Industry. That is the title. It is posed as a question. And what is the strap headline, um, Madam Speaker? It's honest work. And what it says in this article, it says a handful of women are working to change that notion and leave their mark on the emerging industry, namely that women are now attracted to the industry and how they are seeing, they are beginning to see their way in the industry. For most of them, the decision to go into the industry was taken under a desperate need to make money, but it wasn't too long after they developed a deep attraction with the operations and the satisfying returns. This, these are the, the, the um, it is an article which references females who are participating in the industry as workers. And th these women act as secretaries, drivers, scrap collectors, and trade coordinators of old and scrap metal under the TT Scrap Iron Dealers Association. It goes on to reference one particular person, scrap iron dealer Nancy Pierre, hopes more women will see the benefits of getting into the handling and exportation of scrap iron. It's an honest, and I'm quoting, the, the, the article is now quoting Miss Nancy Pierre. It's an honest job. Just do it the right and legal way, and everything would go smoothly for you. Some people look at us as scavengers, and that's too low. But if they see how this industry is growing, they would see how every struggling parent can benefit. And Madam Speaker, I, I found this article um, worthy of referencing in the debate because it goes on to quote uh, um, more persons, Karen Salazar, a mother of eight, and speaking about how when the, the closure of the industry came, they saw it fit to speak out that the, the, the industry should not be broad brushed um, on account of you have the, the, the serious criminal elements infiltrating the industry. You actually have these honest, hardworking persons who need this industry for their, as their bread and butter. So, Madam Speaker, I want to say that certainly we should not stigmatize those who participate in this industry by any account. We know the closure or the ban of, of the industry was proposed on a certain premise. And if that be the case with the reopening, it must not be that everybody who participated under the old industry, what I may call the unregulated industry, was somehow complicit with participating in any kind of criminal activities. It is far from. As a matter of fact, um, when we, we had in August, I believe, um, shortly after the 12th of August, 
um, at the invitation of, of Member of Parliament for Pointe Pierre, um, I, I, was, I accompanied um, the member in meeting these stakeholders and some of the, the persons who worked in the industry at his constituency office. And having met the Scrap Iron Dealers Association representatives and those who worked in the Pointe of Pierre, Claxton Bay area, um, it was clear that they depend on this industry in a tremendous way. And questions of they paying their loans, and that it comes back to my reason for asking the question to clarify exactly when they can expect this industry to get running and operating again. So this, the issue of stigmatization, Madam Speaker, I've dealt with that, and I'm saying that it is important that they know exactly when they can get back to this industry. It is their honest um, way, uh, approach of earning a living. Now, I want to move on, um, Madam Speaker, to deal with just a few clauses of the bill. I know Member for Mayaro would have touched on, on quite a few, and I just simply want to treat with a couple of the points, um, not that he raised, but some other parts of the um, provisions in this bill. And particularly when we look at, it would be clause 12 um, in particular, but 12.7. Now what clause 12 purports to do is that you have a provision now dealing with representation in case of refusal, non-renewal, or revocation of license. Now, we, I, I could go, Madam Speaker, into some depth of public law to speak about you know, how a person is entitled to make representation, but I don't propose to do that. Honing in on these provisions, it is an opening, and it is a positive opening that you can have people that they are, are able to make representation in the event that they are, one, they want to make their own representation, but two, if they are about to be refused, and this is where I want to go. So particularly 12, subsection 7, if the applicant or licensee informs the minister that he wishes to make oral representations, the minister shall give him the opportunity of appearing before and being heard by a person appointed by the minister. Now, one of the, 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 the points I will get to is the role of the minister under this bill, proposed under this bill. But for the purposes of this clause 127, exactly who is this person um, to, to be appointed by the minister and whether we should not have some further details as to basic qualifications, um, experience to be able to act on behalf of the minister in entertaining representations from those who wish to make representation under the um, part 12, clause 12. Now, it goes on to 12... I'm sorry, clause 13, notice of the decision. If the minister refuses an application under, sub, under section 7 or refuses to renew or revoke a license under section 8 or 9, respectively, the minister shall give the applicant or licensee a notice setting out the decision and the reasons for it. This accords with normal um, decision making that you will give the decision and properly in writing, that is the ideal situation, and it ought to be accompanied with reasons. So that is fine. But if we are giving the opening in this bill where we are talking about licensing and the turnaround time is going to be one year, Madam Speaker, we already have the opening where you are allowing them to make the, the representation. If it is you are going under 13 to give the notification of refusal, in public law there is a concept of where you can actually invite the person. And if the refusal is, is, it is on account of shortcomings that they may be able to remedy, that is something that you can still entertain at that stage, as opposed to giving a notice of refusal, and then what you could potentially be faced with is a, an appeal. So what you could do is you can actually have persons being more compliant, which will give effect to what is the spirit of the provision here, and the spirit of the act, as opposed to they coming to have to do it after, by way of an appeal. Even that appeal could probably be followed by a judicial review application. So legislation should include the provision that if the minister is of the view that the person applying for the license should be denied, he or she should allow the applicant to be heard before that final decision is made. And as I said before, it may be on account of the person being non-compliant with things that could be dealt with and the person can make good on whatever those non-compliant issues are and therefore be uh, entitled to get 
um, a renewal or get the, the, the license uh, in the first instance. Many persons who operate in this industry may view the process, Madam Speaker, of hiring a lawyer to, to make an appeal to the High Court, which is also contained in, in, in this, um, this piece of, of proposed law, um, an appeal to the High Court or applying for a judicial review as highly onerous and bureaucratic and an, and an expensive process. So by allowing the applicant to be seen prior to the outright denial of his or her license, uh, I am saying that tried public law will save the state money, will allow these persons to get into the business and time spent on legal fees and otherwise allowing natural justice principles to prevail, I think that it will help the situation. And, and that is in terms of, of section 12. Um, in particular, I have referenced 12.7 and also um, 12, sorry, clause 13. So Madam Speaker, I raise that in, 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 in terms of my consideration of that aspect of where you can make representation be told of a refusal, then there's the appeal. There's also more that we can do to assist these people um, that are contained in this industry. Now, I want to move as well, um, Madam Speaker, to um, another aspect of, of, of law, and even it, it goes a little bit broader in the sense that uh, what you have here is a framework to be created, and what it does, it sets out an astounding range of power to the minister rather than a committee. And no aspersions, obviously, is being cast on the minister, but this is when we are dealing with lawmaking and, 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 and legal legislative drafting. There is a concept of, you know, you, what you do is you pass law, not taking into account a particular individual, but with passage of time, you want to know that the law is good for everybody, regardless of who is in government and who occupies the particular position. So the argument, Please, Madam Speaker, is that there is potential, um, given that the minister is granted the sole power to grant, vary, or suspend a license, a potential for you know, issues to arise from time to time. The minister is going to really have a very astonishing range of power. Um, how many cases are we aware of? And this, 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 there's no limit to the time I'm talking about now, but in terms of the history of persons challenging under um, a statutory power. How many cases are we aware of where a minister is brought before the court and you can have declarations of findings of unlawful behavior, unlawful conduct, etc.? I am saying that we can treat with that in, in how we deal with this. Member, you have three minutes left of your ordinary speaking time. You're entitled to 15 additional minutes to wrap up your contribution if you wish. Madam Speaker, may I have the additional time, please? Please proceed. Thank you. So, Madam Speaker, so I, I leave that point there, but the, the, I think it is, is, it is registered. I, I believe um, someone raised it before, a member from um, Mayaro. So, given the large scale investments, Madam Speaker, into the scrap metal industry by illegal entities that live abroad and the concerns of large scale money laundering using shell companies, we, are we not creating the exact hotbed for corruption? and the creation of shell companies to launder large-scale monies. That is something that is considered, and that is something we'll ask the Attorney General to factor in. So maybe a recommendation might be that a committee made up of persons who are trained and knowledgeable about the field instead of a minister, a particular minister. A license being granted to a person with 30% status in Trinidad creates, again, as I say, a hotbed of foreign investors who may be able to take advantage of persons in the industry. The potential for the setup, Madam Speaker, of shell companies is extremely high, as the money laundering framework will be easy to maintain with foreign access to local licensing regimes. The license is not to be granted to any person convicted of an indictable offense, which is too wide and discriminatory. Madam Speaker, a person charged with wounding with intent may not have any issue ordinarily in obtaining a license. But this threads closely to punishing a person twice for the same offense. If the offense for which a person is convicted is not related to scrap iron, um, then he ought to qualify. And that is something that when we look at the general provisions in the bill, the factors for denial for criminal conduct needs to be clearer. And I, I hope that the Attorney General may take that into account. The, the framework for licensing and monitoring is similar to what I would say the quarrying industry, and therefore will have the same problems as that sector. 
When we look at Clause 26, Madam Speaker, uh, again dealing with criminal offenses, the bill grants powers of inspection. This, again, can also give, uh, and I, 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 I use this not to ascribe aspiration to anyone, but again, we are talking about the culture in which we live in, the fact that we are trying to stymie criminal conduct. Um, this can give um, rise to massive corruption. A systematic framework for monitoring the scrap iron yards, which includes the EMA monitoring unit, is more advisable, and that is something maybe the Attorney General will uh, um, tell us, you know, how these entities, which are named in the bill, have a role to perform, whether it will go so far. The penalties for the offenses, Madam Speaker, are somewhat inconsistent. They are onerous, and I'm saying consequently open to constitutional challenge, and the Attorney General may want to take this on board um, under the Barry Francis um, principles. So where the mandatory nature of a sentence and the onerousness of the penalty was discussed in that case. Member for Port of Spain South is in the, in, in the chamber, and he will be aware of that. According to the penalties listed, there is a difference of 50,000 for a person who operates without a license and someone who fails to display his license. So this disparity will not have the deterrent effect of the which the legislation obviously will want to intend. There is the reference to the penalty of having in your possession stolen scrap iron. However, this would be impossible for the purchaser to know and creates a built-in defense to the offense. So there needs to be cross-referencing with the penalties for receiving stolen goods. So that is another general aspect that I would hope that the uh, Honorable Attorney General will take on board in determining whether the bill um, needs firming up. Uh, certainly from where we um, sit or stand, as the case may be, we are of that view that there needs to be some firming up. So, Madam Speaker, in terms of the, the, the overall thrust of the bill, um, I have spoken about the, 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 the time frame that we have seen, which is we had a policy, now we are coming, we want to get it right. Um, I spoke about the, the stigmatizing, which we should not do in the industry. Um, with, with the closure of the, the industry, um, the Ministry of Social Development, uh, and this is something that happened um, very recently, um, I recall member for Shigonas East would have asked the questions uh, upon the closure of the industry, what um, social relief would be given to members and, and, and those same workers that I would have referenced in the earlier article um, be affected by the, the, the ban, the export ban. And you know, I believe that the response from the government was that they could apply for grants. And uh, as one commentator said, um, in, the, in a newspaper, that really is a joke for people who hate laughter. So I think that it is something that we need to bear in mind that we are talking about these things, but there must be some infrastructure. Um, closure must have been and must continue to be accompanied with assistance to those who are affected and are going to be affected. Um, are we seeking, and I think I dealt with this point already, if, is it that we are appeasing public opinion and in doing so targeting legitimate dealers or are we really interested in stamping out the criminal elements? So, Madam Speaker, I think that at the end of the day that we would all, on, on this side for sure, I, I know that my colleagues and myself, uh, the opposition, we would want to ensure that there is the quickest return to the operation of this industry, at the same time stamping out those criminal elements and ensuring that we are not necessarily targeting, whether by way of bureaucratic processes or undue bureaucratic process, um, processes, we, we, we are not targeting the law-abiding um, participants in the industry. So, Madam Speaker, with those few words, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Member for Port of Spain, North, St. Anne's West. Thank you very much. 
Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'd like to start my contribution by just assuring not only the population, but those who are active participants in the scrap metal industry, that the government is not against this industry. And I think that point is an important starting point as I begin my contribution. Because this government will always support legitimate business. This government will always support people who are willing to abide by the law. And what this whole debate is here today is about tackling and not burying our heads in the sand, but tackling the criminal elements that spoil a good thing. Because the government accepts that not everyone who is involved in the industry, in fact, it is probably a small, small minority, are non-law-abiding citizens. And what this whole legislation is here today to do is to ensure that those who want to operate in the scrap metal industry will do so within a regulated framework for their protection as well as the protection of the public. So you see, contrary to the submissions we've heard from the other side, this is good legislation. And I'd like to thank the Attorney General and his team for turning around what is really revolutionary legislation in a very short period of time. And I sat and I listened to the previous speaker and I had to smile because at the start of that presentation, we heard about a 2016 policy and a quotation, but then quite comically thereafter, you heard about a policy in 2013. We had a policy in 2013, but yes, the record reflects and the fact cannot be changed that whatever policy you may have had in 2013 was never implemented. And what we're here today to do is to implement the current policy of a government that is willing to tackle difficult problems in society. So to come here and to tell the population, oh, I had a policy. Oh, I had a policy in 2013 when the record reflects you did nothing with it. You didn't amend a single thing. You didn't even amend the application fee for a license. You didn't even amend the fines that were attributable to illegal activity in the scrap iron industry. So you did nothing, which is really reflective of that whole period. To quickly follow on that, Madam Speaker, and through you to the population, there is an undeniable, obvious need, Madam Speaker, to regulate this industry. In fact, even the members of the industry, and I see here today in the public gallery, the president of the Scrap Iron Dealers Association and some of his support, accept, because I participated in meetings, I was, for a period of time, chairing a sub-cabinet committee along with the Minister of Trade, the Attorney General, and the Minister of National Security it, to engage with the scrap iron dealers. And when we met, the scrap iron dealers accepted and they were advocating, yes, there are problems. And we all know that there are problems in this industry and what we've come here to do is to tackle that frontally. So to listen, to sit here and to listen with the dog whistling and with the continued attempts by the opposition to say, we will support legislation once it's good legislation. And this is not good legislation, but never to point out what would be good legislation for them. The population is not being fooled by that. So to put us back in context, Madam Speaker, this bill is all about regulation of the industry because we accept that this industry has a role to play in the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. But I'd like, I'd like, Madam Speaker, through you, to just remind the population to take us back to the effects this was having on the national psyche a few short months ago, when we woke up one morning and read in the front page of the newspaper, a church bell, a church bell, a sacred, a sacred church bell was stolen. 
that we were hearing that people's gates, their fences were being stolen, reading the reports of a man who stood looking out of his window at people cutting his fence and going off with his fence and then threatening him if he should say anything. This weekend I was in my constituency and still seeing the copper wires that were cut and hanging down. We all saw the videos, Madam Speaker, of persons pulling up on open tray trucks, cutting wires, cutting the wires off at our fuel bond in Karani. They stole the gate. In the oil and gas industry, they were stealing compressors, they were stealing pumps, they were cutting, cutting um, pipes. We had a number of oil spills, albeit thankfully small oil spills, as a result of persons engaged in that industry who are engaged in criminal activity. We will all remember waking up one Sunday morning having no internet, no connectivity, and when we found out the reason why, it is because the bandits, the criminals, were stealing the TSTT cables from underground. So they weren't only cutting above ground, but they had now found their way inside the, the, the piping underground to steal the cables. And the population rightly was being traumatized. Rightly, being, after being traumatized, was calling out for intervention by the government. And what you had was a government that immediately intervened and put an immediate ban on the export of all items. And let us remind the population again what happened. Because some of those on the other side were then participating and encouraging the blocking of roads, the burning of tires. We had the highway in front of Claxton Bay blocked one day by purported scrap iron dealers. And I want to remind the population that the polls at the time, 100% of persons supported the government intervening to prevent the destruction of infrastructure. Infrastructure, state and private infrastructure, was under attack and being destroyed, stolen, and exported. I want to remind the population at this point that immediately when we put that ban, there were 91 containers on two ports in Trinidad. 91. And I can tell the population that despite the opposition lawyers who challenged the government initially to release those containers, a government stood firm and did not release the containers. And I can tell the population today, and the Minister of National Security will give further details, that on opening those containers, Stolen items have been found. Pumps, compressors from the oil and gas industry have been found. Stolen copper cables have been found. So let us remind ourselves, because those on the other side not only have a short-term memory, but unfortunately some seem to encourage this type of behavior in the country, that what you had was Madam, a government Madam that Speaker. intervened to deal... Madam Speaker. I rise on standing order 486, please. Okay, so, Member, I'll just ask you to withdraw it and find another way to say that, please. Withdraw that. But you know, there's an old people saying that when stone pelting, he who ball is man to watch. So I think the point was just proved. This country suffered at the hands of persons who were intent on stealing and destroying infrastructure, stealing and destroying TSTT cables and copper, and then what was worse is they were so indiscriminate in their, their rampant looting and destruction of infrastructure that they began cutting fiber because they couldn't tell the difference between what was copper and what was fiber, and that had for a number of months consistent on a daily basis interruption of communications. That all disturbed productivity. And let us follow the value chain here. When this is done, there is destruction and stealing of state and private property. That then ends up being transported where? To a yard somewhere. And from a yard somewhere packed into a container somewhere for export. Because you see, none of this is being reused, recycled, 
purchased here in Trinidad and Tobago for domestic use. So it is then shipped off into oblivion. So the church has never recovered the church bell. Those who have had their infrastructure destroyed, their fence. A colleague of mine was saying that persons saw not only their fence being taken, but the lock and the chain on the gate being taken as well. So let us not fool ourselves. Let us not forget what we've come here today to do. And to hear as well suggestions. And with all credit to the previous speaker, he was very timid in his approach and his run up to the point, talking about South Africa. But anyone can go and do the research to see that many jurisdictions have suffered similarly and strong governments have had to intervene. So to quote what is going on in South Africa in 2022 is forgetting the whole story of the run up. For many years, South Africa was suffering and the infrastructure was being taken. I see the member nodding his head. I just pulled up the articles that even now currently, they're still having state infrastructure. And he talked about, well, they took a step and a stage on what to Immediately, this government, only a few months ago, three months ago, banned the export of everything. And that put a stop. So now the population can look on and think about it. So in the past few weeks, in the past month, how come it is that we're not hearing of these trauma stories? How come it is that not every day infrastructure, communications being disrupted, etc.? And I remind those on the other side that the polls taken at the time showed 100% support by the population. So I want to say again at this stage, this government has no issue with those who are willing to abide by the law and within the law. We are here to work with law-abiding citizens and to ensure as best as we can that good legislation is passed to protect them because you will not see this government out on the streets with those who are engaged in criminal behavior. Having said that, the laws were archaic and outdated. The first thing we did as a government is look at the existing laws and determined immediately doing this kind of surgery on the law through amendments is not going to work. We need to revamp the whole legislation to deal with this problem. And just to tell the population who are interested, these are global issues. So go and do the research. Right here in the CARICOM, you had bans on the export of metals in Guyana, Bahamas, and, the Jam and Jamaica. Jamaica still at this stage is facing what we were facing a few months ago. You have the same types of problems in Kenya, South Africa, Zimbabwe, as just a few examples. It is the destruction of infrastructure and the theft of what doesn't belong to persons. There can be no doubt, Madam Speaker, that there is an element of criminality involved. So what you're seeing here today through the introduction of this legislation, which is good legislation, despite what those on the other side would like to suggest, you're seeing an acceptance that there can be money laundering because this is a, this is a cash industry. This is a cash industry. So what you're seeing is the potential, the opportunity for me to come and steal your fence, your gate, your church bell, the, the mosque's fence, the mandir's fence. You had people up in Bonds Road in Port of Spain South stealing the Wasa connections. And the question that any sensible law-abiding citizen asks is stealing to do with what with it? Because they're not taking it somewhere to smelt and to sell in Trinidad. It's being exported. And there's only a demand for this. So therefore, you only steal to supply if there's a demand. And the government put a stop to that demand to return some level of sanity and stability to the country. And that is what has happened for the past two months. And then what do we do? We don't sit down quietly and talk about, I had an, a policy in 2013. 
we updated our 2016 policy and we've come here today with good legislation. And when anyone looks at the legislation, as I will do in a short while, and you go through it, you will see that all of the areas along the value chain are being addressed. So those who are going to collect the scrap metal, because there is a need, there are people who want to get rid of an old stove, an old fridge, old pieces of metal, etc. So there is a need, but those persons who are going to collect are now going to be required to be registered and licensed. And what could possibly be wrong with that? Which law-abiding citizen can object to that? So now you know that when I go to X's house to collect, I have to get a receipt from X that X is the owner. I, get, I take it from X, and if somebody stops me down the road, I could prove, look, X gave me permission. So when you go down the road and you're caught with a church bell, you better be able to say, Father Padre, give me permission to take the church bell. But no, there are those who don't want that because they want the rampant engagement of criminality in our society. But this government will push back at that and that is what this bill is about. Anyone, Madam Speaker, looking at this legislation would immediately see, accept and support that it is designed to regulate every single step along the value chain every part of an industry that can very easily lend itself an influence to the criminal element. So we are here to work with those who are prepared to abide by the law and to do what is right for Trinidad and Tobago to regulate that an industry that can help many in our society. Even when we are deciding in the policy how much the fees should be, this government sat down and said, okay, so those collectors going out there, we can't put a high fee because this is a source of employment for them. But now they will be captured, they will be regulated, they will be registered. So the nine out of the 10 of us who are registered and abiding by the law would be able to point to number 10 and say, look, number 10 are no license. Or the police stopping 10 of us at night We'll see nine of us have a displayed license and number 10 doesn't. It is not only about the passage of legislation, it is about working to see how you can enforce the legislation to make it effective. So now I turn, Madam Speaker, to the legislation. The first point to be made, as the Attorney General, I believe, touched on, is this act requires proclamation. So there will be parts of the act that will be proclaimed so they can be implemented immediately, but there's an acceptance and although also any provisions of the act, they set out that those who already have licenses will be allowed to run to a particular point in time before you move into this new set of regulations. You look at the first definition under the act in section two, AML, CFT, PF, anti-money laundering, countering of financing of terrorism, financing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The archaic laws didn't have that because that was a previous time where you weren't dealing with these real issues. So we're working with the industry to make sure they don't fall prey to the potential trappings of money laundering. You now have defined an authorized officer to mean a police officer. We're going to amend to add a SRP, a public health inspector of a corporation, an environmental officer, environmental manager, officer of the EMA, or a scrap metal inspector. So for the first time, you're creating a scrap metal inspector. It talks about what is dealing. It talks about non-ferocious metals. And importantly, this act does not include, at this time, copper, because we know what happens with the copper. In fact, it is quite ironic that at the first set of meetings with the scrap iron dealers, they too accepted that you should put, and their proposition was put an immediate ban on copper. We all know that that is one of the main metals that is a problem outside of there. But you see, the indiscriminate attempts to find what is copper and what isn't copper leads to the destruction of a whole set of other infrastructure. 
You now have for the first time a scrap metal collector being defined, a scrap metal dealer being defined, scrap metal inspector being defined. You have something called a site manager. All of these provisions are being put in there. In particular, the site manager is being put in there as a result of wanting to have somebody responsible. Because you see, when you go through this legislation and you understand what is behind it, all it is doing is pinning responsibility along the value chain. So a site manager means you, sir or ma'am, now have the responsibility for this site that is a licensed scrap metal site. So it means that you better make sure what is going on in this yard is all legal and above board. Who could complain and quarrel with that? That you have somebody now identified in law that has to take responsibility as opposed to the authorities pulling up to, pulling up to a yard and everybody saying, it's not me, it's not me, I'm not responsible, it's not me, it's he, he not here, they not there. So it is well thought of legislation. So to have previous members go into the booth and just say that it's not good legislation and say, well, I don't know this and I don't know that. It really takes us nowhere. And now you have the minister being given the permission, the authority at section five to grant, refuse, renew, vary, or suspend or revoke a license. Importantly, Madam Speaker, at section 4.4 of the act is a critical provision. This is a provision where, and the form will show it, the license will have it, a person who is willing to engage in this industry will make a declaration in a prescribed form if the license is granted to he or she, the licensee shall consent to the entry of authorized officers on any scrap metal site specified in a license during working hours or at such other times as the scrap metal site is open to the public or otherwise. Again, anyone engaging in the industry who is law abiding. This is going to be one of the terms of it. Again, when we engage with the scrap iron dealers, this is one of the things they were saying. They went even further. The scrap iron dealers, the legitimate ones were saying, put cameras on every site and monitor it that way. But of course that has other privacy elements to it. You go on with the legislation, how you make an application. So at section six, a person or entity who deals or proposes to deal in scrap metal as a scrap metal collector or owns and operates or proposes to own and operate a scrap metal site as a scrap metal dealer. That is the identification of who is a collector and who is a dealer. We get into at section six, four, the site manager. So at section six, five, a site manager may be named in a scrap dealer's license at more than one site, but no site may have more than one site manager named in relation to it. Immediately the logic, the sensibility of that is brought home, that what it means is you, the site manager, are now responsible. It is no different to a liquor license on a bar or on a, a, a grocery that is entitled to sell liquor. It identifies the name of the person. There are repercussions in law for that. You then move on, where there's a refusal to grant the license. The minister may refuse to grant a license and it sets out in what circumstances. We're introducing a concept of you must be a fit and proper person. There's now an important discretion where the ministers of the opinion that the issue of the license would be contrary to the public interest. That is an excellent discretion in law. Because when you're drafting legislation, we all know you cannot think of every single possibility or eventuality that may take place. But there are occasions that are going to be contrary to the public interest that a minister should not grant a license. You go on in the legislation about the suspension of a license, again, at section 11, an extremely important power. Because the suspension of the license is not a revocation, a cancellation, or termination. So in other words, it gives the minister the power, if there are infractions of law, to provide an opportunity to the person to tidy up their house to take the necessary steps to get back on the right side of the law. And what I found interesting and what is good is that section 11.1a, they talk about, and this is all about when the minister can suspend, 
the minister can suspend when he is satisfied that it is not possible to carry out a proper inspection of any premises to which a license relates. Because you see, we know from experience, we know from reality that sometimes you go onto a site and it is impossible because of the way the metal is stacked, the way everything is set out for them to find in the whole mess what may or may not be stolen. So you could suspend and say, no, this is not the way you can carry out your site. E, a licensee is no longer a fit and proper person as prescribed to be a licensee. Of course, one of the points made by a previous speaker is at section 12, it you can now have representation in case of a refusal, non-renewal, or revocation of the license. Again, that is in keeping with proper and good practice and procedure. That is capturing expressly the provision and protection of natural justice. So listen, I, I the minister, I'm thinking of not granting you your license for these reasons. So come forward now and tell me why I should be a you should be a granted a license. Honorable member, you have four more minutes of ordinary speaking time. Uh, you're entitled to 15 additional minutes to wind up with your contribution, if you wish. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, part three of the act is what is going to govern and regulate the conduct of scrap metal business. And this is where you start to get into the other part of the value chain. So section 15, restriction on transportation of scrap metal. Population, cast your minds back to four months ago and five months ago. The same stories I'm relating to you here today where the man is looking through his window at three o'clock in the morning and seeing people cutting his gate to take his gate. When people are looking out of their window in a neighborhood and seeing people standing on the back of a van cutting wires and leaving the wires to hang as they cut it off. When you woke up one Sunday morning and your communications were cut because those engaged in criminal activity went for the TSTT cables underground. That poor church bell, the fuel bond where the gate, the fence was cut. The traumatized person who had to watch not only their gate going, not only the fence going, but the chain and the lock that was supposed to protect the gate and the fence. And those are the people that this legislation is to tackle. So now what we're saying is when you're collecting scrap metal and you're transporting scrap metal, you have to have a scrap metal collector's license. The reason for that is obvious. The reason for that, Madam Speaker, is that you can properly regulate the industry. All it requires you to do is to go give your information, provide the data that is necessary, pay a small fee, you're licensed. The act goes on when you're conducting business as a scrap metal collector. In other words, those people who will come around on a weekend and say, willing to buy batteries, willing to buy fridge, willing to buy stove, etc. They will now be licensed and the law abiding people will have no problem getting licensed and being part of a regulated industry. But to come back to what the old people say, when stone pelting, the man who ball is the man to watch. So when you have people protesting too much, that they don't want these regulations or you shouldn't have these regulations and you have those who only willing to stand on a soapbox for anybody holding themselves out as come to me I will advocate your case for you those are the people to watch so you now have at section 16 that the holder of a scrap metal collector's license shall display a copy of the license on any motor vehicle or goods vehicle as being used in the course of the collector's business. The reason for that is clear, so that you, me, and any member of the public, when you see someone collecting scrap metal, can see whether they're licensed or not by just looking for the sticker. And better yet, law enforcement's job is made easier. So if you see nine vehicles going down the road, all with the appropriate sticker, and they're licensed, fine. Statistically, they're going to be carrying out their business above board. But then you see a vehicle going down the road, no sticker. So you stop them again, statistically, if they're not licensed, nine out of 10, 9.9% .9 of the time, 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, 
they're going to be engaged in criminal activity. So it makes the job of enforcement better. And that is how the legislation should be looked at. You then have takes at, at section 15, subsection 5, a scrap metal collector shall not purchase nor receive scrap metal from a person without verifying the person's full name and address. So in other words, I can't sell you my neighbor fridge and my neighbor stove. And you have to obtain now as a scrap metal de collector a signed and dated statement of ownership from the person that you're the legal owner of scrap metal or lawfully entitled to sell the scrap metal again. Which sensible, law-abiding, civic-minded citizen could have a problem with that? So in other words, you are now protecting the scrap metal collector to ensure that he and she is not engaged in criminal activity. So when somebody calls them and says, take this away, etc., he or she as a scrap metal collector will say, well, provide me with proof of ownership. And then now, we now are licensing scrap metal dealers at section 17. No person shall carry on the business of a scrap metal site unless he obtains a scrap metal dealer's license. And again, they, 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 in, they are obligated to display in a prominent place in any area accessible to the public at each scrap metal site, a copy of the license. And also the same thing like you have over bars is a licensed scrap metal, scrap metal site. So these are some of the examples that very quickly jump out to prove the point. It is good legislation, that the old archaic legislation could not be amended, that you have proper government policy governing how this legislation came to be. At section 18, circumstances for dealing. This is another, Madam Speaker, good example of properly regulating the industry. So no person shall purchase or receive scrap metal between the hours of seven o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the evening. Immediately, any law-abiding citizen can understand why. So what it is saying is carry out your business between seven in the morning, six in the evening, and that is when there's light, when we, the population, can see what is going on. You don't need to be carrying out this in the middle of the night, in the dark of night, with stolen goods coming to your property to then be put in a container and exported off. You must sort, pack, load scrap metal at the metal site between those same hours. It talks about when you purchase, receive, or enter into a transaction with somebody, they must be over the age of 18. At section 19, Another good provision. So I'm trying my best to understand and to make sense of nonsense that I heard previously. Section 19 talks about retention of scrap metal for specified days. This provision says that you cannot disfigure, change the form, shape, use, sell, loan, or dispose of otherwise from the site for a period of 15 days after the scrap metal has been purchased or received. The answer for that is obvious. Anybody who sees how the containers are packed, and we're seeing it now with these 91 containers that are being unpacked with a barrage of stolen items in them, it is saying, keep it 15 days. So they don't go and cut up the church bell into a thousand pieces, cut up the TNT pole into pieces, because that is what was going on in the industry. So this is good legislation. It is legislation that is saying, keep it whole for 15 days so it will allow the inspectors to come, make a pass, and make sure you're abiding with the law. So again, I ask the population to look very carefully to see who it is that has a problem with this type of legislation, and then question why. Question why is it that as soon as they bring the church bell or the compressors or the pumps or the TSTT cable or the TN Tech poles or the man's fence or the fuel bonds gate? Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I rise on standing order 551B. We have been hearing this time after time again about the, about the failure of this government to protect the assets of the country and of the citizens. And he keep repeating it over and over and over about the church bell. So, Member for Kuvanoa, thank you for the invitation. Overrule, please continue. 
I would like the population, Madam Speaker, at this, at this stage to understand that Kuva North has a problem with a, a church bell. And that speaks words to him. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I rise on standing order 486. That, in, that what the member has said is totally misleading and false. Yeah. Okay. Overrule. Continue. Thank you. Section 21. They're now required to keep records and is updating the type of records, Madam Speaker, that must be kept. So a scrap metal dealer shall now keep an accurate and legible record of scrap metal that is stored, received, and disposed of as a scrap metal site. That is to protect both the site manager as well as the scrap metal dealer. Because if you have proper records, then what do you have to worry about? But what we know now as a fact by those who are engaged in the criminal activity prior to this legislation is you're seeing bills of lading, you're seeing records repeating the same thing over and over and over with no proper identification where the scrap metal came from, what is the scrap metal, etc. So all of this legislation is designed to correct those problems. But yet still, you will have those on the other side come here today to try and mislead the population and say, we will support good legislation, but this is bad legislation. In what way? I have taken the time to point out only a few of the instances along the value chain for the population to understand the type of legislation that's being proposed here today. You then get very quickly along to section 21. This is still in the scrap metal records. Section 21, 4F and H, where you're now required to have the following information, Madam Speaker, at your yard. The vehicle registration number of any motor vehicle or goods vehicle used to deliver the scrap metal. That is good legislation because now you as the site manager or the scrap metal dealer will have a record of vehicle X that came from Kuva North with so and so registration provided X, Y, and Z, including a church bell. So you could then go to Kuva North and find where that problem came from. And then you also have at H a statement of ownership that is signed and dated by the person who delivered the scrap metal. So anyone who has any logic or sense would see those two provisions are lining up for enforcement of the law and to make it easier to then prosecute somebody who is in, in infraction of the law. The scrap metal dealer for tax purposes. You see, people don't like to or, or bury their heads in the sand about the payment of tax. But we have heard what has been said. We've heard it said this is a hundred million dollar industry, a billion dollar industry. Fine. Operate legitimately and pay your tax. Pay your tax on your revenue and your profit earned. What could be wrong with that? You then have that we're saying keep the records at section 22 for six years. That marries with the tax legislation. It also is in case that you need prosecution. Part four, Madam Speaker, deals with the export of scrap metal. And it is now saying that a person at section 24 who exports scrap metal shall give at least seven days written notice to the minister and the commissioner of police of his intention to load the scrap metal for export. I heard it being suggested that there's a problem with this provision. But why should anybody have a problem with this provision? If you are engaged in legitimate business and you have legitimately obtained the scrap metal that you're going to export, you tell the commissioner of police, I intend on X day, a week from today, to export X, Y, and Z. The police, commissioner of police can then send police officers, the scrap metal inspectors can turn up, look at it, and give you a clean bill of health. But you see, if you're hiding the church bell that offends Kuva North in the container, then you're going to be in problems. Madam Speaker, on point. I rise on standing order 486. Kuva North is not offended by the use of the church bell. It's just that the member continued to repeat member, the government member, failure. Member, that is not a ground for objecting under standing order 486. Member for Lavantil West, it didn't escape me what you just blurted out. I really don't think that that is parliamentary. Okay? 
So I'll ask you to just withdraw it. I'm sure it's there. All right? Please. Madam Speaker, remember my friend for Coover North. He, he, he jumps on his feet every time about human yeah, yeah, trafficking. No, 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 Madam Speaker. No, no, okay, oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. I didn't ask for an explanation. There's a certain innuendo that may have been interpreted from what you shouted out. Okay? So just kindly, the gentleman that you are, I'm sure you didn't intend it, but just to ensure that you didn't intend it, just withdraw that and let's proceed. In deference to you, Honorable Speaker, I, I humbly withdraw. Thank you. Okay, let's get on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam? <clears throat> let's get on with this, okay? I'm sure you'll most probably join the debate. Let's save our good energies, positive energies for that, okay? M Madam Speaker, may I proceed? Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, I will tell my very good friend and colleague, the member for Love Until West, let your heart not be troubled because the old people have a saying, it is better you stay silent, those on the other side, than you open your mouth and confirm what needs to be confirmed. Madam Speaker, at section, section 24.3 of the, the bill, it talks about where notice is given, this is to the Commissioner of Police, the Minister and the Commissioner of Police shall ensure the relevant officers are present at the scrap metal site to conduct inspections while scrap metal is being loaded. Good legislation, so it is providing protection for the public, it is providing protection for the scrap metal dealer and those involved that they will get a clean bill of health once they are abiding within the confines of the law. It also says at subsection six, scrap metal in a scrap metal site may be held for five days for viewing by any member of the public and the licensed exporter upon written notice from any member of the public shall afford that person a reasonable opportunity to view scrap metal before loading for export. And this is the appropriate time to recount for the population what we had the Minister of Works tell us during the time when there was rampant theft taking place, that the Minister of Works told the population that metal had been laid down in a Ministry of Works site for work to be done, and overnight, was stolen from that site and found in the yard of a scrap metal dealer. So if you have the five days, it now allows people that opportunity to try and locate their property, to locate the church bell. You then have at part five, the inspections, Madam, Madam Speaker, where an auth and the Attorney General will deal with this because I believe there may be some amendments. So I'll skip over to part six of the act. Where for the first time, and again, kudos to the Attorney General and the drafts people of this legislation who took current government policy to draft and they have introduced for the first time scrap metal inspectors. Madam Speaker, I heard the most, well, I can't say the most because there's here a lot of it. A very disturbing proposition from the member for Mayaro asking, designate public officers. So who are these public officers? Where are you going to find public officers? You're pulling them from... That is simply not how it works. And to come and to try and confuse the population, the population can be assured, as we heard the Minister of Trade say, that a proper department is going to be built out to carry out the regulation of this industry. You're going to have at part seven regist registers, and then importantly at part nine offenses. And this is an area that the population is invited to take a look at, Madam Speaker, because you're seeing how serious the government views this problem of the theft and the destruction of infrastructure, both private and public infrastructure, that then end up as exports in containers. When you look at the types of fines, the types of sentences that can be passed when one is found guilty of committing an offense under this legislation. So for example, a licensed scrap metal collector who fails to display his license in a motor vehicle or goods vehicle used in his business as a scrap metal collector commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $250,000. So in other words, don't engage in illegality. Madam Speaker, 
We see that this is good legislation. The government has thought it through, the government has listened, and the government has produced this. And I fully commend it to the population through you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Member for Point of Pair. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for allowing me to, to join this debate, the Scrap of Metal Bill 2022. Before I get into my presentation, I'd just like to, to rebut some of the information that the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, would have put out there in his debate. Firstly, Madam Speaker, let me just start off by saying the opposition is about good legislation. We, we support good legislation. And we also support, and we are all agree, that the metal bill, the metal industry, or the scrap iron industry, Madam Speaker, needs regularization and needs regulating, Madam Speaker. Even the association, who is led by Mr. Ferguson, who is in, in the public audience today, is in agreement with proper and good legislation for, for the industry, Madam Speaker. So, so let me put that out on the table. What we are in disagreement with is that whether or not this piece of legislation that's presented here today can work for the industry in Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, let me first start off. I listened to the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, intently. No, it's a time-honored tradition from the desk. Banging the desk is not consistent with that time on a tradition. So maybe members are stronger than, than they realize, but some of what is passing as thumping can constitute disturbing the proceedings. Okay? So I'll ask all members to take a barometer on their strength. Continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me just start off by saying again, the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, and I listened to his debate very closely, intently. And I want to say, after listening to what he presented here this afternoon, I, I, I want to say respectfully that the minister does not understand the scrap iron industry, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, they brought a piece of legislation here today, and I, I, I'm going to repeat that I, we don't feel that it is workable. The association and the people in the industry does not feel this piece of legislation is workable in its current form that is being presented here today, Madam Speaker. And I will show some concerns, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, and I want to start off by saying, in my constituency of Point of Pair, Claxon Bay area, Madam Speaker, I was not even aware until when this government shut down the industry that the Claxton Bay area um, generates or earn, as, as generates in that industry over 50%, Madam Speaker. So it's a huge industry out of the Claxton Bay area. And, and I don't know if it's because of the lo location close to the Forest Park um, waste environmental site, Madam Speaker. So I was, I was surprised of the em high employment that this industry generates for the Claxton Bay area, Madam Speaker. And besides generating employment and earning a revenue for, these, for the people of Claxton Bay, Madam Speaker, it is the lower end of the social strata that earns an income to keep sustenance, to keep a meal to feed their family, Madam Speaker, on a daily basis based on the scrap, in, scrap iron industry, Madam Speaker. So this scrap iron industry is very important. It is very important not only for the country, but certain parts, of, I would say for the entire country, but especially certain parts of my um, constituents of Point of Pair, Madam Speaker. So I listened to, to Minister Young, um, the member of Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, I apologize, Madam Speaker. When the member referred to old people saying that when you pell stone, the person who ball is the person to watch out for. But I want to tell the member, the 
people who are hurting in this country are the people who could get employment and earn a sustenance when this government shut down the scrap iron industry in August, Madam Speaker. And we are crying and we are asking this government for the good of the, of the people, for the good of the industry, for the good of the, of, of the, the families that this industry feed and earn a living from, Madam Speaker, that please maybe bring a piece of legislation that is workable to put back the industry on its feet, Madam Speaker. Because in its current form, if you were to take this piece of legislation in its current form, Madam Speaker, I would not be surprised that this industry will never open back up again, Madam Speaker, based on the kind of legislation and, and, and clauses and, and licensing regime that is required, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the history of this scrap iron industry goes back beyond, especially I would just say from, from 2001, for the last 20 something years, Madam Speaker, that the, the industry has mushroomed to, uh, I would say, one of the revenue earners for this country, over $200 million, Madam Speaker. I also listened to the member um, for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, when he piloted or, or gave his debate, the member talked about is a small minority of people who do illegal activity within industry. And we agree with him. I think the association and the dealers association and the, and the individuals that work in that, that industry, they also agree with the member for Port of Spain, North East and West. That is why the association and the industry has been calling for time and time again for regularization of the industry, Madam Speaker, so that things could be better for them. They can have proper banking information. They can go and have the, it something similar to the gambling bill, Madam Speaker, that the, 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 that the industry within the scrap iron um, area, Madam Speaker, that they can have better banking facilities, Madam Speaker, and they can get better loan facilities, et cetera, et cetera, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, we, we have no problem with regulating the industry, but it has to be done in a way that it can bring back the industry to, to, to life and the, and the 25,000 plus employees who earn a living can get back on their feet and earn a living to feed their families, Madam Speaker. That is what we are asking about. I think that is what the association has been calling for. Now, the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, in his, in his presentation, his entire 45 minutes, Madam Speaker, the member keeps referring to the criminal element of the industry, Madam Speaker. And there is and has been a criminal element, and we agree that maybe the, the, the type of um, strong regulations that is in this bill, bill can maybe lessen the, the severity of the criminal element within the industry, Madam Speaker. And the association is happy for that. They're not against regulating the industry. The opposition and the, and the party is not against regulating the industry, Madam Speaker. And one has to ask yourself, Deputy Speaker, given the state of the economy and given the, 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 what has been happening in, in the scrap iron industry, especially in the last two years, is it due to the fact that under this government, we are really seeing that they have been hapless in trying to, to make our economy buoyant and give people sustenance. Because we didn't have the level of criminality in this industry before, Madam Speaker, um, Deputy Speaker. It, it just talks about where we are as a country, especially the economy, um, Deputy Speaker. So that when you shut down, several industries are closed down, several industries within the Point Lisas in the energy sector, which is close to Claxton Bay, Deputy Speaker. What you found happening is a lot of the, 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 the males, the heads of the household, had to actually generate an income. And a lot of them got into the scrap iron industry as a, as a quick way of trying to feed their families, Deputy Speaker. And we cannot fault them for that, Deputy Speaker. It talks about the state of the economy under this government, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, when, I, when, the, when this government shut down the industry, I think in, in, on August the 15th, and, and the industry has yet to be opened back up, I met with Mr. Ferguson and his team as a member for Pointer Pier. 
the, my, the member for Shagonas West, I invited them to attend that meeting. When you heard the, 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 the stories, the personal stories from the individuals who came to that meeting, Deputy Speaker, especially in August when they shut down the, 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 the industry and it was close to reopening of the, of the semester term, Deputy Speaker. And they were actually, there, there were women in the audience who were actually crying out that where would they be able to buy books to be able to send their children to school, Deputy Speaker. That is the reality, Deputy Speaker. So Deputy Speaker, the association <laughs> is in agreement with regulation, but the association and the opposition, we're about feeding the families of that lower end of, the, of, of, of income, um, Deputy Speaker. It plays a, re, a, a real role in, in feeding families, Deputy Speaker. I listened to a particular lady that day in that meeting, um, Deputy Speaker. She lives in the Prance, the person lives in the Prance Gardens of Claxton Bay. And how, she, how that individual is able to feed her family, Deputy Speaker, is literally go house to house collecting scrap and then taking that scrap to a collector and the collector would pay the individual for that, for that scrap, that material, and then the, that individual may be able to buy food for the day to be able to feed her family, Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure the government is, is not against feeding families. But when you look at this le reg um, legislation in its current form, all I'm asking is that, is it feasible? Is it workable to get the industry back operating, Deputy Speaker? Deputy Speaker, because that is what the association is here today. That is why they are tw over 25,000 individuals may be viewing today, because they, they are hoping that the industry could be started up based on a, on 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 Chagonas West, the member Chagonas, when he, they, um, he read out an article, the impression was given that in some form and fashion the industry would be restarted by the minimum December 31st, 2022, Deputy Speaker. And I, as a member for Point of Pair, Marxin, when would be the industry be open back up? We have no problem. I think the association has no problem with the ban on copper, even though that could be done a different way, but at least open back the industry so that families could feed, could be fed, and, and husbands and wives and, and the head holes of, of, the, of the house can, be, can start earning a living again, Deputy Speaker. That is all we ask for. That is all we ask for. Deputy Speaker, when we met in August with some of those con, um, collectors and dealers and even the normal individuals who would collect scrap, and sell, Deputy Speaker. A lot of them took loans, Deputy Speaker, maybe just to, to buy a refrigerator at courts, et cetera, Deputy Speaker. And they, they were scareful, fearful that, that those items that they would have purchased, higher purchase, that they would have been taken away from them, um, Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure since August to now, Deputy Speaker, if you do a survey, a lot of those individuals, those homes that the families would have had to give up things that they might have purchased um, by a higher purchase or loan, depending on an income from the scrap iron industry, Deputy Speaker. That is, yes, so that is all we ask. We are not, we are not asking to, 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 to entertain criminality, Deputy Speaker. We, we want regulations, but we want regulations that is workable, Deputy Speaker, and, uh, and be able to operationalize as quickly as possible. Up to today, the procurement regulation has not been operationalized, Deputy Speaker. And I hope that this bill, this bill does not fall the same way like that procurement um, bill, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, the, when you look at the flow chart of how this industry operates, Deputy Speaker, you have individuals who might collect the material and they would sell it to a collector the collector will then transport it to the dealers, Deputy Speaker. And that's how I look at it in a very simplistic way. So you have the, 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 the low end, the individuals who earn a living from collecting the material, 
um, scrap um, metal, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, now you're asking, and maybe if you look at the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, I mean, in a perfect world, Deputy Speaker, this legislation is like if we are in a perfect world, but this is not the reality of our industry at this point in time. And might, we might get there, but it, we have to take the baby steps to get there, Deputy Speaker. And while we're doing the baby steps to get there, at least families can be earning an income to feed their loved ones, Deputy Speaker. And that is what we ask for. So, Deputy Speaker, when you look at some of the, what, is, what is required, where I live, I used to hear a gentleman, every, every other day used to pass around. I never could understand what the, what, the, what the van was saying. But it was basically old scrap battery buying, Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure there are individuals who would sell the battery to that collector for whatever item, maybe at $20 or whatever. But the bigger issue there is that a lot of the homes in certain parts of Trinidad would have been happy that you have a collector coming around in their neighborhood, collecting the, the, their waste, whether it is a battery, whether it is, is some scrap iron, et cetera, Deputy Speaker, and they would not have to, to, to actually cut it away or get rid of it. Somebody comes to their home and they actually do that process of collecting that item. What you're now asking the individual who's happy to get rid of that waste for the collector to receive that waste, Deputy Speaker, those individuals must provide some sort of proof that they owned the item, Deputy Speaker. That's how I read it in the bill. If I'm wrong, I, mean, I, I hope the Attorney General can clarify that. So that if you had an old battery, I take that as an example, and then you have a, a licensed collector who's coming around, he has to be licensed in a truck, and I'm assuming that Individuals can only sell waste metal or waste material now to licensed collectors. So you have to look and see that the individual is a licensed collector. Um, and that must be clearly shown on the vehicle. Those individuals, homeowners, who are happy to get rid of their waste, now have to produce, before the collector collects the item, from, my, from, from reading of this bill, they have to produce some sort of bill that they actually own the, the material or the, or the matter before the collector can receive it legally, Deputy Speaker. Now, how many of us really keep, I, I mean, every battery I buy, I would throw away the bill or whatever item. How, I mean, how, do you, that, I, I'm, 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 I'm asking, let us be real, let us be realistic when we are bringing legislation and make it workable for the, for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Deputy Speaker. So I am asking, do I now cannot get rid of my battery? Because if I lost that bill, I cannot give it to the collector and the collector cannot receive it because it, it will become illegal to receive an old battery if the collector doesn't have proof of a bill from the person he, he bought it from. That alone, Deputy Speaker, is a cumbersome process. We have individuals, whether you, you like them or not, they have individuals who provide a service to Trinidad and Tobago. They earn a living, Deputy Speaker. They go to the two dumps that I am aware of, maybe there are three, Beatum, Forest Park in the Claxon Bay area, and I think there's another one in, in the east, uh, in Arima area. They go to that, those particular dumps to try and earn a living for their family. So they collect material. The material that is collected from the dumps, they, they put themselves through hazards and they collect the material. And you have to admire these people, Deputy Speaker, because in our view, they're earning an honest living. So they collect whatever waste material that they find in the dump. They take it to a collector. The collector pays them for whatever the type of material it is. And they, they barter, they trade. So they, they earn an income, they get cash, 
and they're able to feed their family or buy something for themselves, Deputy Speaker. They provide a service. They earn a living. Now, what you are saying, that the collectors or the site dealers cannot buy these materials from these individuals because the individuals collected from the dump and the waste, they would have no receipt, no bills, and they have been doing this for years, Deputy Speaker. And we agree that these people are earning an honest living. But what becomes of that situation, Deputy Speaker? How are they to show proof of ownership that they got this material in the dump? I ask, so I don't know if the Attorney General can add some clarity or maybe shape the regulations or the bill in a different way. So that is one issue that employs and people who earn a living, a great number of individuals, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, that's one aspect. So I, I, I gave you two instances, the normal household, um, like us, who are happy to get rid of their waste. Now they can't do it unless they have some proof of ownership of whatever material they're given to the collector. The collector cannot receive it unless they have proof of ownership or some document saying that that material, I purchased that material for X amount of dollars from Mr. X, Mrs. Ms. Y, Deputy Speaker. That is the reality we live in, and that is the kind of service that this industry was providing for Trinidad and Tobago. So we ask, how do we continue? Do we then collect waste in our households? And what do we do with that waste? Because we have no proof of ownership. So I leave that right there, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, when you look back on all the releases and comments made by the association over the, I would say over the last six, seven years, Deputy Speaker, they have always been about regulating their industry. And they have provided some, some guidelines to assist the government. Um, and I don't know if this piece of legislation that is before us here today, Deputy Speaker, that it was fleshed out or had a discussion with the stakeholders like the, 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 the Scrap Industry Association, et cetera, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, one of the concerns I have with some of the clauses in this bill, at least one or two that will impact on each other, was is that um, if you're an individual that has a, a past uh, criminal record, you cannot be part of this industry. I don't know if I'm interpreting it wrong, and maybe the, 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 the Attorney General can clear, clear up that area. Because you have many people who this industry affords a living who no, no one else will employ them, Deputy Speaker. That is a fact, Deputy Speaker. So this industry, um, ex-prisoners are able to make a living legally out of this industry. And what this, the, some of the clauses here is saying, you cannot be part of this industry if you have a checkered career, uh, Deputy Speaker. If you have a, 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 if you're a past prisoner or a, a past convict, Deputy Speaker. And we find that is very harsh, Deputy Speaker. Because where, where are you now telling these individuals who are part of this industry, who have been earning a living, where do you ask them to go and seek employment, Deputy Speaker? Where, where are you asking them to earn a living, Deputy Speaker? Where are, them, or where are they to be able to feed their families? That is the kind of industry that this was creating and working for the families of Trinidad and Tobago. That is reality, Deputy Speaker. That is the reality of that industry. And the industry generates income export income and earn income for the country, Deputy Speaker. So when you, so when, when you look at some of the clauses, you have to ask, and I keep saying it, Deputy Speaker, is it really workable? 
Or is this government really don't want to open back up this industry, Deputy Speaker? And there is a need for an industry. So I know they, have, they, they understand the industry. I know they, have a, they understand that there's a need for an industry. They, 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 the industry provides a critical service for the country, even in respect to environmental, um, Deputy Speaker. Mary Speaker, when you look at in one interpretation clause two, dwelling house, and I quote, the interpretation of a dwelling house. Dwelling house means any premises, including any complementary outbuildings and adjacent land. And I want to stress an adjacent land, which is used and occupied as a place of residence. So, especially within my constituency of Claxton Bay, Deputy Speaker, there are a lot of individuals who I would call them, they would call themselves collectors, and they now have to be licensed. And now you're asking them to, they can't operate unless, if they were operating within the interpretation of, 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 of what is here in clause two, a dwelling house interpretation. These individuals literally have to go out of business. These individuals literally have to find some free land or go squatting on some state land that is far removed and is considered not a dwelling house, Deputy Speaker. Now, I understand the issues with dwelling house, and I, I take that in consideration. It could be a nuisance, and it could be a health issue, Deputy Speaker. But one has to remember, some of these same areas that house presently uh, sites for collection of material maybe five, six years ago, or seven years, or 10 years ago, that particular area, Deputy Speaker, was not a dwelling area. It might have been a, an area that had no homes, and these individuals might have used that particular area to start up the, the, their sites. And after years, a lot of homes might have come in. And then the in, entire interpretation of what is a dwelling house changes for these individuals, Deputy Speaker. So we have a, a concern with that, I have a concern as a member for Point of Pier, especially in the Claxton Main area, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, when I look at- Honorable member, um, you have three more minutes of your initial speaking time. You can avail yourself to an additional 15. You so I'll take it one time, Deputy Proceed. Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. When you look at clause part two in the licensing, and you talk and clause three, Clause 4-2, sorry, Deputy Speaker, 4-2. And I want to quote, a person who has been convicted of an indictable offense under the Dangerous Drug Act or the Proceeds of Crime Act shall not be eligible for a license unless the conviction has been expounded under the Dangerous Drug Act, Deputy Speaker. And that is what I mentioned previously, Deputy Speaker, that there are individuals who trying to reform and trying to have reform them, themselves by being in this industry. And if they have been convicted of an indictable offense, they can no longer be part of this industry, Deputy Speaker. So I, I, I hope that they, I, we, we understand what the industry, you know, you try to, to get the criminal element out of it, Deputy Speaker, but you can also hurt those individuals who, have tr who are, are reforming themselves and this is the only industry that can give them a lifeline, Deputy Speaker. I think that is heartless by this government not to take that into consideration, Deputy Speaker. And I ask, I actually plead with the Attorney General to maybe consider some adjustment to this, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I want to just, before I, my time is up, I didn't expect to take so much time. Um, Again, I want to agree with the, my, my colleague, the member for Mayaro, who did an excellent opening um, presentation for the opposition. The, the licenses are for one year. Now, one year, 12 months fly, and snap of your finger, Deputy Speaker. And you're now asking these individuals, whether it's a collector, whether it's a side dealer, every year you to renew your license. And so you, and you have to put things in place to re start renewing your license. So you might, you might literally have nine months out there, 12 months, before you, you start to get worried about renewal of your license. So you might have to start to actually 
start the process three months before your 12 months lapse because you don't want your 12 months to go over, your annual to go over and you're not renewed, Deputy Speaker, because that can do damage to, to your business and it can do damage to earn a living, Deputy Speaker. So I, I, I like my member for, uh, my colleague for MP uh, Mayaro, if the Attorney General can look at that annual licensing issue, um, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I want to talk about a little bit about the non-transferability of license. A per, and, and that is clause, I think clause 14, one. A person to whom a license has been issued under this act is prohibited from transferring or assigning a license to another person. Now I ask, not only individuals, I can understand the individual aspect not being able to transfer license because that the license would, would be in his or her name, Deputy Speaker. But if it's a company operating under a company name, and that license is registered to John Doe Limited, and the dealer of that company is bought out or sells the company, why the license doesn't automatically go with the business? Why it will be non-transferable as a company, Deputy Speaker? So I, I don't know if the Attorney General could look or maybe explain to, to, to me why that is not possible to be able to transfer a license if it's in a company name, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, again, I talked about the collectors. I want, also want to agree with my colleague for MP Mayaro, um, Clause 16.5. When you look at this, the, 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 the scrap metal collector, there are certain things that the individual has to do to maintain that license. Not A, not purchase or receive scrap metal from a person without verifying the full person's name and address, and B, obtain a signed and dated statement of ownership from the person that he is, one, the legal owner of the scrap metal, or two, lawfully entitled to sell the scrap metal, and C, not offload, store, pack, or sort scrap metal at any premises that are not a scrap, mat, scrap, mat, uh, scrap metal site specified in the scrap metal dealer's license. I, I have no problem with 5C, Deputy Speaker. I mentioned, and I wouldn't rehash it, about 5A, B, and C, uh, A and B in that particular clause, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, when you look at, again, I'll come back to the industry, the individuals who work in that industry, Deputy Speaker. It is a, I would, for lack of a better word, is it, it is, is a chaos industry, it's a haphazard. They have individuals who have been dropped out of school, individual, but they are earning a decent living, Deputy Speaker, uh, to feed their families. And now you're asking in clause 21, scrap metal record, records. A scrap metal dealer, and I would, it, it also includes not only a dealer, but a collector, um, the kind of records that are being required to, to have in place before your license is given, or even to maintain your license, again, th that is a first world status situation, Deputy Speaker. And we are saying we have no problem with, with proper re record keeping, but again, we need to, to do the baby steps with this industry and these in, and they will come up to speed. I am sure the association and the collectors and it will come up to speed. But when you're asking them from day one to produce these kind of records, Deputy Speaker, I think it's a little bit um, too much at this point in time, Deputy Speaker. And I'm sure that the, the, the individuals who work in that industry will come up to speed, but they need some time, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, when we look at the inspection by the inspector, and as I, I come to a close, the, the, in, fi, in clause 21, no, sorry, clause 24, 5, where on inspection of the scrap metal, it is found to be fit for export, the scrap metal inspector shall issue a fit for shipping certificate as prescribed. After the payment of the prescribed fee, and the certificate shall also be signed and dated by the police officer present, Deputy Speaker. So what, what has to happen, I'm asking, I hope, you know, 
there isn't a delay by individuals to put a layer of bureaucracy when it's time to export containers which have been legally signed off on, Deputy Speaker. So I just put that out as a part of the thing. As I end, Deputy Speaker, I want to ask the, 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 the Attorney General, 231, clause 231, administrative fines. And I want to read, and maybe I'm, I'm looking for guidance, Attorney General. Where the permanent secretary of the ministry, and I'm assuming it's the Ministry of Trade, has reasonable cause to believe that a person has continued, committed, has committed a prescribed summary offense, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Trade may issue to that person a notice offering the person the opportunity to dispense with any liability to conviction in respect of that offense by payment of the prescribed administrative fine. Now, Deputy Speaker, I ask, and I don't know, I, I might be wrong, and I ask for guidance from the Attorney General, why are we putting that onus on the permanent secretary of, of the Ministry of Trade to be the judge and jury of prescribing fines or not prescribing administrative fines in that industry? Why we want to put that responsibility on a permanent secretary? I ask, because I, I have, unless there's somewhere else that permanent secretaries can do this, Deputy Speaker, I don't know why would we want to put that responsibility of prescribing fines or not prescribing fines to the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Trade, Deputy Speaker. So, Deputy Speaker, as I come to an end, um, this industry is a very important industry for Trinidad and Tobago. This industry is a very important industry for the people of Claxton Bay, Point of Pier, um, Deputy Speaker. This industry generates millions of dollars for this country. This industry generates a living, a livelihood for the, for, for the lower level of our society, of our country, Deputy Speaker. They earn an honest living, Deputy Speaker. But with this legis piece of legislation, as in its current form, in its current form, we have an issue with it because we do not believe it is, would achieve what, the, what this government wants to achieve with this piece of legislation to sustain the people who live and earn a living from this industry. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. I recognize the member for Lopino Bonne West. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I first wish to begin my contribution by congratulating the hardworking staff of the Office of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs for putting together, in short order, a comprehensive policy paper to treat with the issue of the scrap iron metal industry in Trinidad and Tobago. I wish to thank and congratulate the Honorable Attorney General for the work that he has done over the last three months in short order to put together a very comprehensive and modern piece of legislation so that we, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, can tackle the issues in this industry which we have suffered for far too long which has threatened the stability of Trinidad and Tobago in so many ways, causing so many sectors in the national community and in the media for the government to make the appropriate legislative intervention to tackle the issues in this industry. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the government, through the previous speakers on this side, we have made it abundantly clear that we recognize the contribution that the scrap iron industry continues to make to the economy of Trinidad and Tobago, and the fact that it continues to create employment opportunities for those vulnerable citizens in our society. But the issues that we are faced with in Trinidad and Tobago are no different from our partners in the region and all over the world. And what we are seeking to do here today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, 
many of our partners regionally and internationally would have walked that road because they have faced the very issues that we are dealing with today. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as a legislator, as a member of parliament, I always remind myself that my primary responsibility as an MP is to facilitate the passing of laws for the good government, for the good governance of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That is our role, that is our responsibility. And therefore, when we face serious challenges as a country, we must come here to put our heads together and pass laws for the good government of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And this is exactly what we are trying to do here today. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can tell you that as Minister of Public Utilities, the utility sector has been one of the sectors in the national community that has been reeling under the effects and on the challenges and the criminality and the illegalities in the scrap iron industry. Mr. Deputy Speaker, so many of our citizens would remember just months ago several booster stations all over Trinidad and Tobago, especially in central Trinidad and in East Trinidad, were vandalized as a result of criminals operating in the scrap iron industry. So many of our wells were being attacked. Constantly on a daily basis, we would see reports all over the national media of the infrastructure of the Water and Sewage Authority being attacked, being vandalized by persons who are operating in this scrap iron industry. On so many occasions, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Bourne's Road, for example, and Santa Cruz and some parts of central Trinidad, where we would have seen the infrastructure that would have taken water into people's homes were being attacked, depriving so many of our communities with water. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can tell you, within a short period of time, thousands of citizens all over Trinidad and Tobago would have experienced the inconvenience of their water supply being disrupted because of persons operating within this scrap iron industry. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can tell you that within that short period of time, WASA would have expended over $20 million in restoration activities to ensure that the water supplies to those communities who have been impacted by these practices, that the water supply would have been restored. I can tell you also, Mr. Deputy Speaker, not only the Water and Sewage Authority, but TNTEC infrastructure has been under tremendous strain in this industry. Within a period of four or five months, pores in Faisabad would have been cut down, costing the utility company $60,000. Pores in Pinal, cable theft at Debe, Debe substation, cable theft at the St. Mary substation, cable theft at the Pinto Road substation, all impacting upon the utility company's ability to provide electricity services to their customers. What should we do as parliamentarians? Sit and allow these things to happen? Or should we invoke our constitutional power to come here and pass laws to tackle those very issues that are impacting the lives of our citizens? I agree, and we all agree, that we have a number of our citizens and vulnerable citizens who would have gained employment and a source of income in this industry. And that is exactly why this legislation was passed to ensure that there is a reasonable balance between those persons who are perpetuating criminal activities against the people of Trinidad and Tobago in, in this industry and those persons who are 
All they are doing is seeking to gain a legitimate income so that they can feed their families. And that is the reason why we passed this, this legislation. That is what we are seeking to do, strike that reasonable balance so that those who are inclined to perpetuate criminal activities upon the people of Toronto Tobago and attack the country's utility infrastructure and other infrastructure so that they can be held at bay, so that persons who are inclined to operate within a well-regulated sector can continue to earn their living unabated. Mr. Deputy Speaker, TSTT is one other state entity that suffered tremendous damage to the tune of 14 to 20 million dollars in illegal activities and vandalism and attack on their infrastructure, depriving hundreds of thousands of citizens of telecommunication services, especially, especially from the member for Mayaru, the first speaker on the opposition benches. A number of citizens in Mayaru were impacted where they had no access to telecommunication services as a result of the conduct of criminals in this industry. And I would have hoped and I expected that if my good friend from Mayaru, as he led and he opened the debate for the opposition, to speak in defense of his constituents who have been impacted by thieves and criminals in the scrap iron industry. And if he fails to do that, and if he fails to do that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as Member of Parliament for Lupino Borneo West, I stand in defense of this bill for the people of Mayaro who have been impacted by the illegal activities in the scrap iron industry. I do that. According to TSTT, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for the period March 2022 to July 2022, TSTT endured approximately 361 fiber breaks across Trinidad and Tobago, with the largest concentration being in the central and southern regions. In the central and southern regions. As of June 2022, TSTT had experienced approximately 90 acts of vandalism each month, which averages to roughly three acts of vandalism per day, Mr. Deputy Speaker. While the vandals are after copper, since they do not know the difference between copper and cable and fiber, they all end up cutting TSTT's fiber cable because they simply do not know the difference between fiber and copper. And whilst the fiber cables have no intrinsic value to the vandals, the cost have a serious impact on TSTT's business. Restoration costs were extremely high, Mr. Deputy Speaker, averaging $41,422 per incident as fiber bricks are particularly cost to repair, costly to repair. TSTT has spent, Mr. Deputy Speaker, approximately $14.9 million to keep the country connected over the period 2022, March 2022 to July 2022. To give you an example of the problems, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in 2016, there have been nine acts of vandalism. From 2017, it rose to 29. 2018, Mr. Deputy Speaker, 68. Drop a bit in 2019 to 43, rose in 2020, 89, 2021, 325 bricks on TSTT's infrastructure, and in 2022, 427, depriving hundreds of thousands of our citizens with telecommunication services. I can tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is it strange? Is it coincidental that since the legal notice was signed by the Honorable Minister of Trade and Industry 
in August the 12th, 2022. There has not been one act of vandalism on TSTT's infrastructure, not one act. Is it a coincidence? I wonder. Is it that a simple act of signing a legal notice? Wasa has not reported one act of vandalism on its infrastructure. TNTech has reported not one act of vandalism on its infrastructure since the signing of that legal notice by the Minister of Trade and Industry. Thank you. Proceed, proceed, member. They, they, you see, they don't like to hear the facts. They prefer, they prefer to come here and play populist politics, pretending as though they are the voice for the voiceless and the vulnerable. But they are nothing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but empty vessels with nothing to offer to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Nothing. So to come here and pretend as though you are fighting for the voiceless and those vulnerable citizens and the poor citizens in the scrap iron industry, we are telling you here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are telling the people of Trinidad and Tobago that this law is targeted at those who are bent on creating mayhem in the society whilst we protect the weak, the poor, and the vulnerable. This is what this legislation will do. And I cannot understand when you one looks at the provision in this legislation, why someone who is interested in operating within a legal and a legislative and a well-regulated framework will have any difficulty with registering as a collector or a dealer? Why would someone who is interested in operating in a well-regulated sector will have any difficulty or any challenge with a law enforcement officer, an authorized officer, coming into their premises to inspect. Why would one have any difficulty with a piece of legislation that prevents criminals and those who are convicted of dangerous drugs and anti-money laundering offenses from participating? Why? Why? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am confident that as a member of parliament that this law, this piece of legislation that was presented by the Honorable Attorney General is very reasonable, is very justifiable, and it will ensure that those who are bent on creating mayhem in the society will be kept away from the industry. And those goodly citizens, those law-abiding citizens who gain some source of livelihood and income from this industry that they be allowed to continue to operate legitimately, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I have said, there have been numerous calls. And I wish to quote from a Sunday Guardian's report dated August the 21st, 2022. On this very particular matter, and I quote, and that's an editorial, not a report, an editorial of Sunday, August the 21st, 2022, mere days after the signing of that legal notice. Apart from the thefts, there is currently no way to ensure that scrap iron dealers comply with the health and environmental requirements that are registered or conforming with operating systems that are sustainable. And I quote again, apart from the thefts, there is currently no way to ensure that scrap iron dealers comply with health and environmental requirements, that they are registered, or conforming with operating systems that are sustainable. This is mainly because the sector is governed by the outdated Old Metal and Marine Stores Act of 1904. The toughest penalties under this law are a fine on summary conviction of just $1,000, and in some cases, cancellation of license, which are hardly deterrence 
in such a lucrative sector. So they have recognized, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that there was a legitimate purpose and that there is a legitimate need for this old piece of legislation of 1904 to be updated so as to treat with some of the contemporary challenges that are affecting the industry. And that is why we are here. But in reading, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the report from the Law Reform Commission, which guided the drafting of this piece of legislation, I found it quite interesting when it says that the definition of old metal is talking about the case for transformation and the case for updating this old 1904 piece of legislation. It said that the definition of old metal is antiquated and does not fully encompass crap metal in its various forms. The criteria for the granting of a license to deal with scrap metal is too lenient. Many scrap metal collectors do not adequately secure the load being transported in breach of the regulations stipulated in the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act. There is a proliferation of unsanctioned scrap metal sites. The Minister of Trade, in her contribution early on, told this parliament and the national community that there are over 80 unlicensed scrap iron yards operating all over Trinidad and Tobago. And I can tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that on many of those sites, wasa pumps and motors were located. And I can tell you, without prejudicing some of the ongoing investigation, that some of those containers that were confiscated a couple months ago and have been opened, quite a number of TSTT's infrastructure and copper and infrastructure belonging to TNTEC have been discovered in some of those containers on the port. And that is what we are dealing with here today. We are not fighting the vulnerable citizens. We are not fighting those citizens who wish to operate legitimately. We are fighting criminals and those who dare to stand in defense of criminals. That is the battle that we are fighting. The report also says, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that there is a proliferation of unsanctioned scrap metal sites which are not properly secured and should be located away from the general public to prevent air, visual, thermal, water, environmental, and noise pollution and health hazards during the transporting and sorting processes. The last speaker from Point Pier, as well as the speaker from Mayaro, stood a short while ago and questioning why the law is preventing dwelling homes from being converted into places for scrap iron operation. And I wondered, Mr. Deputy Speaker, whether the goodly member of Mayaro will have absolutely no objection with his neighbor operating a scrap iron in his neighborhood next to his house. Is it that, that is the signal are we sending in this parliament to citizens across Trinidad and Tobago, that it is all well and good for a, your neighbor to set up a scrap iron operation next to you in a residential community, a place that has been approved for persons to live peacefully and comfortably? I wonder, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what messages honorable members of parliament continue to send to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, that is not the country that Dr. Eric Williams envisaged. Whom they are speaking for, I wonder. And I wish to remind honorable members opposite that we live our lives and we operate under rules and regulations. Too often we have a problem of unregulated and illegal developments and illegal activities taking place all over Trinidad and Tobago, contributing to flooding and other incidents. 
that impact the lives of our citizens, and you stand here today and question why is the legislation seeking to prohibit dwelling homes from being converted into places to operate scrap iron operations. I find it to be quite shocking and quite unfortunate. I wish to be very diplomatic. It is shocking and very unfortunate. Because I can tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I do not wish for anyone of my neighbor to set up a scrap iron operation next to where I live, thereby endangering the lives and endangering the health of my neighbors and my family. It is wrong. And all the law is saying that wherever one wishes to set up an, a scrap iron yard or an operation to engage in scrap iron activities, one should simply make the appropriate application to the Town and Country Planning Division and the Environmental Management Authority to get the requisite approval where you can designate an appropriate place for one to conduct that kind of activity. What is so objectionable about that? And I want to warn honorable members opposite to be very responsible in the position that you advance in this parliament. Because certainly, I do not believe that that is the message being conveyed to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when one looks at this bill, it is very difficult for one to come to the conclusion or for one to disagree that this bill is not going to advance the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. The first or the second part of this bill, it talks about the need for the licensing of collectors and dealers, the, eligib the eligibility for a license, the minister to grant, revoke a license, and the honorable member talk about the law proposing or giving the minister arbitrary powers, and I will go into some of these provisions to show that unlike what is being advanced and what was being advanced by members opposite, the law does circumscribe the powers of the minister in the exercise of his or her discretion with respect to the granting of a collector's or dealer's license. The law does circumscribe the powers of the minister with respect to the suspension of a license, and that before such suspension is made, that the minister should write and allow the licensee to make the requisite representation before such decision is taken. The process is clearly laid out within the, part, within the bill. And if the minister decides to suspend the license, notwithstanding the representation being made or having considered the representation being made, nothing prevents a person from approaching the court and seeking to ask the court to review a decision of the minister with respect to the granting or the revocation of a license. That is well-established legal procedures. Well established. And therefore, to stand and give the impression that the law gives the minister arbitrary and wide powers to the extent that persons who may be negatively impacted by the decision of a minister will not have recourse for judicial review or any kind of review of the minister's decision is simply not true. It is simply not true. And therefore, I wish to commend the legislators and the drafters for including provisions that will allow the minister to request and to require representation. Honorable member, you have approximately three more minutes of your initial speaking time. 
You have an additional 15 minutes. I'll, you care to I'll take yourself? the additional 15. Thank you Proceed. very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And it will allow persons to make the requisite representation before such decision is taken. There is a provision, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Clause 4, 4 of the bill, which speaks to the form for the application for a license for a collector or a dealer. And it is an anti-money laundering, anti-counter-financing um, of terrorism and financing of the proliferation of mass, of weapons of mass destruction. Recognizing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that there can be a correlation between the activities and the illegal activities in the scrap iron industry and actions relating to anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism and countering the financing of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Mr. Deputy Speaker, again, in Clause 6, it establishes the licensing regime and the application process to be followed, and it gives the minister the power to make or to grant refusal as the case may be. But as I've said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, those powers are not arbitrary. Those powers are not wide to the extent that persons who may be impacted can be negatively and will not have recourse to review. As a matter of fact, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if one looks at Clause 7, the refusal to grant a license, Clause 7, subclause B, it says as follows, where the application contains or is based on a false or misleading representation or on information which is false or misleading, the minister can revoke such a license. And to a person who is under the age of 18 years, is an undischarged bankrupt, or has been convicted during the period of five years, immediately preceding the date of the application for an offense. Where the applicant fails to satisfy any prescribed conditions or where he is of the opinion that the issue of the license would be contrary to the public interest. So it does not give the minister wide and arbitrary powers. It speaks to the occasions and the circumstances under which the minister may refuse to grant a license. Clause 8.1, the renewal of license. And taking into consideration the power to renew license, the clause provides that the minister may renew a license granted under this act where the licensee is operating within the conditions, the restrictions, or requirements subject to which the license was granted. There has been no change in the circumstances which existed at the time the license was granted, and the licensee has not been convicted of an offense involving fraud or dishonesty. The Honorable Member for Point Appear gave the impression that when one is convicted or one has a criminal conviction, then that person is precluded or prohibited from getting a license to operate as a collector or a dealer. That is simply not true, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is simply not true. Because the Act provides that it is where a person who has been convicted of an indictable offense under the Dangerous Drugs Act or the Proceeds of Crime Act, he or she shall not be eligible for a license unless the conviction has been expunged under the Dangerous Drug Act, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But you can be convicted of a criminal offense under the Summary Offenses Act under other pieces of legislation, under the larceny act, you can be convicted of an offense. But the law under section or clause 4.2 specifically states the offenses for which one will be precluded from getting a license. And therefore, the honorable member perhaps did not read the clause properly to understand its purport and its effect. 
So therefore, I wish again to remove any doubt, any doubt that may have been created by the contribution of the member for point up here that persons who are convicted of criminal offenses will not be entitled to get a license as an operator or a dealer. It is simply not true. The law was very clear on that. Very, very clear. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Clause 11, suspension of a license. I'll make that as my final point to again assure the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and honorable members opposite that the powers granted to the honorable minister of trade, they are not arbitrary, but they are well established and one in which the legislation is seeking to have a legitimate compromise between those persons who will be precluded from operating and who may be intended to operate illegally within this industry. And Clause 11.1 talks about the suspension of a license. And it states that before a license, the minister shall notify the licensee before a license is suspended. The minister shall notify the licensee of the proposed suspension. The minister shall notify the licensee in writing of the proposed suspension, A, stating the reason, therefore, and B, requiring the licensee in the case of a breach to remedy the breach within the specified notice. So it puts a responsibility on the minister before invoking the power of suspension to inform the licensee that he intends to take action and to provide the licensee with an opportunity to correct whatever breach he may be involved in. And if that breach or action has been corrected, the minister will not take the threatened action. If the minister proposes in clause 12.1, Two, refuse to grant a license under Section 7 or refuse to renew a license under Section 8 or revoke a license under Section, um, section 9, he shall give the applicant or licensee a notice which sets out what he proposes to do and the reasons for it. Responsible drafting of legislation by a responsible government. And therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, before I run out of time, I would have preferred to go into some other provisions within the Act. But I can say, as my honorable colleague would have mentioned earlier on, the entire value chain has been catered for. From the registration and the licensing of collectors, the management of scrap iron places, regulating their operation, giving powers to police officers and author, um, authorized officers to go into some of these premises to conduct whatever searches or inspections, allowing the controller of customs or his legitimate officers to inspect goods before they are loaded onto containers for export. The entire process is well catered for, well regulated. So therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the problems that we experience that would have led us yet today to pass this legislation, we would ensure as we lay the foundation to allow legitimate operators to operate within the confines of these laws and regulation, that they be allowed to do so responsibly and to, allow, to be allowed to do so legally. And those persons, that small group of citizens, who would have wreaked havoc on the people of Trinidad and Tobago, especially on our utility services, that they will not see the light of day to come back into this industry to tarnish the reputation of legitimate operators. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I support this legislation. I regard it as good, 
reasonable legislation and it will advance the cause of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, it's a pleasure to join the debate at this time on a very important matter before the Parliament, the Scrap Metal Bill 2022. Madam Speaker, in my memory, this is probably the first bill in memory that seeks to move as an objective, seeks to move our legislation from one century to another. We are moving legislation from 1904 to 2022, 118 years, Madam Speaker. And it's, it's a signal moment when you repeal legislation in this way and you climb from, from one century into another. So the new piece of legislation, the new bill, one expects would have modernity, would have reference to the principles of our time, reference to societal values, economic realities of our time, and not one century ago. And in my memory, this is really the first time I'm involved in a debate that jumps 118 years or so by repealing legislation. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> the speaker before me ended by indicating an overriding objective of this bill to protect society from that small group of people that wreak havoc on the society. I was, I was almost tempted to believe he was referring to the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago. But he was indeed referring to the issue of criminality and what led us, <laughs> what led us to this major uh, amendment, this major um, the bill that, that seeks to repeal an ordinance, which is criminality. And I think the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, spent a good amount of his time reflecting on that. But there are, there are twin objectives here. One key objective is the objective of dealing with criminality. Criminality, which reared its head only in recent times. Only within the last few years that we know of. The, the magnitude and intensity of criminal activity dealing with scrap iron, metals, and so on. But of course, a twin objective is to modernize, to regulate. An industry that appears to be prospering, that has benefits, to our social and economic environment. So two objectives, one criminality, one modernization for social and economic benefit because all the speakers before me spoke about the potential of this sector. Madam Speaker, in dealing with this bill, I spent some time studying, investigating, inquiring into the nature of this industry. And it's fascinating, if you look at the social and economic and labor market, uh, environment for this industry, it reminded me of the sugar industry. In that, at the lower end, you have employees and operators and so on who are in low, in elementary occupations, low income, menial, uh, manual work and so on. But at the uh, higher end, you have prosperous farmers, business persons, exporters. The scrap iron industry is an industry like that. It covers a lot. The Attorney General, his time was of course limited. The Attorney General did not tell us if he had gleaned, if he had um, you know, uh, received information, statistics, on the, the type of numbers this industry uh, you know, give rise to. And I am told by persons in the know, I am told that we have in this country, Madam Speaker, more or less because we approximate 130 more or less dealers in scrap iron, 
We have about 10 significant exporters of scrap iron, but we may have about 25,000 persons who are collectors of scrap iron and scrap metal. So I ask, wow, 25,000 is a lot. Then I'm told that this industry is really an, it's called an absor absorptive industry. It absorbs you. When you lose your job, you are retrenched, you are thrown out of your uh, formal employment, and you go into the informal sector, you lose your work, you close down. Now, this government has, with monotonous frequency, been closing down industry after industry after industry. So naturally, persons who are unemployed and trying to eke out a living, they go into these type of sectors to make a dollar. And this is why I am told that we may have as much as 20,000 human beings who can be classified as collectors of scrap metal. Now, that's a fascinating profile, economic and statistical profile of this industry, meaning more people are engaged in this industry than in the oil industry when it existed or in the sugar industry. Sugar industry had 10,000 people, more or less. So that's the first point. Related to that, this matter of criminality. As industries close down, as the economy collapsed, as they crashed the economy within the last seven years, it gave rise to more and more people eking out a living in the scrap metal industry. And Madam Speaker, that is important because the speaker before me said, I remember him in the booth, he said he would not want a neighbor to be operating a scrapyard next to him. I want to tell my friend from Lopino Bonner, the Minister of Public Utilities, that when you live on the 10th floor and you luxuriate on the 10th floor of a high-end uh, Port of Spain West apartment, we don't expect you to have a scrapyard next to you. We don't expect you to have the neighbor you know, collecting scrap on the 10th floor of luxurious apartment towers and so on. But if you understand village life, rural life, country life, you could understand that even where you have scrap iron yards, do you know it is the young boys, generally male, the young men of that community who work in the scrap yard. They get employment, they get income. Christmas is coming here, had that industry been open, they would have enjoyed a, a better Christmas season, Madam Speaker. So the, the, the scrap yard, like the plantation system, gave rise to income, to recreation, to you know, fraternal relations and communities and so on. Madam Speaker, I'm speaking because in my community in Oropuchis and elsewhere, there are scrapyards. And yes, you go to a scrapyard and when there's a, a holiday, for example, the day before a public holiday, they, they may have a convivial beverage and so on with all the workers who are members of the community. So it, it gives rise to community relations. And the member from Lo, Lopino Bonner must, you know, climb down from those towers. Take your elevator and come down to the ground floor and understand the reality of this sector. Madam Speaker, the Attorney General, of course, gave us some data which we can't argue with the global figures and so on and spoke about the importance of law. Let me say I had the opportunity and the pleasure between the period 2010 to 2015 to participate in interministerial meetings dealing with this sector. The Honorable Anan Ram Logan, Attorney General, maybe the best Attorney General this country has ever seen, chaired several meetings dealing with this sector in which we invited members of the relevant association. I have some, in some way, a knowledge of some of the issues. Madam Speaker, another introductory point I wish to make is that on Friday last, the Attorney General laid the bill in this house and announced in his statement that we will uh, convene today. I can say with some pride, but with some regret, that had it not been for the United National Congress and the opposition in Trinidad and Tobago, the relevant association of scrap iron dealers would never have had seen the bill that we are debating today. It is the UNC that gave the relevant association the bill, and I was appalled. I had the opportunity to meet representatives of this association and, 
And you know, I want to tell my colleagues opposite, when you're in government, good governance requires you to meet and treat with relevant stakeholders, to keep in touch, to embrace. It is not that we are trying to, you know, uh, ramage and gallery and so on. The, 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 the natural, the real thing, the honest, the sincere thing to do is to meet and treat. And I was told that the relevant association never received a copy of the bill had it not been for the UNC and the opposition in this parliament. Then I'm told, Madam Speaker, that the association did meet with the Attorney General and other ministers on the 23rd of November, in and around the 23rd of November, at which they were presented with a five-page document on some notes dealing with this sector, but the notes itself did not constitute a bill. They were rough notes on what is being proposed, some of which are not to be found in the bill before us today. I could not believe that an association that represents this sector, this is not where you have five associations and so on, there's one, could not be furnished with a bill, a copy of a bill, so that they can study, they can make comments, they can issue a release if they need to, and so on. And that's the, the first point I make on that matter. Madam Speaker, I now have the good, the good benefit of, of hearing several speakers before me, so there are some issues there's no need to, to delve in and so on, because they have been raised by colleagues on my side. But I wanted to reflect in, in, in this phase as well, as I, I, before I go into the a bill before us, I want to reflect on the Old Metal and Marine Store Act, Chapter 8407, the, the piece of legislation that we are repealing. Now, there are a few interesting points, Madam Speaker, and I begin with the one that really bothered me for some time. I kept asking everyone who I could meet, what is this about this industry that they operate, what is it, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m.? So can't you be engaged in scrap metal dealing one minute past six? What is that? It is found in the old metal and marine store, 1904. Now, at that time, I am not even sure they had electricity. In 2022, we were being told today by a minister that we have to operate between those hours because those are the hours of light. So apparently there's a blackout after one minute past six in 2022. No street lights, no warehouse lighting, no um, spotlight, no, you know, those big la lights they use on the highway. Imagine we pick and pave a road in the night, but we can't conduct a business or a trade in the night. Could you imagine that? So that in 2022, we are saying that this business up can only operate between 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. And at one minute past six, stop this business. Then we were told again that we are doing this because of criminality. Those persons who are stealing copper wire and ripping out the gates and the manhole cover and the, the beams from the Ministry of Works and Karani and so on, they operate in the night. But we have something called police. But I thought we had police. I thought it was a crime to steal from a government installation like TNTEC, WASA, TSTT, Ministry of this, Ministry of that. I always believed that it was a, an offense to steal. I didn't know that you only wait for the night. This suggests, which we said before, that the society is unpoliced. And you changing the law this way and bringing this piece of legislation doesn't police the society tomorrow. By tomorrow, when we pass this legislation, assuming we do, we will not have an efficient, proficient, uh, skillful Trinidad and Tobago police service. It will be the same police service from yesterday. So if you could not police the society in the last two years to prevent people from walking away with, with beam from the Ministry of Works, why you assume by passing this legislation you'll stop them? Law enforcement is the issue. It is not necessarily legislation this way. And I wrote that in the old marine stores, uh, metal and marine stores act. Because you see, Madam Speaker, in this, um, in this piece of legislation, imagine 118 years old, it says that a police, a constable, had power of entry and, and inspection. So since 1904, the police can enter, can inspect, can look at a scrapyard, can see if there's anything suspicious, 
can even charge you if there's evidence of larceny and whatever. I am told that in 118 years, no police never search any yard or raid any yard. So why are we assuming the next 100 years they'll do it? But the law was always giving police the, the ability to enter, to search, to inspect, if, uh, once you have reasonable suspicion and so on, to look at the contents of books. I'm not reading from the 2022 bill. I'm reading from the 1904 ordinance. They had the power Permit a constable to inspect the book, metal, stores, answer all questions with reference to the records, the metal, the stores, or the entries, or the contents of a book. But that's the same thing we're coming with today. From 1904. What is the big deal? What is the difference there? It is the question of enforcing the law. Enforcing the law. In this country, we have seen over the last 20 or 30 years, for example, there was a time when nobody in this country thought we could ever wear a seatbelt in a car. There's a time when people who enjoy smoking and so on felt that they had a divine right to smoke in a room, in a restaurant, you know, inside. There was a time when people felt they could consume liquor and intoxicating substance and drive up and bow the place. That stopped. We had legal intervention, penalties and so on. All you had to do was introduced penalties for stealing these copper wires and government installations, harsh penalties, get law enforcement to enforce the law, patrol and so on, and business fix. The industry could continue. They came today with an amendment, with a bill. Madam Speaker, I am, I am informed by the relevant association that if this scrap metal bill in its current form is passed, 90% of this industry will be shut down. 90%. My colleagues have already spoken about that critical issue of dwelling house and scrapyard. In, in, in communities, people conduct their, their business, they have their scrapyard in front of their dwelling house. So when you go in, you conduct all your business in the front, and then you go back in the, in the back and you, you live. Your house is there. In the same way when people have a gravel pit, for example, in the construction sector, some people have their house behind a gravel pit. They have the gravel, sand, and maybe one or two other um, materials and so on. And when they finish work, they just um, lock their gates and they, they go down in the back in the house. It is one property. You cannot, in this time, you cannot be telling people what happens to the scrapyard in my constituency, where a gentleman would have land in front of his house, significant amount of land, and he conducts his scrapyard business there, and in the back he has his dwelling house. He has to close down, fire the 25 people who are working for him, 25 male, presumably, who are head of household, have children, have their, their family to maintain. What happens to them? That is just one example, and I'm sure we can find a hundred of that in Trinidad and Tobago. So that dwelling house matter is a serious matter. I will just run through the bill now to pick out some other issues because my time normally flies faster than others, I feel. Madam Speaker, there was an amendment today. There was an amendment today. The, the Attorney General came, and notwithstanding the boasts about they brought this in good time, record time, three months and worked so hard, I think on his legs, he proposed about seven amendments. We had to quickly scribble down when the Attorney General was speaking, all of us had to quickly ask around for a lead pencil to write quick, what is he saying? What is he proposing? And I think he has introduced SRP now as authorized officers and so on. We had a serious issue with this scrap metal inspector. Who would be a scrap metal inspector? What is, and that issue remains, what are the qualifications of a scrap metal inspector? We know what is an environmental management inspector. We know a police inspector. We know a public health inspector. What is the qualification of the scrap metal inspector? To watch what? Old fridge, stove, old fan, bed spring. Well, what is the qualification? Are they from the industry? Are they from police? What are they? There was nothing spelled out. And today, by bringing an amendment as they did, they created the next problem. They said, listen, this is not just public service because there's a difficulty making people public officers in this way. So they realize that, and there's a bureaucracy. They say, okay, this could be contract officers now. So you're going to advertise in the newspapers for 20 scrap iron um, inspectors, scrap metal inspectors, as the case may be. 
What are their qualifications? Who are they? And this is not spelt out in the bill. And that's a serious enough matter, Madam Speaker. I move on again. Um, and I'm deliberately skipping over some things because I think my colleagues dealt admirably with many of the issues. Uh, licensing, this is an interesting point. Madam Speaker, I have in my possession, which I will not exhibit because I did not seek or obtain your leave to exhibit, so I will hold in my hand and exhibit to myself. I have in my hand what is called an old metal and marine stores dealer's license. It's here. Now, this system that obtains currently is a decentralized system, Mr. Attorney General. It is decentralized. It is done by the person or the business, generally a business, applying to what is called the license committee in a county. Initially, I'm told magistrates would give these um, things solely, but now apparently it is the committee. So the same committee that gives the liquor license, that gives some other types of license in the county and so on, gives you the scrap iron. And I have two in my hands right now. A simple document, but it is decentralized by county. So this put official receipt, district, the name of the business, you have paid $200, uh, your address is that, the, the license expires, that, and so on. Now, in a decentralized environment, you can get this relatively quick. Now, they are centralizing everything. This bill creates a minister of scrap iron. Now, all of them qualify. All of them qualify. But this is creating a minister of scrap iron. The only work the minister of trade have to do is scrap iron. I don't know if the minister is aware of that when she spoke. She is now the minister of scrap iron. Madam Speaker, and I will tell you how. So before, every district gives their license. The, the person goes in his district, he finds the license committee, he apply, he got his license. Now, everyone applied to the minister. The minister, and we had a problem with that, I think a colleague spoke about that earlier. Why are you centralizing the minister and giving a minister, a politician, the sole authority to approve license, revoke license, suspend license, vary license, a minister, a politician. So tomorrow, a minister decide, the prime minister whisper to him, he say, hello, you see this fellow who talking so much in the newspaper and attacking the government and so on, and the son he apply for a license to, um, you know, to operate a, a scrap iron dealership. Deal with him for me. And that's how it's done. That is what they will do. They were running down the former commissioner for firearm. They will run down people here for scrap iron dealer license. And if you have friends and in your party and so on, and everybody wants to get a dealer's license, you see, you call the minister, minister, entertain this for me. Look my list. As how they were texting people to give them firearm. They will now text people to say, scrap iron dealer license. We want this for this one, for that one, for the other one. That is what they will do. So you cannot take powers like this and give unilaterally to a minister and then do as the member for Lopino says, so well, if you're bothered, go to court. Madam Speaker, in this country, 1.2 million more or less people here. You know, everyone will be in court one day because the government approach is I will do anything I want and you go to court. That is the approach. So I have the two licenses in my hand. Now, what happens now when you have 130 dealers who go into the minister and applying to the minister for license? The minister has to deal with that. Now, let's say theoretically the minister has to deal with it in a transparent ma manner, with fairness and, and according to law and so on, and principles of law. Madam Speaker, they also introduce a dealer's, a collector's license. To my knowledge, there is no such license existing today, Shogunas West, called a collector's license. Collector is the man or the boys or whoever driving around in the pickup and giving the statement that Mr. Um, Point Pierre told you about earlier. Old battery and something buying or something. You could never understand that between these people asking for that and people selling fish, you can't understand nothing. You can't understand nothing. So they come around the neighborhood, that is a collector. 12,000 collectors have to apply to the minister to get a license. So the minister sitting down in her office all day and night dealing with 12,000 people with pickup van and panel van and whatever. They want a collector's license. And the dealer, he himself may have to get a collector's license too because you could, have, you could have both. Every vehicle operated must have a sticker on the van 
well, I said a van because generally it would be a van or a truck. You have to have the license displayed that you are a collector approved and so on. That's, that could be thousands of licenses. The association made a recommendation. I wish the government would take the recommendation. Now that you are centralizing this process, as opposed to this decentralized process, why don't you look at giving a license for three years? So you do not choke the system by this, the thousands and thousands of application for collectors, for dealers, for everybody. Three years. Not bad. I thought that recommendation was a solid recommendation, Madam Speaker. So you have now the issue of license. The minister has the power, and I said that in, other, in the Ministry of Energy, I believe there are some processes where a minister will approve a license or approve something, but there's a committee that deals with it, that makes the recommendation. Surely in this sector, you can introduce a committee made up of representatives of the EMA, of the OSHA, of tongue and country planning, of the relevant association. Call that a committee that receives um, applications, look at it, study it of course, and make recommendations to a minister. So just like in energy and in environment and so on, the minister will sign off, but based upon a recommendation of a committee, not the sole power of the minister. And this is troubling because they are going to create the minister of scrap iron to do this, Madam Speaker. And in one year, thousands of license to last for one year and three months before the year ends, you have to go and um, reapply again. A businessman's entire life is to apply for license. Renewal. Member and, for Oropuch East, eh? according to the clock that is well within your vision, you have four minutes of ordinary time left. <sighs> You're entitled to 15 more minutes. I accept the kind time. offer, ma'am. You may proceed. Thank you. <coughs> you see, um, let me skip a few things and move. So the, the first issue there I raised was the minister's overreach and power. And Madam Speaker, linked to that is to a section 12, which is a next abnormal section. It says where you are aggrieved at what the minister has done, you, you disagree with his decision and so on. Here, here this... You, if you, are, you disagree with the minister, Madam Speaker, you can uh, apply as an appeal process of some kind. You go, but here who you go to? Um, I'm at 12.7. The applicant or license would inform the minister that he wishes to make oral representation. The minister shall give him the op opportunity of appearing before and being heard by a person appointed by the minister. Could you imagine? So here it is, the minister makes a decision. You say, I'm aggrieved with this. I have been treated badly. I've been discriminated against. Um, I want to appeal. The minister say, okay, appeal by this person who I'm appointing. That could be the minister's driver. And knowing this government, it may well be. The minister driver, the minister personal assistant. That could be anybody in the ministry. The minister of finance has been re a regular visitor to the court on matters pertaining to conduct of business in relation to public officers. That is a fact. And uh, Madam Speaker, this is objectionable and it is indecent to have an appeal system where you appeal to a person appointed by the minister. That is indecent. There must be another process in the ministry where you appeal to some semi-independent, impartial person or body that you can speak to if you are um, dissatisfied. Now, the, the Minister of Energy told us earlier, he said, listen, we have to cut this thing down by 6 o'clock because in the night is when all this bad thing happened, criminality. Do you know in this bill, again, I, am, I stand corrected by the Attorney General or anybody, it says that you, you cannot conduct the business of scrap iron dealing and so on after 6. But you know the bill doesn't say that you cannot transport scrap iron after 6. So here you are, you can collect scrap iron by somebody, I imagine, even if it is illegal, transport it in the night and go the next morning bright and early, 8 o'clock, and conduct business. The bill does not say that you cannot transport. It says you cannot conduct the business of dealing, of transacting, but you can transport. And this is the problem they point out that they wish to deal with because the society they believe is unpoliced. Madam Speaker, it, we speak about mobile collectors and so on, and I think that is the normal 
the um, scrap iron and scrap metal collectors that we were talking about. Scrap iron, scrap dealers, right. There are several issues I wish to raise that the minister can, can you know, reflect on, and it has to do, for example, with weekends and holiday. Can this, in this bill before us, can you conduct the business of scrap metal trade transactions on, a, on the weekends or on public holidays when you often load? Madam Speaker, I know the time um, limited. My colleague before raised the issue of, of, of how do you deal with people who are under the influence of liquor and so on? How do you think, uh, deal with that? I won't touch that. Um, you retain scrap metal for days. That has a troubling part of it as well, but it was there before, some parts of it. Um, the, yeah. Madam Speaker, and I give a perfect example, you know. Unlike some of my friends opposite, I don't have the benefit of, of changing vehicles every two days. Uh, well, every two years, sorry. So just today, I bought a brand new battery for an old vehicle that I currently use. That old, that vehicle, the old battery, I'm told, is in my vehicle outside the parliament now. Now, what do I do with this? I have to call someone to pick this up. There's a reality I have to do. But they cannot pick it up now because the industry closed down. When it opens back, I have to get proof that I own this battery for five years, I think. I have to get, then they have to take all the records from me, my passport and my ID card and so on, verify. I have to verify ownership of this. And then the person collecting it by my gate, Madam Speaker, need to put down on paper my date of birth, my gender, my race, my eye color, my hair color, the tattoo I currently have, my address, telephone number. Madam Speaker, what is this? What madness is this? Suppose we know, we know of people, Madam Speaker, not only, well, I'm, I'm not speaking on members of parliament, but some people could have a, a brand new head of hair today and tomorrow the bald head. And it could be vice versa. Some people these days have pink, blue, green hair. You have to write down all of that as a change. I, I make this point to tell you how foolish some of these provisions are. The other issue, the, the association made a recommendation that since you are dealing with money laundering and we have a genuine interest in clamping down on illegal activities, why did you not put in some type of provision that cash payments should be $1,000 or less and over $1,000 you do by checks or by credit card purchases and so on so you can easily keep a track, you can follow, you can do proper auditing and so on of the businesses. That was left out completely from the legislation, uh, Madam Speaker. The export issue, of course, is a big issue. Now, if, how do you deal with the export of scrap metal? You will have persons, for example, with an export license. They may not be citizen or even resident of Trinidad and Tobago. They conduct that business. I assume that can continue. But Madam Speaker, there's a phenomenal part of this bill, and I won't have time in detail, where when you are packing a container, for example, to pack a container with scrap iron, you need to inform the minister seven days before in writing. I am told that you can have as much as a thousand containers leaving Trinidad and Tobago every month. That is a thousand letters the minister has to receive. Now it will be much less because one dealer will have more than one and so on. But hundreds of letters. Letters must go to the commissioner of police. The minister have to be aware of every um, container they're packing. Madam Speaker, in the container, they need to identify if it is an old bed spring, if it is a fridge, a stove part, the serial number of everything. Take a picture of the old iron that you iron your shirt with. You have to identify this government doesn't know what they're doing. So, <laughs> the police now, the police who don't have time to, re to respond to a murder or a, a larceny in the middle of the day have to go to watch them packing container in the day, not in the night, because you can't conduct this business in the night. So whole day, the police had to go to watch people pack in container. That is what they're given the role of the police as. Madam Speaker, the police are up to their neck. Customs, would you believe customs are saying that they're operating at 30% of their manpower requirements? You are giving customs more work. You are giving police more work at a time like this, when police should be dealing with the serious criminal offenses. Because you believe that there's something illegal here. But you, you can find another method of doing that. 
another method because it says you have to write the commission of police. This is, this is the, the sort of issues that we raise. And Madam Speaker, you have to certify that it is, it is fit for shipping. What is fit? I'm looking at um, 24, five, that was an issue raised. What is meant by fit for shipping certificate? We have not heard of this. Who has to certify that? And what's the basis of certifying that? Then you have inspection of premises and so on. And today, there's another ad hoc knee jerk amendment that they flung out today has to do with who inspect. First, the inspection was for the, um, what is called the authorized uh, officials. Now we are here and SRPs are also in a way inspectors who have to go and inspect scrap metal sites and so on. This is very cumbersome. It is unworkable. I mean, they can try it if they want, and they will get a chance to try it, try it, I'm sure. But, Madam Speaker, a lot of matters in this bill are just excessively bureaucratic. They, they sound good when you read it, that you put in place systems for A, B, C, and D. But in reality, it is not workable. Many of these provisions are not workable. And I am very concerned that the Scrap Metal Bill 2022 will suffer the same fate as the procurement legislation. Where every three months we come back to amend, every six months we get an update that they're still putting in place scrap iron inspector, they're still putting in place registrar for revoking and um, granting license and so on. I am concerned with that, Madam Speaker. They indicated, of course, scrap iron inspectors are now contract officers, Madam Speaker, so they can, they can fast forward that. Uh, Madam Speaker, there's a part here, scrap metal inspectors, duties of scrap metal inspector without saying the qualifications for scrap metal inspector. Certify scrap metal for export. How do you certify scrap metal for export? What is the criteria for that? It, it clean? It, what, what? It painted? It, it, de discon what? It, it disfigured? How do you do that? There's no identification of what that means. You have a tag, you have to tab tag scrap metal. Who is tagging scrap metal? And what is the tag? Is it a barcode for every piece of iron that you put in a container? What are you tagging? Tagging. You are tagging scrap iron. So these inspectors are now tagging scrap iron. They give directives to the operator of any motor vehicle, goods and service and so on. What directives do they have the power to give, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, it was um, related to me that in this modern day and age, Modern day and age, we're talking about modernity. We're talking about up-to-date um, you know, legislation. Why don't you insist or put in law or devise some regime that where the exporters are packing containers and stuffing containers, as they use the term, you don't have it under CCTV coverage, as they do in banks, as they do in other financial um, uh, business places and so on. Many people, even at your home, you have CCTV camera. Why could you not put in a regime where exporters, which is only about 10 we are told and so on, would have a bay and a, and a bay where they, they only at that place you can load containers and so on, and you put it under CCT coverage and you keep the coverage for 60 days or 100 days as the case may be so that an authorized officer can come and demand to look at your CCTV camera and your recording and so on in the event that there's anything suspicious. Why can't you think of that? We're in 2022. But no, one minute past six, you cut off all the um, work in this sector, Madam Speaker, because it's getting dark. Madam, um, Madam Speaker, there are also issues that were raised with us concerning the fines. Fines have moved from $15,000 to $250,000 in one shot. Two years jail, three years jail, Madam Speaker. Then the member for Point Appear dealt with the matter already. They are giving under clause 33 one the permanent secretary in a ministry who is an accounting officer. They are giving the permanent secretary, they are giving his or her some judicial function. I am not sure you can give a permanent secretary, an accounting officer, a judicial function to determine whether people um, should not face criminal proceedings. Uh, let me read it so we'll be clear. Where the permanent secretary has reasonable cause to believe that a person has committed a prescribed summary offense. How the permanent secretary coming up with that now? 
How the permanent secretary come about? The PS may issue to that person a notice offering the person the opportunity to dispense with any liability to conviction in respect of the offense by payment of a fine. Could you imagine that? A permanent secretary can change in a ministry with one milliliter of ink. You know that? A permanent secretary could change overnight. And the permanent secretary has a judicial power to determine whether a person committed a prescribed summary offense. Who is that, a magistrate? A judge? This is unheard of. I mean, not even this attorney general we expected to do this. And our expectation of him was very low, Madam Speaker. So I, I don't know if the per they will tell us there's a new breed of permanent secretary operating like judge and magistrate now. The offenses, well, I spoke to that already. Madam Speaker, um, I, I, I would have about two or three minutes, I suspect. Um, there are other matters we can raise, but I will just indicate that um, I've dealt with the money laundering issue, the infrastructure. Um, Madam Speaker, this matter of the collectors, I just want to end by reflecting on that. Collectors can be thousands of persons. You are now saying that collectors of scrap metal, scrap iron, must keep it for a prescribed period. Whereas today, someone can move around in a community, pick up the scrap, go to a yard, and dump it out and get their money because that's what they're doing. I am told in this sector, there are single mothers who to send their children to school to buy food. They collect scrap in a village, in a community, in a street, and they go to the scrapyard and sell it and earn, earn a few hundred dollars to buy food. Now you are telling them, first to begin, they need a license to do that, huh? a collector's license. Secondly, you are saying that they must keep it for 10 days as the prescribed um, period. Where are they keeping that? In their basement? Where are they keeping it on the roof? Not everybody would have space. When you are living in clustered areas, you know, HDC apartment buildings in some areas, you also are involved in collecting scrap. You can't put it in your HDC apartment and keep it. You go immediately to the yard. So that has, you have to reflect on that as well. That creates another problem. So Madam Speaker, the criminality issue is a real issue. This is a country where when you drive around, you see cable hanging from the sky all over the place because we, the, the society is unpoliced. And that is why people have been able to do that. There has been a demand for it, of course. There's a demand for it. But to solve that problem, you don't create another myriad of problems by just, just tampering with something that has so far been working. You could have dealt with the criminality matters alone rather than trying to destroy the way of living of thousands and thousands of people while a small minority of people are involved in theft, in larceny, in um, raiding government offices to get scrap iron, in stealing and so on. That is always the minority. It is not the majority. So we ought not to, to destroy an entire industry by trying to fashion legislation like this without thinking of the dynamics and the environment of that particular industry that we operate in. And this is the message that we leave because I am sure the, the, we can find another method of dealing with this, this problem of criminality in that sector. And yes, we admit increasing fines and so on will help. It will help in the circumstances, but you cannot look at that in isolation from the bigger and broader picture of the social and economic distress to communities, to families, to households. At it, as it is now, we have no interest in, I want to make the point very clear, we are not interested in delaying unduly the passage of legislation that will open up this sector. We are not interested in that. We don't want to do this. We are making recommendations to the Attorney General to reflect on some of the issues raised, whether it's dwelling house, role of permanent secretary, collector's license, one year, we believe it's three years or so. We are helping you. Today, the opposition is helping you to make better law. That's what we are doing. We are not here demanding that you stop and pelt away and start over and so on. You played wrong. It's like draft. You know, you, you take long to play and when you play, you play bad. So you play bad and we bring the, the, the recommendation. So we wanted the Attorney General to see us today in this light as making recommendations to improve the bill that is before us and not to lead to detrimental consequences for persons in the industry. Madam Speaker, I thank you.
Member for Love and Till West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I joined this very important debate speaking on behalf of the vast majority of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, the vast majority of the 1.4 million of us, many of whom, as a result of the activity that brought us to this pass, suffered silently for months, perhaps for years, Madam Speaker, the last speaker spoke about 20,000 persons who make a living, according to him, eke out a living in this industry. And the government has made it clear we are conscious of that proposition and that we are taking this action in the protection of all. But I speak today for the many citizens in larger number than 20,000 who would have been afflicted by the events that brought us here. The member for Oropuj East. In my view, Madam Speaker, in rather a comedian a posture, trivialized the very serious business that brought the Attorney General to this house with these proposals. He won the laughter and the death beating and the admiration of his other very, very joyous friends on the other side. But the government maintains that these are serious matters. The member comedian this way through, in my view, the question of criminalizing, collection, and all of the measures the Attorney General addressed in these bills. But I want to say to the member and his laughing friends on the other side, that when we criminalized and made it an offense not to wear a mask during the heights of the COVID challenge to the human family across the globe, we saved lives. I want to make it clear to my friends on the other side, laughing, giggling, as they have been all afternoon, particularly for the last 30 or so minutes. When we criminalized drunk driving, we saved lives in this country, continue to save lives. When we criminalized driving wantonly without seat belts, we saved lives. And the criminality that we are dealing with here now was criminality that affected national security interests in Trinidad and Tobago. The government responded as a sensible, serious, people caring government should. We intervened and put an abrupt break on this situation. My friends on my side, would have highlighted countless examples of the circumstances that were in the public domain. Madam Speaker, the member for Oropuch East spoke about a thousand containers a month. I want to say to the member that the police of whom he spoke with an interest in it because they would have received hundreds of reports from citizens, state enterprises, TWASA, TNTEC, TSTT, a church with a bell and others. We searched a handful. If he's talking about a thousand, I will describe those search so far as a handful and found container full with copper. Madam Speaker, and other issues, other items, which I'll come to with greater focus in a very short while, in just a few of them, in a matter of days. So you can imagine if the government did not intervene with those thousands of which the member for Orpuch East spoke, 
what would have happened to this space, Trinidad and Tobago? And the police, their duty, according to him, is to watch containers. Well, that is part of the police duty. Whenever there's corruption and theft and thievery, particularly challenging the national security interests of a country, the police should be involved. Because this affected critical infrastructure, radio stations with their broadcasting equipment suffered loss, stations shut down. You speak to the thousands of people who couldn't get access on their internet bands. Those who couldn't get telephone communications, cell phone communications to their children who would have left since morning to go to school. Your wife, wives, husbands who have gone to their respective workplaces. All of that is what we were talking about. But the member for Oropuchi is here today enjoying the support of his laughing friends sought to trivialize these critical issues. Well, the government is here to criminalize that. The member made passing and comedian reference, in my view, to the question of keeping the material that you collect for 15 days. Madam Speaker, we are putting a system of inspections in place because there was grand theft in all of this. And the 15 days in section 19.1 is simply to allow the inspectors or those who have a concern and those who would have suffered loss an opportunity to see what was collected so that it would not be reconfigured, cut up, changed up, so that it becomes unrecognizable and lost forever in the mirth, UNC style. The member spoke about CCTV cameras, but the member belittling the issue. You think CCTV cameras could stop a state valuator from overvaluing a piece of land from $52 million to $126 million to benefit someone? CCTV can't handle that. Different types of crime requires different types of policing. And this business here requires inspections, checking, logging, keeping records. That is what the Attorney General came to treat with today. And one could easily be mistaken and thought and think or to think that the member's contribution was designed to stimulate and energize those who have other views. Because bad habits and bad company likes friends, all fruits of the same poison tree. But the government is responding to it. We too had several meetings with the scrap iron dealers and the representatives of that, and we told them candidly, and they agreed that this should be regulated, and we told them what would come. And they went away with a complete understanding, and their leader told the country the next day he was happy with the, con the, 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 con the discussions that we had and the way the government had signaled it would be going. The leader of this and the spokesperson said that he was happy about it. Today, the member for Oropuch East has a problem with our communication with them. And we didn't show them a bill. And the member talks about policing well as Minister of National Security. I would like to see improved and more effective policing 24 hours a day in Trinidad and Tobago because we are having a crime problem across the board. Crime and corruption. And that is why a priority for national security is to provide the training and the resources to further professionalize and to instigate the development of the policing techniques using the scientific method where necessary. 
so that the police service could do more. I have the feeling if the police service developed the, the ability and the capacity to do more, a lot of people who shouting loudly in this country would have been shouting from another place. Where they should be. So I support the idea that we should increase the numbers of police and increase the capacity of the police to conduct its work in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, the member criticized the fact that we were bringing SRPs and estate constable supplemental police officer into the, into the platform of authorized persons. He criticized that on the one hand and then tells us on the other hand that we should have increased and improved policing. You see how comedian this thing could be, Madam Speaker? They so look for reasons to make bacchanal and confusion and to obstruct. Madam Speaker, they contradict themselves in the same sentence. On the one hand, criticizing the fact that we are asking the police and estate police to be part of the authorized officers who could check these out on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago to protect the national security interests of Trinidad and Tobago. And on the other hand tells us we should have improved policing. Well, I really do think so, especially white color police white collar criminals should be pursued. And yes, we have brought supplemental police into this to increase the number of persons, particularly considering that it will take some time to get inspectors more generally on the job. And the idea is to get the industry going as promptly as possible, which the government promised and said we would bring the necessary measures before the end of the year, and we are here today before the end of the year. And for that, the leader of the scrap iron industry indicated as well very publicly that he was happy about that. The only unhappy soul is the member for Oropuchis. Madam Speaker, the member criticized the question of licensing this regime. Criticized that and described the, uh, the power given under this act to a minister of government, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, as ministerial overreach. You hear fine, fancy folly? Ministerial overreach. But I just want to remind the member of two things. The relevant minister grants licenses under the Customs Act. The relevant minister grants licenses under the tour, in the tourism industry. The relevant minister grants licenses in banking, financial sector, insurance companies. The relevant minister grants license in the energy and energy industries in that sector, in national security, in health, in trade and industry in many, many aspects of the economy and the governance of this country, ministers since independence have been granted licenses. And interestingly enough, between 95 and 2001, and between 2010 to 2015, plus three months, when the UNC was in power, ministers had the very power to do that, all of that. And then, whispered along the way that some of them texting a former commissioner for, to, to give grant firearm license to people. Shameful. Well, I just want to say in passing that the last commissioner of police needed no help to do all that was done. But that is another matter. Needed no help. And then says that the license should be for three years. Well, Madam Speaker, the government considers all things taken into account that one year is adequate. In fact, in the existing law, the old Metal and Marine Stores Act, Section 4.3, 
the, the license is also for one year. And in, in respect of an appeal, the ultimate appeal is to the courts. The ultimate appeal is to the court, and of course, in these measures, there's a duty to give reasons by the minister while she would have revoked or varied or granted a, 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 a license. Let me just move on from the member for Oropuch East. That was comic relief in my view, and I would say no more on that. The member for Pointe Pedo tells us that he does not believe, the UNC does not believe that this legislation is workable. The Attorney General told us though, that this is an industry that was about $82 million in expanse and in worth in 2009, and by 2021 it was $285 million, a 248% increase. This is not small business, this is big business. There are many businesses that never get past $5 million for the year. It's big, big business. And it is international in scope. Madam Speaker, a lot of the copper, a lot of the metals that people lost, and you heard many, many myriad examples of it here today, found its way to a country far away from Trinidad and Tobago. That's why I, as Minister of National Security, understanding the things I do, describe it as a well-oiled transnational operation. And you have a situation where the Minister of Works, and you heard it earlier, reported that they, 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 they demolished a building. All of the steel was there, a whole building. Somehow or the other, the thieves got a hold of it. And it, it can involve complicity on the part of state officials, people paid by the state, sworn by the state to protect the state. But the bottom line is, the thieves got their hand on the whole building. Fortunately, the ministry got word and the police got things and they were able to recover it and take possession of it. But that's just one example. We would have purchased those material from somewhere outside, third world as we are, and there we don't want to always be, at great expense. And then we steal it, those little people who eking out a living, used by the big bosses in this international operation, steal it, without understanding the implications, economic, national security, communications, and otherwise. And it gets shipped abroad back to the same people who sold us, and then they reproduce the thing, and then sell it back to you little third world country at even higher US dollar prices, and so the impoverishment and the third world status continues and the big ones get richer, and the little ones stay poorer. This big billion bucks, and if you ask the little people that they pretend to be speaking on behalf of here today, they will tell you they get $250, $300 a day. They don't know that this is worth $285 million. They are just the little pawns, many of them. And the big ones who get the wealth and the bulk of it, they're making the big millions. The little ones see no part of that. A couple days ago, I was reading about a brand of chocolate, can't call the name from this platform manufactured in a country that you will never see a cocoa plant growing. But for 500 years, they mastered the art of getting cocoa from other places, tropical countries, and the cocoa is sent to them, and then they add value to it in the economic process, and package it in wonderful packages, and sell it right back to you. 
I stand on standing order 48-1, please. Okay, so, member, please proceed. I'll give you some leeway. Warmly, Madam Speaker, and that's just my example of the way this thing worked for the benefit of the public of Trinidad and Tobago. And Madam Speaker, this government, recognizing this, decided that we must do something about it. The member for Oropuchi is just in passing again, you know, speaking to his unwitting voter base, perhaps. He said that this government crushed the economy. When, when only recently, when only recently, when only recently, the Minister of Energy and the Prime Minister were able to tell us that by renegotiating our oil arrangement, our gas arrangements, we were able to win $11 billion for this country. Madam Speaker, Standing order 48 to 1, please. Remember, continue. Where we reduced the deficit from 7 and 8 and 9 billion dollars to 2.4 billion dollars in the last budgetary outing. Where we now boast of having six months reserve cover as opposed to the three months that is the world standard. This has nothing to do with the scrap iron the bill we're discussing today. Please continue. Thank you. And where we have kept 140,000 public sector workers on the payroll. And the member simply tells us that the economy crashed. Madam Speaker, let me get into some elements of the bill and dismiss that as folly. Comedian folly as usual. Madam Speaker, Section 34 deals with offenses created by this law, this proposed law. Section 34.1 says a person who knowingly gives false or misleading information on an application for a license under this act commits an offense. In other words, the information you give about yourself or the company must be bona fide. It must be real. And the member for Lopino Bonia told us about the prospects for money laundering. And the AG told us that too. So it is in this context, because you see, money launderers use casino gambling and they use industries like this because it's a cash business to launder money for all kinds of purposes. And therefore, the information that you provide to get a license to participate in this should be bona fide. Good law, good measure, and I salute the Attorney General for this. Madam Speaker, 34.2 says, a person who carries on the business of a scrap metal collector without a license, or who having been granted a collector's license failed to notify the minister of any alteration in the particulars would also have committed an offense. Similarly, a person who carries on business as a scrap metal dealer without a license or who operates a scrap metal site not specified in his license. So you can't go and hide and carry on no behind the scene operation. You have to declare. You have to, if you want the protection of the law, you have to come with clean hands. Bona fides. According to my Rasta brethren, bonified. <laughs> Rastafari. <laughs> bonified. Madam Speaker, similarly, <laughs> similarly, Madam Speaker, a person commits an offense if a, li a licensed scrap iron metal collector who fails to display his license in a motor vehicle or goods vehicle used in his business as a scrap metal collector commits an offense as well. 
I know of a case where somebody hide the logo on the vehicle. Why would a contractor building a house for a minister of government block off the logo on the vehicle because they have something to hide? And this calls for transparency and openness. Whether you're building in Philippines or you're building in Diego Martin, transparency is what this is all about. Declare it all. If you want the protection of the law, come with clean hands and the law will protect you. So for those legitimate, honest, decent, hardworking elements of the scrap iron industry, they would be happy about this. Because I heard the leader of that industry say there were a few criminals who made it bad for all of them. So while the member for Oropuch East and my friends on the other side pretend that the, the scrap iron dealers, the honest and bona fide ones, have a problem with this, they are quite happy about it. Because it separates the sheep from the goat, just like justice and righteousness separates the PNM from the UNC. We are not like them. We are different. And that's why I told them at the beginning of this sitting, and you chastised me almost for it, Madam Speaker, I, 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 when you asked me to talk. And what I was saying on the other side is that it is good. Madam Speaker, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, so we won't go down that road. I'm obliged. Thank you. And I stand to remind you, you have four more minutes oh, I'm of original I'm obliged. time. Yeah. You're entitled to 15 more minutes if you so wish to continue. I thank you and I should accept it, Madam Speaker. But I was really saying to one of my friends, my friends on the other side, it is good to be able to go comfortably to bed when the night comes without worrying that the police would be knocking on one's door. Madam Speaker, a licensee who fails to verify the identity of a person from whom he purchases or receives scrap metal commits an offense. Because if you're found with it, you need to be able to say where you got it. If you're found with a bell, you need to be able to say where you got the bell when you are asked. That's easy. Children know if you come home with a sharp or a pencil, at least some children, you have to be able to give your mother and your father explanation for that. Transparency and openness. It is so simple, so honest, so clean, so dignified. You mean my friends on the other side have a problem with that? Subsection 11, 3411, a licensee who fails to keep the proper records as prescribed under this act commits an offense as well. And so the offenses continue. And there are several others. And I urge those in the industry, once this law is passed, to make sure and keep close to you copies of it so you will know what the score is. Madam Speaker, as I indicated earlier, the authorized officer category of persons would now include a constable appointed under the Supplemental Police Act, the Estate Police, so to speak. And just to remind my friends, I have a private, we have a private security bill on the order paper for discussion shortly to bring the supplemental police into the policing element to support the state's effort in law enforcement in Trinidad and Tobago for the most part. And I expect my friends to support that. Madam Speaker, the bill contains 10 parts, as we all know, and it requires, fortunately, a simple majority. And that is designed in this way to avert, to avoid UNC obstructionism in this parliament. Because we know in advance, they seek to make populist noises and bacchanal every time anything comes here. 
especially if it requires their support. We know, so I particularly like and commend the Attorney General for the way in which he structured this to make it UNC proof. And I have found, and I have found that every time we bring measures to criminalize bad behavior in Trinidad and Tobago that is hurting even the national security interests, even their own constituents, we have to consider the criminals and we also have to consider the opposition inside of this parliament because we have to win their support. So when we're trying to get at the criminals, the UNC gets in the way. Madam Speaker, a deal, as has been described in this law, includes buy, receive, or otherwise acquire, transfer, store, export, and sell or otherwise dispose of scrap metal in the way of trade or business, whether by barter, pledge, or otherwise, whether as principal or agent. But, and this is very important, does not include a transaction relating to scrap metal, which by reason of the circumstances thereof, the parties thereto, or the nature or quantity of the scrap metal involved therein, is an isolated transaction inconsistent with any form of dealing in scrap metal in the way of trade or business. Madam Speaker, I read that and I emphasized as I did because my friend from Oropuch East, comedian and comedienne as he was, did not understand because he asked, you know, rather glibly, and laughingly, jokingly, he asked whether the local government garbage collectors who pick up some metal would be exposed to punishment under this law. The answer obviously is no. The Attorney General was very careful to carve out and to say in clause two, in respect of the definition for deal, it does not include such transactions. It is so simple, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Clause 4, I was very impressed with it because I heard the member also say that this government is against scrap iron and we want to shut down the industry. No, Clause 4, one says, a person or entity, entity who is 18 years of age or older, is a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, is a permanent resident of Trinidad and Tobago, because we are aware that there are persons, foreigners who have set up camp in Trinidad and Tobago to facilitate this trade. They buy and receive and collect scrap iron in Trinidad to send to their principals outside. We know that. So we say you must be 18 years or older, a citizen, a permanent resident, or is a citizen of a CARICOM member state other than Trinidad and Tobago, or is a company, firm, partnership, or cooperative society may apply for a license. In my view, Madam Speaker, those four conditions, or five, yeah, four, are very liberal, very easy, and the government has put it this way in the law because it understands the need for this industry and gives support to it. A very liberal regime to enter. And clause two, subclause two says, a person who has been convicted of an indictable offense under the Dangerous Drugs Act or the Proceeds of Crime Act shall not be eligible for a license unless the conviction has been expunged. And so it goes. So I just quoted that, Madam Speaker, to demonstrate the way the government approaches it. Madam Speaker, as a result of this, the police got involved based on the reports that became known to it, 
and the police obtained the appropriate warrants, although this is these containers of which you heard, 91 of them are on the ports of Trinidad and Tobago, but the police had an interest in them. So the police went in with their team, and Madam Speaker, so far the police have found one million dollars worth of steel poles identified as belonging to the Ministry of Works and Transport. Electrical cables valued so far of up to 400,000. Tiantech cables, no, these are reports they got, I'm sorry, report of over a million dollars in steel poles. Electrical cables to the tune of 400,000. TNT cables, 300 million in repair, 3 million, sorry, repairs. As you heard the minister say, police arrests went down. Police locked up quite a few people, about 162 people, for dealing with these illegal issues. Everywhere you go, you see wire hanging from the poles. As I told you, this is transnational, big business, and turned out to be a threat to national security. So the police went in, and on the 23rd of November, as recently as that, an investigation being operationalized, led by a woman police assistant commissioner, to enter and search by virtue of the warrants they had. And Madam Speaker, at the port of Port of Spain, they began searching. They searched 13 of these containers, 13. And I want you to know, Madam Speaker, that two onshore three-inch ball valves identified to be the property of British Petroleum Trinidad and Tobago, valued at $17,500 each, was found and seized in one of the containers. These items were processed for evidential purposes whilst inquiries continue. And of course, when these pieces of equipment are stolen from our oil and gas installations, they create serious hazardous risks. But of course, the big ones who benefit from all of this couldn't care less where it came from. Just bring home the loot, bring in the sheaves. On the December the 8th, in one of these containers, a mass, a container load, of copper wires was found and seized, approximately 80% of which have been positively identified to be the property of TSTT, with an approximate value of 1 million Trinidad and Tobago dollars. Again, these items were seized by the TTPS, and inquiries by the TTPS is underway. And at the same time, the Customs and Excise Preventative Unit has also been carrying out certain inquiries in respect of the export of these copper wires, and this is being done under the Customs Act. On the same December the 8th, another container was searched and a mass container load of copper wires was also found and seized, approximately 50% of which has been positively identified so far to be the property of TSTT, with an approximate value of some half a million dollars. Again, they were processed for evidential purposes, and again, the Customs and Excise Preventative Unit is conducting inquiries in accordance with the Customs Act. So, Madam, I just gave you a couple examples of the reality of the circumstances, Madam Speaker, that the government is fully aware of, hence the reason for the intervention by the government. And I am absolutely proud, as I speak on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, that this government acted as responsibly and decisively as we did, got involved, arrested this situation, understanding the value of this industry and its importance to the little people who earn a dollar in it, we promise that in the quickest possible time, we'll return the industry to its legs. And I'm very happy to know 
that the Attorney General and his support at his office worked hard along with the other members of the government, not the least, those of us on the LRC, to have done the work that we have and to have brought these measures to criminalize elements of this industry in accordance with the express wishes of the honest, decent elements of the scrap iron industry who proclaimed happiness about it. And of course, doing so on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of persons who were made to suffer at the hands of the reckless, careless, couldn't care less people who were just out there pulling down important and valuable state assets to export our wealth, to export our communication systems, to export our safety and security for a few dollars more. Madam Speaker, I support these measures. The people of Laventil West support them wholeheartedly and look forward to the support of my other colleagues to bring order and justice and fairness and decency to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move in accordance with Standing Order 15.5 that the House continue to sit until the completion of the matter before it. Honourable Members, the question is that the House continue to sit until the conclusion of the matter before it. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Member for Coover South. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. As I join this debate on the Scrap Metal Bill 2022 and uh, seek to put on the record uh, or try to correct, if I should say, some of the statements that have been made by the previous speaker the Minister of National Security and the member for Laventil West. Because in responding to my colleague, the MP for Pooch East, he attempted to create a narrative that my colleague was being comical in his response. And during his presentation, members of the opposition's bench was laughing and giggling and so on, Madam Speaker. But before I came to assume my position at the podium, there was a circulation of a list of amendments to be moved in the House of Representatives by the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs in response to the very said bill that the Attorney General piloted. And I found this to be comical. I found this to be indeed a comedy in terms of the government's approach to this piece of legislation here this evening. Madam Speaker, it is more or less as if I have a new bill in my hand. The bill seeks to amend, or the extent of the amendments will focus on clause two, clause four, clause five, clause seven, clause 11, clause 15, clause 24, clause 25, clause 27, and delete and, and in substitute a new clause and uh, also 
um, in terms of uh, new schedules, in terms of the first schedule and the second schedule, Madam, Madam Speaker, I do not know if the main stakeholder, which is the Scrap Iron Dealers Association, have had sight of these amendments. And indeed, Madam Speaker, this is the track record, this is the approach of this government. And this is no laughing matter, Madam Speaker. This is a very, very serious matter. And uh, indeed, it shows how the government's approach has been for the last seven years in relation to governance and in relation to legislation in this very said house, Madam Speaker. It is one of thinking, thinking it up as you go along. It is one of operating by VAPs and it reflects, it is a clear cut reflection, Madam Speaker, that this is the most incompetent government in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. And Madam Speaker, I do not know because the Attorney General has been shifting his um, qualifications and so on in recent times. And I do not know if this is contributing to the list of amendments we have seen here this afternoon. Go thinking it up as you go along, as I said. But I want to respond because it is important to put on the record again the Minister of National Security made a number of assumptions and conclusions and, and so on, Madam Speaker, and he indicated that um, the government that he is part of is very serious and committed about saving lives. And when the, the government passed legislation to deal with drunk driving, it played a very critical role in saving lives. If the minister had any shame, if the minister did a sense of introspection and reflection, the minister would be the last to speak about saving lives because it is under, Madam Speaker, it is under the watch of the current Minister of National Security that Trinidad and Tobago has today the un unenviable national record of this year seeing the most amount of our nation's citizens being murdered at the hands of criminals. And I would say the ultimate responsibility lies with the minister and also by extension the National Security Council of Trinidad and Tobago. And minister, the minister also spoke about critical infrastructure was being compromised in terms of internet and telephone communication and so on. All that is good. We in the opposition too would be very concerned in terms of when these things occur in our society in terms of its impact upon the citizens of the country. But again, who is charged with the responsibility? That is the fundamental thing that citizens must take into consideration who is looking on at this particular debate. Because if your apparatus is collapsing at TSTT and WASA and so on, it is the responsibility, this, these are state enterprises, Madam Speaker, and it is the responsibility of the government from a policy point of view to ensure that the national infrastructure and the infrastructure of the state enterprises are not compromised in, from the point of view of national security. And I want to tell the Minister of National Security that the country's national security apparatus collapsed under his watch and that is the state of affairs why these things have occurred, Madam Speaker. And we cannot leave it, uh, we cannot leave it undone here this afternoon. And uh, the minister indicated 
that the, the consultation with the National uh, Scrap Iron Dealers Association was meaningful, Madam Speaker, and it was thorough, and uh, that they were indeed happy about this piece of legislation that is before this House, Madam Speaker. But I want to tell the Minister of National Security, how could they have been happy when they did not see the bill, Madam Speaker? How, how on earth, Madam Speaker, and I see the Minister of National Security is in very animated discussion at this point in time. It shows his uh, um, ability to not listen to the concerns of the stakeholders, which is the responsibility of the opposition in terms of in this parliament here this afternoon. Madam Speaker, it is the hallmark of this government has been one of you cannot trust this government. And this is what has happened to the uh, uh, Scrap Iron Dealers Association. They were all foxed. They were conned by the government. I think you should find another way, member, oh, yes. to, to see what you'd like to see. So withdraw that and find another way. I, I know you are quite capable. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm, I'm guided. But I asked you to withdraw it. Yes. And yes, if you I... wish, you'll find another way. And so I... if you are guided, the first thing you would say is, I withdraw. I... Member, member, I really need no assistance. Thank you so much. And certainly, Madam Speaker, I was in the run-up to indicating that I, I withdraw. And uh, as I said, I'm guided. And uh, the government mantra in the first year of office was always one of let's do this together. And uh, in fact, if my memory serves me right, in their first budget presentation, the word let or the tagline, let's do this together, was mentioned 32 times in the budget presentation. It is now let us do this alone. We are in charge and we don't care hell or high water. It is our way, and we will be disdainful. We will treat the stakeholders in a very contemptuous manner, and we will soldier on. But time is longer than twine, Madam Speaker, and I will just leave it at that, Madam Speaker. And again, Madam Speaker, if you listen to the minister in rebutting my colleague, the MP for Oropuchis, my colleague indicated that the, the government had, had indeed crashed the economy. And the minister went on to boast in his response that the government was indeed was uh, not crashing or did not crash the economy. In fact, if you listen to him, you would think that the economy has been growing. But Madam Speaker, I will challenge any one of them here to get up and tell the national community that indeed over the last seven years we have not seen a collapsing GDP. We have not seen dangerous debt levels. We have not seen falling credit ratings. We have not seen depleted foreign reserves. We have not seen negative foreign direct investment, Madam Speaker. 48-1, please. So, uh, member for Hoover South, I think I've said time and time again, not every tangential thing um, needs developing. So I'm giving you a little leeway, but this is not the subject of the debate. Okay, so quickly make your point and move on. This is not a budget or economy debate. Something was said, something was rebutted. I'm giving you a little leeway, but we're not going in down that road. Okay, please. The bottom line is, Madam Speaker, the government crashed the economy over the last seven years. And uh, I leave it at that, Madam Speaker. The citizens will ultimately judge them. And uh, the minister indicated in his response also that it is uh, the UNC 
it is the UNC that is opposed or not in sync or supportive of this legislation. All my colleagues who have spoken here this afternoon, the MP for Mayaro, the MP for Shagwana's East, the MP for West Surrey, the MP for Point Pier, the MP for Orapuch East have said that indeed the opposition is prepared to support legislation that will seek to re uh, regulate this industry, Madam Speaker. But we also want to ensure that it is a piece of legislation that is properly thought out that the Attorney General will reflect and listen to the recommendations that have been put forward by my colleagues when they made their respective contributions on the floor. And when I look at almost this new bill that has been handed to us via the uh, list of amendments that will be moved during committee stage, indeed, the government continues to treat the recommendations of the opposition with a sense of contempt. They feel that they are in charge, they have the majority, and at the end of the day, they will not listen to the voice of the opposition. And my colleague, the MP for Arapuchis, made it very clear that he met with the Scrap Iron Dealers Association and following his meeting with that association, his contribution and that of my colleagues were in sync with the concerns that were raised with him during this meeting. So at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, it is not the UNC, but the UNC is utilizing the position here today based on our responsibility to voice the concerns of the operators because they do not have a voice within the parliamentary framework of um, the country, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, my colleague also focused in his presentation on the issue of that the industry reminded him of that of Carini 1975 Limited in terms of the labor intensive nature of the industry the way it's structured and so on, and uh, um, how vulnerable those were in terms of the persons who were working in this industry, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, if you look at Clause 21, it requires that a scrap metal dealer and a scrap metal collector maintain and store records, whether in written or electronic form, of his or her scrap metal business. And the records must include the following, detailed personal and contact information of any person or person involved in a, a transaction or transaction, a detailed description of the scrap metal and transaction concerning their purchase and sale, the price of the scrap metal, vehicle registration numbers of vehicles used to deliver scrap metal and signed statements of ownership for scrap metal delivered and daily cash reconciliation checks and any money advancement. Madam Speaker, and I've not heard from any government member in terms of their respective, in their respective contribution what the government is prepared to do to keep the small and medium-sized scrap iron dealers in, in, uh, in businesses or in business, Madam Speaker, because at the end of the day, the association has made it very clear in its present form, 90% of the businesses will be forced to close based on the onerous nature of this legislation and what the small businesses uh, will be called upon to do. And I want to ask the Attorney General in winding up, 
if he and or any members of the government, in fact, the Minister of Trade and Industry came, and during her presentation, I did not hear of the government's commitment to probably engage or focus on whether COSTAT, whether the Small Business Development Company or the National Entrepreneurship Development Company and so on, will focus on training and development of scrap iron dealers from the point of view of focusing their training on dealing with uh, daily cash reconciliation and so on in terms of how or the responsibilities that they will be called upon to focus on their scrap metal records, Madam Speaker. And I hope that in their, their signals that they want the scrap metal industry to survive, that the government may be willing to focus um, their, their whole policy in this particular direction, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, if you look to our clause 24 of the bill, it sounds very nice on paper, where it provides that a scrap metal exporter must be given at least seven days written notice to the minister and the commissioner of police of his intention to load scrap metal and so on for export. Madam Speaker, whilst a colleague of mine touched on this particular point, Madam Speaker, I want to ask the Attorney General whether the government is prepared to look at or why they are asking the Commissioner of Police that a scrap metal exporter must give at least seven days written notice to the Minister and the Commissioner of Police. At this point in time, the Commissioner of Police, in fact, we have acting commissioner, we have acting deputy commissioners of police and so on, Madam Speaker. And we all know the challenges that the Commissioner of Police and the entire police service is being confronted with at this point in time in relation to the extent of crime that is bedev bedeviling our country. But it is important to relieve the office of the commissioner of this burden. Probably some other designated officer, whether superintendent of police or some other senior police within the framework of the police service division, Madam Speaker, and uh, I hope that the government will reflect upon the burden that they are placing additionally on the office of the Commissioner of Police because indeed this will mean probably hundreds of letters, thousands of letters that will go to the office of the Commissioner of Police from an administrative point of view. And indeed, Madam Speaker, we also look at um, a fit for shipping certificate will be issued by the scrap metal inspector upon a successful inspection. At the end of the day, this is another form of bureaucracy. And I feel that given what we have been exposed to in recent times where we heard that the whole application process for a certificate of character, that process collapsed. It was not working in the interest of uh, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker, whether this additional piece of bureaucracy, w will it really be of benefit to the Scrap Iron Dealers Association? Will uh, this additional layer of bureaucracy, will it be properly computerized? Will it be, we continue to hear from the government uh, boasting of its digitization and digitalization trust and the Ministry of Digitization. But we do not have hope based on their track record. We do not hope, we do not have that sense of confidence based on their track record that this will indeed redound to the benefit of all and sundry from the point of view of this particular piece of legislation. And Madam Speaker, 
I now want to move on to the very important issue. Again, it has been touched by a number of speakers in terms of part six, which deals with scrap metal inspectors, Madam Speaker. Clause 27.1 states that the minister may by order designate public officers to be scrap metal inspectors for the purpose of this act. To, in scrap, to inspect sorry, scrap metal sites at reasonable times to ensure compliance with this act or any conditions, restrictions, or requirements subject to which a license is granted. Madam Speaker, and if I heard correctly, during her presentation, the Minister of Trade and Industry indicated that a proper department will be built out. But we did not get from the Minister a proper time frame, Madam Speaker, in terms of when this department will be built out. And we did not hear from the Minister also, given the size of the industry, how many sites or how many scrap metal sites are there existing in this country, Madam Speaker? And uh, how many, and I know that the government may jump up and say that um, we are de not dealing with the operationalization aspect, but I think that we need the scrap iron uh, players, the operators, I think, need some kind of of clarification that the government is serious in terms of its regulation and its approach to give them that necessary confidence that they know of what they speak about in terms of how many sites exist in the country and how many inspectors may be needed that will give them the, the, the necessary comfort or provide the comfort zone that indeed the industry will be regulated in a very decisive and in a very efficient manner. And the minister, in her contribution, that is the Minister of Trade and Industry, in indicated that these persons, these scrap metal inspectors, would enjoy contract positions, or they would be contract officers and so on. And, uh, in his contribution, if I heard him correctly, the, the Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs indica indicated that the officers or the inspectors will be from the complement of SRP officers. It may also entail officers of the um, Environmental Management Agency and also public health inspectors, Madam Speaker. And the question begs itself because we continue to hear about vacant positions within these areas of government offices. We continue to hear of existing vacancies, whether it is from the point of view of SRPs and public officers and so on. And we have not been told how many officers will be needed from the point of view of public officers. And this is why we would ask or seek clarification whether the entities that have been identified, where the pool of public, of scrap metal inspectors will come from, whether their existing organization or institution will be compromised in the context of dealing with members of the public at this point in time. And Madam Speaker, we also were told, and when you look at the duties of a scrap metal inspector, it shall be to examine the scrap metal site facilities and the site equipment to interview the staff working at the scrap metal site. Honorable Member, you have three minutes left of your original speaking time. You're entitled to 15 additional minutes to wind up your contribution, if you so wish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I will avail myself. Um, it may not be the full 15 minutes. But as I said, 
that the duties, as if, if we continue to look at the respective clause, it takes into consideration interviewed the staff working at the scrap metal site to certify scrap metal for export and so on. Madam Speaker, based on what we are, would have heard from members of the government, I do not know if SRP officers, if officers who are currently engaged by the S, uh, Environmental Management Agency and uh, public health inspectors, will they need additional training in this particular area that they will be called upon to fulfill the duties of a scrap metal inspector. And I think that the government needs to clarify this and I hope that the Attorney General in winding up for the benefit of all and sundry will bring clarity to this particular issue because it may be called upon, it may take into consideration the need for an additional duty allowance, uh, Mr. Attorney General. And if indeed, these are public officers. Public officers are represented by recognized majority unions. And I want to ask the government if indeed that they have held discussion with the recognized majority unions that will take into consideration or address the issue of secondment to this department that will now be built out or created and that which will fall under the responsibility of the Minister of Trade and Industry, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, it also points to a, a contradiction because one minute you will hear from the government that the government is committed to eradicating contract officers within the framework of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And in this instance, you would, the, the minister in her presentation indicated that the u, new unit will be built around contract officers. And uh, we are hearing now, or we would have heard that they will come, or the, this unit will take into consideration officers who will come from, on secondment from established institutions within the framework of the public service of Trinidad and Tobago. So again, the issue has to be clarified for the benefit of all and sundry in the context of what we are doing today. Because at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, this piece of legislation the government seems to pride itself. For me, it is a rush piece of legislation because the government is under pressure. The government, in the last seven years, 115,000 persons lost their jobs before the pandemic. And standing uh, order 48.1. Okay, so please continue. I'll give you some. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You see, Madam Speaker, it is important to get this right in the context of the government, as I said, wants to pride itself. The government wants to send a message to the population that it is on the side of the vulnerable. It is on the side of those who work in this industry. All well and good. But Madam Speaker, when you look at the government's approach, I feel it is a knee-jerk reaction. Because certainly, they have boasted all the speakers. We have returned, we have listened, and we have come up with this piece of legislation in three months. But then, as I said, it is a piece of legislation that will see in committee stage the vast list of amendments. And that for me, Madam Speaker, sends a very clear message 
that this has not been properly thought out. And in that regard, we must ask the further question. It has been touched. My colleagues touched upon it. Chagones West dealt with the issue of the power of the minister. Orapuchis dealt with it too, Madam Speaker. But will the government give a position on whether it will consider the appointment of a regulatory board or an independent board or oversight committee that will report to the minister in terms of its administering and oversight of this particular industry. And whether this independent board or regulator, whatever term we may want, will it now have the responsibility of being broad-based, incorporating different sectors of the society from the point of view of uh, the environment, um, international trade, law, or any other discipline. I'm not an expert, but I'm pointing the government in a direction, or any other specialist that will guide regulations to manage the day-to-day -day industry. Will the government be prepared? There's, in, in its mantra that they seem to have thrown through the window, let's do this together. Are they prepared to have a representative of the Scrap Iron Dealers Association on this independent committee that the opposition is calling for, Madam Speaker? So at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, we feel that the appointment of a regulator will lead to a universal fate in the system by the people who matter most, that is the scrap iron dealers themselves. Madam Speaker, I've referred only to a sample of the clauses that we in the opposition find either cumbersome, harsh, or too authoritative. While it is good that the government has brought the legislation, the opposition is very clear. We have the firm conviction that this bill requires much more work. And it is very clear, based on the list of amendments that have been handed, have been circulated, and I will call that an ambush by the government. If this current legislation is passed in its current de design, the legislation would create confusion, administrative bureaucracy, and would hamper rather than help the industry. The government has simply not done its work in drafting this bill, and instead has clearly presented a very disorganized and arbitrary piece of legislation here this evening, Madam Speaker. It is simply not good law. It is lazy as far as I'm concerned in terms of the approach of the Attorney General. And I will tell the Attorney General, go back to the drawing board. I thank you. Attorney General. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. I will begin by acknowledging the remarks of the member for Coover South that it is a good thing that this government has brought this bill to this house. <clears throat> and Madam Speaker, the member for Coover South did me the service as well of alerting Madam Speaker and the House, to the fact that I will be moving certain amendments during the committee stage, and I am also thankful to him for alerting the House and Madam Speaker to that fact. And may I just indicate for the benefit of members 
so that the member does not claim to be ambushed, that with respect to the amendment which I propose to make to clause 25 of the present bill before you, in subclause 2, which is to be replaced, I will be deleting the words in the second line of subclause 2, with or without notice to the site manager. Madam Speaker, <clears throat> much has been said today by the members on the other side with respect to the bill which is before this House. And it would be to do a disservice, really, to the substance of this bill. It would be to do a disservice to the time that members have spent in this House on serious business for me to trivialize this bill which is serious business by rising to the bit of seeking to respond to almost 90% of what has been said by the other side. Because what is clear from what has been said, and it was apt and appropriate that the last speaker for the other side admitted that it is a good thing that this government has brought this bill what is clear from what has been said by the other side is that this is opposition for the sake of opposition. May I thank the members of the government for the very learned and fulsome and detailed analysis which they have given to the population of the bill which is before this House and they have made my task in winding up comparatively easy to the extent that I do not need to go through in any great detail much more of what has already been said by way of response to those few matters of substance which were raised on the other side. A couple of the matters which were raised, however, I, I think I should respond to if only for the purpose, Madam Speaker, of correcting the record. So that Madam Speaker will recall that the member for Point Appear and the member for Miaru, and indeed the member for Orpush East, all pointed to the fact that, and referred with some detail to the fact that the purport to be here today to speak on behalf of the stakeholders of the scrap industry in Trinidad and Tobago. And Madam Speaker, you will recall when I opened in my pilot to this bill that I spoke to the fact that there has been, and remarkably, if I may say so, a significant degree of consultation that has been undertaken by this government, not least three occasions, which I have already pointed to in my pilot. And I just want to put on record, which I did not do in my pilot, but which I think is now appropriate so that the circumstance not be misrepresented. I want to put on record, Madam Speaker, the contributions which the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs has recorded that it received from the stakeholders with whom the consultation was engaged. And Madam Speaker will recall I spoke to three consultations, one in August, one in October, and one in November. And I'll read in some detail the record of the responses which were provided by the stakeholders, and I will read it on both sides of the coin, those which were in support and those which were against what was being proposed by the government. So the pertinent feedback which was received from the stakeholders included 
removing the licensing system from the magistrate's court to the Ministry of Trade and Industry. That we have done by this bill. Licenses should continue to be annual. That we have done by this bill. There should be inspection of the loading of scrap metal for export at the scrap metal site. That we have done by this bill. The minister should have the power to vary or revoke a license. That we have done by this bill. There should be a duty to keep records. That we have done by this bill. There should be given a power of entry and inspection to certified officers. That we have done by this bill. There should be the establishment of a database for the industry. That we have done by this bill. There should be a process of identification of motor vehicles being used to collect scrap metal. That we have done by this bill. There should be an increase in penalties. That we have done by this bill. The practice of scrap, majority of scrap metal collectors and dealers to present identification at the point of collection or sale of scrap metal. That we have done by this bill. Strong support, the stakeholders articulated, for the law to require collectors and dealers to present identification and contact details when buying and selling scrap metal. That we have done by this bill. The clear majority of collectors and dealers requested and recorded customer contact information. That we have done by this bill. The weighing of scrap metal before sale. We have not done that by this bill, but we will do it in the regulations. Cash is the preferred method of payment amongst both collectors and dealers, and may I say the intention with the regulations is to allow a limit of a certain amount of cash and for electronic means of payment or checks to be otherwise used. To establish, I'm continuing with the recommendations which we received from the stakeholders with whom we held consultations to establish a centralized system to allow collectors and dealers to liaise with one organization. And I dare say that the one organization, because at the forefront of the consultation was the learned gentleman, Mr. Alan Ferguson. I dare say the one organization in contemplation is the Scrap Dealers Association led by Mr. Ferguson to establish standardized processes to obtain a license and for other scrap metal offenses and matters. That we have done by this bill. The express support for a collector to be able to offload at a licensed scrap metal site. That we have done by this bill. That provision to, should be made for an export license. We have done that, Madam, Madam Speaker, by this bill. Concern was expressed whether a scrap metal dealer can also collect scrap, and there is provision in that for the scrap metal dealer to function as a collector of scrap at the scrap metal sites for which he is licensed. So that we have done by this bill. Dealers should be able to alter scrap metal after eight, not 15 days. Madam Speaker, you will recall, we proposed 15 days, they didn't say, no, you can't keep it for 15 days. They said, do it eight days instead. So there was give and take. They were making proposals as we made our proposals. And in the nature of consultation, we were not bound to accept what was proposed to us. We stayed with the 15 days. And you will recall that I had said, Madam Speaker, in my opening, that they had recommended the use of 24-hour CCT camera systems instead of the scrap metal inspector. Well, we opted for the scrap metal inspector instead of 24-hour CCTV coverage. Those aspects of their recommendations, which we did not accept, were they complained that the majority of scrap metal collectors sourced their products from roadsides, 996 
Household was 97.97% and landfills 689 and that the scrap metal dealers collected and sold mostly non-functioning household appliances and the statistics were given to us. We took all of that into consideration. It is not that we ignored it. They gave us the information. We assessed it. We gave it all to the Law Reform Commission and we asked them to take it into consideration in weighing the policy which was to be brought to the Cabinet. So, Madam Speaker, it is less than candid on the part of the members on the other side to purport to stand here today to claim to be speaking on behalf of the Scrap Dealers Association when we in the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs have a very clear written record of what was the process of consultation and what were the engagements on both sides. In point of fact, I only on the 12th of December, I noted and I cite what I'm about to cite because there was one matter I will wish to correct. I noted a press release which I will refer to, dated the 12th of December 2022, a media release, TTSIDA Concerned Over Scrap Metal Act. It was published in the daily newspapers. And the very first paragraph says, it is under the signature of Alan Ferguson, President. The very first paragraph says, the Trinidad and Tobago Scrap Iron Dealers is pleased that the Scrap Metal Act 2022 is going before the Parliament on Wednesday, which paves the way for us to move from an unregulated, informal sector to a regulated sector standing side by side with other businesses. That's the opening paragraph of the media release. The last paragraph of the media release says, as a result, we are urging the government to let good sense prevail for the people of this industry and by extension, the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. They do go on to say in the middle of the, the media release that they are concerned that they need to get permission from the commissioner of police to be able to load um, scrap metal and to be able to conduct their business. Well, all of us are obliged by law to get the permission of the Commissioner of Police and the members of the police service to go about our lawful business. So I don't see that as a complaint of any substance. They went on to say in their media release that after carefully examining the bill over the weekend, we have found that some of these terms will not be in the best interest of those in our industry who are fully dependent on scrap metal for, for, for survival. So I find it odd, and I happen to know Mr. Ferguson, I have met with him on three occasions in the course of these consultations, and he was here today. I find it odd that the members on the other side could purport to represent a state of fact which is simply not correct as being representative of the truth of the process of consultation which we engaged in with the other side. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, the one correction that I wish to put on record in relation to the press release, which I have just referred to of the Trinidad and Tobago Scrap Dealers Association, Scrap Iron Dealers Association, dated the 12th of September, 12th of December, 2022, is in the last paragraph on page one, this, the, the media release consists of two pages, they say it should be noted that the association was provided with only a cabinet note consisting of five pages addressing some of the terms stipulated in the new act. Well, that is not correct, and indeed I'm grateful to the member for Orpush East who referred to the papers that he had been given by the Scrap Dealer Association. What we did, Madam President, Madam Speaker, I beg your pardon, was we emailed, and I said this in my opening, we emailed to the Scrap Dealers Association and all of the other stakeholders, because there were many other 
than just Mr. Ferguson's association, a summary of what had been agreed by the cabinet when cabinet met to approve the policy of the Law Reform Commission. It would not have been correct, appropriate, or indeed, well, let me leave it at that. It would not have been correct or appropriate for me to have given to the members of the Scrap Dealers Association a copy of the cabinet note which recorded the deliberations of cabinet. And we did not do that. But we held a full consultation with them. We went as far as to say to the Scrap Dealers Association when we met with them on the 25th of November, we said, cabinet met the Thursday before, the 25th of November was a Friday. And I recall very clearly saying to the assembled members of the association, cabinet met last week Thursday and deliberately referred this matter to the F and GP, the Finance and General Purposes Committee, which is meeting next Monday, knowing that we, the members of the small committee who were engaging in consultation, knowing that we were meeting with you, the stakeholders, on Friday to enable us to receive from you, the stakeholders, your views, so that those views could be communicated to the Finance and General Purposes Committee on the following Monday to then be put as a final position to the cabinet, which met the, the Thursday after the 25th of November, when that policy was finally approved. So I entirely completely and without fear of contradiction, reject the suggestion that has been repeated ad nauseum on the other side, that there has been insufficient consultation, that there has been misrepresentation by any member of this government as to the seriousness with which it undertook this task. And all of the members on the government side have made this point, and I repeat it, almost as a, as a swan song. We are concerned about three things with this bill. One is to ensure that the industry is revived for the interests of the small people of this country who rely on it. We are concerned, secondly, that the resumption of that industry in order to provide a livelihood to those persons who rely on it should not be abused by the criminal element and therefore we have taken the task of regulating that industry by the bill which is before Parliament today. And thirdly, we have undertaken the task of regulating it in the terms that we have in order to protect the national security infrastructure of this country, which has been pillaged over the past several months by that small criminal element. And let me emphasize, this small criminal element which has abused the legitimate business people, small and medium business people of this country. And we took the decision, Madam Speaker, and here I wish to address, among others, the last speaker who accused me of being hasty, ill-prepared, and other fine adjectival words. We took the decision to come to this parliament knowing that this was and is a work in progress. But we had given the commitment when I had with the Honorable Minister of National Security, we called a press conference either on the 12th of August or the day immediately after legal notice 164 was issued. And we announced to the citizenry of this country that the ban was valid to the 23rd of February 2023, but that I would report to the parliament and to the, the people of this country by the halfway mark, and I would do my utmost best to bring legislation to the parliament. So that what I have done with the very able assistance of the professional staff of the ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs and the Ministry of Trade and Industry 
is not hasty. It is in the interests of the people of this country to engage with them and to say to them as we bring this bill to the people, now that we have brought this bill and we are continuing to work with you to make it that much more appropriate for your regulation and your safeguarding to continue to work with us as we perfect it and as we build out the regulations. And it is, I believe, the Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industries in his, in his contribution today who emphasized the point that there will be partial proclamation of this bill if it is passed in the parliament today. And the reason why there will be partial proclamation is because we recognize that this being a work in progress, we recognize that there having to be regulations to regulate the industry, not all of that capable of being accomplished by the end of this year, which is a mere 17 days away or 16 days away. We have given the commitment to the population and we intend to implement the, the commitment to proclaim enough of this act and to deem it operational so that by Christmas, small and medium play players in this society can once more be operating their business, as Mr. Ferguson asked me in the consultation that I had with him in the presence of the Minister of Trade and Industry and in the presence of the Minister of National Security. Mr. Ferguson said to me after thanking us for coming to them with a bill, he said, can you at least get this bill operational into law so that people can have something to eat for Christmas? And I said, we will do our very utmost to do that. And that is why we are asking this House not only to pass this bill today, but we will be advising Her Excellency the President, pursuant to the Statutes Act and the proclamation section of this legislation, when it becomes law, to enact specific sections of the act to deem it in operation in relation to present licensed dealers, collectors and dealers who have licenses under the current Old Metal Marine Act so that they can continue into operation until the 14th of April 2023 so that they can continue to earn a living. And let me just emphasize that as the date, my good friend, and parliamentary colleague, the Minister of Trade and Industry, I think mentioned August inadvertently. The date is the 14th of April, 2023. That is the date to which we are going to ask this parliament to allow this legislation to come into effect and to be deemed to be operational in the interest of ensuring that the people of this country can earn a living under this act and not to be abused by that small criminal element, including some of those who are currently facing the force of law when all that is to be revealed will be revealed. So that, Madam Speaker, with those few words, I beg to move. Honorable members, the question is that a bill entitled an act to create measures to regulate the business of dealing in scrap metals and for other related matters be now read a second time. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled, An Act to Create Measures to Regulate the Business of Dealing in Scrap Metals and for Other Related Matters. The Attorney General. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 68-1, I beg to move that the Scrap Metal Bill 2022 be committed to the Committee of, of the Whole to be considered clause by clause. Honorable Members, the question is, that is Scrap Metal Bill 2022 be committed to the Committee of the Whole to be considered close by close. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. This House will now go into the Committee of the Whole to consider the bill close by close.
Okay, so honorable, honorable members, uh, I, would, um, I think it's prudent that we suspend the committee for just, I, I would say, five minutes. We are waiting the technical staff to, to come in. I, I think it will do us all well to take a little break and stand and stretch. Okay, so this committee meeting is now suspended. We will, um, we will resume, uh, let's see, at 8.45, yes? All right, the meeting is now suspended. Resume at 8.45. So seeing no one has left, <laughs> this is, this, well, that's why we all stood up. Okay, so the committee meeting is now resumed. The, the officer is here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and may I apologize to my colleagues, Mr. Harry Paul um, went to the House of Representatives. <laughs> okay, so um, members, we have a, a list of amendments. Um, might I suggest that we take, we take and block those where there are no amendments. Whip, you have any, no amendments, okay? That you, right? So can, can we agree that the ones that we have amendments, we take singly, and the others where no men, amendments, we take them and block where possible, okay? All right, thank you very much. Clause 1. The question is that Clause 1 stand part of the bill. The question is that Clause 1 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 1 now stands part of the bill. Clause 2. The question is that Clause 2 stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, um, I wish to propose a few amendments to Clause 2 as have been circulated, Madam Speaker. One, 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 amendment. one amendment to Clause 2, which is an amendment to the definition of the word authorized officer, which has been circulated. Yep. Member um, Madam Chair, we have no objections to this amendment. Okay. All right, so the question is that clause to be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause two as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause three. The question is that clause three stand part of the bill. The question is that clause three now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause three now stands part of the bill. Clause four. The question is that clause four stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to propose that there be one amendment to clause four of the bill, which is at clause four, sub clause four, A. 
And in the last line of 414A, I propose that the words section 25 or 28, as the case may be, be deleted and replaced with the words this act. No, no objection, please. Thank you. The question is that clause 4 be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 4 as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 5. The question is that Clause 5 stand part of the bill, Attorney General. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Speaker. I wish to propose that Clause 5 be amended at 5 sub clause 7. And in the last line of sub clause 7, the words section 25 or 28, as the case may be, should be deleted and replaced with the words this, the, the two words, this act. Okay, the question is that clause five be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause five as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause six. The question is that clause six stand part of the bill. The question is that clause six now stands part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 6 now stands part of the bill. Clause 7. The question is that clause 7 stand part of the bill, Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to propose two amendments to clause 7. The first amendment at clause 7C, the word or, O-R, be deleted after the word conditions and the semicolon. And there should then be a new D introduced after C, which will read where the applicant is not a fit and proper person as prescribed to be a licensee or. And what was previously D now gets relettered E. Well, the question is, that clause seven be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause seven as amended now stand part of the schedule. Of the bill, I'm sorry. <laughs> Clauses eight to 10. Clauses, the question is that clauses eight to 10 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses eight to 10 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses eight to 10 now stand part of the bill. Clause 11. The question is that clause 11 stand part of the bill. Yes. Attorney General. Yes, thank you. Madam Speaker, I wish to propose one amendment to clause 11 at sub clause four, the words the scrap metal inspector be deleted and substituted with the words unauthorized person. Yes, yes sir. Speak, G, through, through the yes. speaker, chair. Um, it had scrap metal inspector before. Why are you enlarging it to authorized officer when the definition is so large with authorized officer? It, it allows for a greater number of personnel who can perform the function of inspection and authorized persons is defined in section two, so it's clear who the authorized persons are. It enables the Minister of Trade to call on a larger pool of persons to conduct the inspections. Member for Samuel Barataria. Thank you. Madam Chair. AG, is there a difference in the definition of an authorized person or authorized officer? In the definition section, you have authorized officer. In the amendment, you have authorized person. Is that a typographical error, or is... Thank you for that, <laughs> member for Baratara San Juan, and that's very um, eagle-eyed of you. That is an error on my part. I accept that correction so that the word should be an authorized officer as opposed to authorized person. In the amendment? In the amendment. 
consistent with the defined <laughs> the term amendment. in yes. Section 2, authorized officer, which we had earlier amended to include yes. constable, etc. Sure. Okay. Thank you for that. As it pleases you, member for Oropushan East. Okay. The question is that clause 11 be amended. Yes, sorry, member for Zabria. So, I didn't see it. Amendment? Yes. There was a, a, an issue raised about having a PHI. Okay. Public okay. Just one minute. Can we have a little silence, please, so that I can hear member for Zabria? Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, honorable member. There was an issue raised, a concern with having a PHI as one of these authorized officers, given that a PHI is, by, by definition, a contracted officer. And therefore, if such PHI had to come after his contract had ended, problems may arise, or he's no longer um, there as an authorized person. There was an issue raised by one of my colleagues. Have you considered it at all? I did hear the issue arise. I don't think it makes a difference. At the end of the day, the definition of authorized officer allows for a pool of persons from whom in his or her, as is the case now, the Minister of Trade and Industry can choose from those persons. I thank you, sir, but in the definition of authorized officer, yes. you have included a PHI as one of the pools that you're one speaking of. One of six, yes. Yes. The concern is such an officer is a contracted officer and may be on contract whether short or long term and is no longer there to deal with matters that may have risen under that person's watch. That was a concern raised, I think, by MP Parry. Yes, well, I, I think that that will have to be addressed at the time when the occasion arises. It doesn't affect the defined terms. If the person is available to discharge that function as nomenclature exists in the authorized definition, then that person can be called on. If that person, that functionary, doesn't exist at that time, then the discretion of the minister will be exercised with those remaining in the definition of authorized officer. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that clause 11 be amended as follows. Just grumbling. Why is this one happy? The question is that clause 11 be amended as follows. In sub clause 4, delete the words, the scrap metal inspector, and substitute the words an authorized officer. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 11, as amended, now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 12 to 14. The question is that clauses 12 to 14 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 12 to 14 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 12 to 14 now stand part of the bill. Clause 15. The question is that clause 15 stand part of the bill, Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I propose two amendments to clause 15. The first amendment will be to delete the words from except, which begins the sentence in the first line to the word metal. So the words except for, the pur for purposes other than dealing in scrap metal, those words be deleted. And the second um, consequential amendment is that the word no remains, but it's a capitalized N because the sentence begins with no. No person shall transport scrap metal and then to interlineate the words for the purpose of dealing in scrap metal. 
and then continuing unless he holds a scrap metal collector's license issued by the minister. Oh. EG, uh, through, through the chair, uh, is, is just what, English, that we just re rearranging the wording of, the, of that clause? It's to, provide, it's to provide for greater clarity, and in fact, it was an amendment that I thought um, appropriate, having listened to the member on your side, um, Honorable Member for Point of Pierre, Mr. The member from Mayaru, when he spoke about the issue of transportation and clarity in the transporting. So it was a contribution from your side, which I thought would lend clarity by this amendment. Member for Baratarisano. E.G., um, I understand the intention of the amendment and the, the original clause as drafted in the bill. <clears throat> but I don't want to have a group of persons who may be unnecessarily captured by this particular provision. For example, um, let's say a regional corporation that normally would collect, um, <coughs> could, could be metal during cleanup exercises, and they would not be considered as scrap metal dealers. This is now giving a blanket restriction on any person transporting scrap metal. Um, No, that part is being deleted. So AG is deleting except for purposes other than dealing in scrap, me scrap metal. That first sentence is being deleted. No person shall transport scrap metal unless he holds, so it will now read, no person shall transport scrap metal unless he holds a scrap metal collector's license issued by the minister. An amendment member. Okay, you read the, how it is. The, the yeah. amendment yeah. reads, right. when we delete and we introduce, this, so reads, no person shall transport scrap metal for the purpose of dealing in scrap metal unless he holds a scrap metal collector's license issued by the minister. Yeah, sure. I, I take it to AG. Yes. Yeah, so that, that caveat will, will um, assist with the problem that I Yes, and, 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 the, and the word deal is defined in section two and clearly demonstrates that there are isolated sub the subsection B in the word deal as defined yes. illustrates that persons who are operating on an isolated transaction, not dealing, are yes. not required to have a, a license. Thank you very much, AJ. Yes. And Lapentel West, I'm not speaking to you, you know. Members, 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 we are in the season of goodwill. So let's start here with a little a little goodwill, okay? All right, so the question is, now, is, if we disengage, I'm sure we could reboot. The question is that clause 15 be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is, clause 15 as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 16 to 23. The question is that clauses 16 to 23 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 16 to 23 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 16 to 23 now stand part of the bill. Clause 24. The question is that clause 24 stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I propose one amendment to clause 24.1. In the second line of 24.1, the words in the prescribed form be deleted. The question is that clause 24 be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 24 as amended now stands part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 25. The question is that clause 25 stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Madam Speaker, we have six amendments to Clause 25. 
the first substantive amendment is to delete the existing subclauses one and two in their entirety and to replace them with the new subclauses one and two which were circulated. And as I indicated in my reply, in subclause two, I wish to delete from subclause two, line two, the words with or without notice to the site manager. So that subclause two, as amended, now will read, an authorized officer may at any reasonable time conduct inspections of any scrap metal site and may carry out any other examination, etc. Is Madam Speaker with me? Yes. Subclause one and two are substituted fully. Yes. And subclause two, the new subclause two, will now read an authorized officer may at any reasonable time conduct inspections of any scrap metal site and may carry out any other examination. With or without notice to, to the, the site, site manager. Correct. Right. Yes. Okay. I'm deleting those words. Yes. Well. Can we just take it as? as <coughs> Yes, yes, um, just, just to follow up, um, AG, on that new amendment, within an amendment, um, why you want to remove giving notice to the site manager? Because you originally had it there, and now you're removing it yes. on the floor. You're making this amendment on the floor. Yes. Why, why you want, because it is critical for the site manager, why are you not giving notice now? Because, as I indicated in both my opening and my winding up, what we propose to do, Member for Point of Pair, is uh, once this law is passed today, we will be asking Her Excellency to proclaim certain sections of the legislation. One of the sections we are asking her to proclaim will be Part 5, Section 25. We are, we are deeming... Course, but we are deeming, we will be asking this House to deem as operational certain sections of the Act so that persons who currently operate on licenses issued under the old Marine Act can continue to operate into 2023, even though the, the build-out, the regulatory build-out and the training and other things that have to be accomplished over the next several months has not yet been accomplished. And one of the things that we want to do by deleting with or without notice the site manager, we are not immediately imposing on sites which will be allowed to operate under this demon provision, a site manager on site in this interim period. Member Fischer-Gornas, Wes. Um, <clears throat> Honorable AG, in terms of the original bill, 25-1, 25-2, um, the, the, the point um, I think to be made here, and, and this is where the concern is, that <clears throat> what is there in the original bill clearly contemplates giving of notice. And when we get to the other proposed amendments, I know we are not there yet, it has an impact in terms of what powers can actually be exercised by the officer. So giving of notice is critical according to the original bill. One is um, on notice and where it is otherwise than notice, there have been specified instances. So it seems to be a balance in terms of the exercise of the power under the original bill, which is not appearing in the amendments. In the amendments, it is an outright inspection of any scrap metal site with or without notice. There are no other conditions as in the original sections, original bill, sorry, whereby it could have been for the um, purpose of verifying that there is compliance with the Act following instances of attempting to go on site. I don't know if, if I'm clear. There has been a balance in terms of the exercise of power, whereas with the amendment, Repeating it's not structured like that. It's clear. It's cool. Yeah, the, the short point, member, is that we are to use a term that I frankly don't like to use, but it is apt here, we are operationalizing limited sections of the bill on the assumption that the House will pass it and on the assumption that the Senate will accept our recommendations. And there will be no site manager 
in the period between now to April 14th when persons who are currently issued licenses under the old Marine Act continue to function. So there is no necessity at this point in time, and it would confuse the issue to have a provision in section 25 that requires notice to be given to a site manager when that site manager is not going to be in place between now and 2023. No, the, yes. the, the issue yes. is not necessarily the site manager, that, that amendment. <clears throat> the issue is that you are allowing the exercise of a power with or without notice. Whereas before, the, the giving of notice was there, at least to somebody. So whether, whether it's the site manager or not is not my concern. My concern is that you're now saying it can be done with or without notice, and the conditions that applied under the original bill to be followed, it presumed that you would have um, reasonable attempts to give the notice, and in such instances where it failed, then you would move on to where you can go in on, on your own without notice, not, not in the amendments. Well, two things, if I may. Two things um, that I hope you'd appreciate as we go through the rest of the amendments, because we haven't yet got to one of the amendments that is relevant to this, but having circulated the amendments before, you would have read the later section where there is a schedule which requires persons who currently have licenses under the old Marine Act on the, uh, this piece of legislation taking effect, those persons will have to apply for a license in the form that is prescribed in the schedule. And that form has the person applying, consenting to the inspections taking place at any time within reasonable hours on the premises. So that there is no, there is no vice in the inspection on reasonable notice coming in, uh, within reasonable times coming in with or without notice because the operation of the license is premised on the fact that the person will have applied for a license and by that application for a license will have consented to the reasonableness of his site being inspected from time to time. Member for Baratari Sanwan. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. It is just a query. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask if you can just bring some clarification to this particular issue. At one, we're saying that the authorized officer will enter during the working hours for the purpose of exercise of his power under the Act. And then at two, it is saying that he can enter with or without notice to the site manager um, the carry out examination to verify compliance with the Act and any conditions with regards to the license. Now, what is the real distinction between one and two, save and accept that one is entrance at the working hours and the other one, it omits that the authorized officer can enter um, with respect, um, without going there in the opening hours? So basically, at one, he is given a wide discretion to exercise his powers under the Act. At two, to verify compliance with the Act and to also look at conditions, requirements, and restrictions of a license are also matters under the Act. So really, there is no distinction between one and two. So if you can just clarify what is the real um, distinction between <coughs> subsection one and two. Yes, member, and, and perhaps it would help if I read both of them. So one, 25-1, reads, an authorized officer may at any reasonable time enter any scrap metal site specified in a scrap metal dealer's license during working hours or such other times as the scrap metal site is open to the public or otherwise in use by the licensee for the purpose of the exercise of his powers under this act. So the authorized officer may enter the scrap metal site at a reasonable time for the exercise of the plenitude of his powers under the Act. Yes. It's the broad, overarching exercise of power. Yes. Subsection 2 says an authorized officer may at any reasonable time conduct inspections at any, of any scrap metal site and may carry out any other examination 
as be, may be necessary to verify compliance. So it particularizes the power to conduct inspections. But wouldn't subsection 2 be a, a subset of subsection 1? It could be, it could be, and it may be, it may be, you know, just to make it pellucidly clear. Um, you know, somebody could argue, and we have clever lawyers in Trinidad and Tobago, the authorized officer may enter under subsection 1 and say, I want to inspect that, and the, and the lawyer will say, where's your power to inspect? Well, it's in subsection 2. The, the difference is that one is during working hours and the other one, it doesn't specify at subsection two, it doesn't specify that at they have to go at working time. hours, it's just Correct. at any reasonable time. Yes. Um, the, other, is, the other point I want to raise is that... I just say, sure. remember, that in the drafting of this, because we want to be particularly fair, we have erred on the side of caution, and perhaps we repeat ourselves more than is necessary, but it is to make it clear. Okay. The other issue I want to raise is the, 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 the width of the persons that may enter, because this is a power of entry and search, basically, um, at one and two. And an authorized officer, and I'm just going, um, I could understand police officer SRP, but when we get to public health inspector of the corporation and the environmental officer of the EMA, I think it's a bit too wide because I'm just looking at the definition of what an environmental officer is under the EMA Act. And at Sorry, section 33, it would really say that it could be any person that the EMA authorizes that could be found in any government entity because it's MOUs between the EMA and government entities. And then the EMA will deem any, other, any person to be considered as, a, as an environmental officer according to section 33 of the EMA Act. If, I stand to be corrected on that point. Now we're giving these persons who may be from another ministry, um, it could be any other officer, the power to enter and search um, a person's premises in terms of the operations of his business. I think that may be too wide in terms of the discretion and the powers that we're giving to such officers. Because I don't know if it could be an environmental officer, it could also be on contract, or if they all have to be um, appointed as public officers. Well, if, if you'll allow me to answer this way, member, we, we have to understand, and, and this is a matter of statutory construction, we have to look at the general purport of the legislation. Part of the general purport of the legislation is to, among other things, ensure public health safety, and another part of the purpose of this legislation is to ensure environmental safety. A report may be made to the minister that there is an activity taking place. So for instance, the collection of rodents and mosquitoes, etc. The minister exercises a power to reach out to a public health inspector to address that concern that has been brought to her attention. Or there may be a complaint by someone that a scrap metal yard is within close proximity to a children's school, and therefore it's an environmental hazard. The minister reaches out to an environmental officer authorized by the Environmental Management Authority. You have to allow the act to work, and to work within the discretion of the minister, and certainly, and, and may I say this, you don't presume that the exercise of the power is going to be capricious. Thank you. The question is that clause 25 be amended as circulated, save and except clause 25 2, which is amended as follows. An authorized officer may at any reasonable time conduct inspections of any scrap metal site and may carry out any other examination as may be necessary to verify compliance with this act and any applicable conditions, requirements, or restrictions of a scrap metal dealer's license. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 25, as amended, now stand part of the schedule. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 26. Let me just interrupt for a minute. I, I had indicated there were six amendments to 25. 25. So we're really amending 25.1 and 2. 
and I'd now like to move to 25.3. Yeah. All right, so we've only dealt. All right, so what I'll do is I'll let you proceed, and then I will put the question over with respect to the entirety of Clause 25. Th thank you. Thank you, Madam Yes. President. So I, I then next propose that subsection 25, subsection 3, be deleted and that it be replaced by the words an authorized officer may, if necessary, use reasonable force in the exercise of his powers under this act. So that's the second amendment to 25.3 that I wish to propose. Um, your initial version was a police officer may by warrant enter. So we are now authorizing pers persons to enter um, to use reasonable force. A PHI, again, we come back to that issue. A person from the AMA, as my colleague has, uh, has um, given us that definition, are we saying they can just go and use force, break down somebody's door? What does it mean, use reasonable force? It means that a reasonable, that an authorized officer mm -hmm. on sufficient notification to the authority, in that case it would be the minister, may go in to perform the purposes of and the powers conferred. And if that officer is hindered in entering the premises, may use reasonable force as conferred conferred by the powers given to him under the act. Oh. I, I have a very serious concern about this matter because you have, as we said, the, the um, definition of authorized officer. You've moved beyond those. You've removed warrant, that somebody needs to get a warrant. You're now telling me they will report to the minister or notify the minister that they have reasonable cause. The report must come to someone. It could be the minister. It could be any other person who is charged with functions under this act. The point is that somebody complains that something is going on and an authorized officer has to go in to investigate. So I, I wouldn't want it to be suggested that I am, by what I've just said, conferring an exclusive jurisdiction on the minister. Information comes to the relevant authority. A power has to be exercised under the act, so and the powers are exercisable by the authorized thank you. officer. So we are asking a PHI. We are asking one of these EMA people from any part of any ministry, anywhere, and saying you could come and break down a man's door. You could kick down his gate. Without, well, without any warrant? No. Reasonable force does not equate to kicking down a man's door. Well, no, what is it then, sir? One would have to judge in the what circumstances. What is reasonable force, sir? What is reasonable force to enter? If the man's gate is locked, so he's been hindered, I have to cut the lock. He will, the officer will have to break the lock. If the lock is in a certain way, he can't even break it that way. He might have to do something else. I think this is a very dangerous, with the greatest respect, and this may... Will you please ask this member to leave me alone, Madam Speaker? Each time I'm speaking, he has to intervene and mumble and grumble. So I'm sorry his life is so unhappy. Oh. All right. Uh, member, all members, all right? When a member is speaking, let's be respectful and listen. If we can't listen, and, and, and there we go again. If we can't listen, then, you know, maybe we could invoke some Zen moment. Okay? Member for Superior, please. Madam, Madam Chair, thank you. So you so, sure. Can I attempt to? Yeah. I think you should read the amendment that I have proposed mm -hmm. with another amendment which I intend to propose, and that is Section 39. Yeah. So if you were to look at the amendment that I intend to propose, 39 reads, notwithstanding the repeal of the... Right, so maybe then we might want to suggest to postpone this until we do 20, uh, 39. Is that possible? I don't know. Uh, AG, you'll have to let me know. I, I'm entirely in your hands. But I, can, I, can just, I can just illustrate it briefly without actually reading. The point is that under 39.1, and I've said this before, Member for Ciparia, so I don't want to repeat myself. 
These are provisional arrangements, deeming arrangements that are being made to apply specifically to persons who currently hold licenses under the old Marine Act. The operation of the Act will be continued for a limited and finite time, and that goes to reasonableness, and persons who are going to avail themselves of the ability to continue to do business under their current licenses will have to make an application and by the operation of 39 are deemed to consent to entry onto their premises for the purposes of the application of the entire act. So that when you read subsection three as I've just proposed, the person who has applied for the license to continue to April 14th, 2023, is applying in the knowledge of what the law says. If he's unhappy with what the law says, he need not apply for a license. Yes. Yeah. It gets scarier and scarier, with the greatest of respect, Honorable Attorney General. Because, in a sense, this is a fetter on, 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 on your rights. Sir. If you are saying, no license for you unless you agree that I could break your door and come in. Well, that's no not license. what has been said. I'm sorry. Nobody is talking about no, breaking no, no, down. No. I'm, I'm looking, you know, the permutations down the road, sir. I'm sure it's good intentions from everyone in dealing with this matter, it's permutations and things that may happen. I have a clause which tells me, um, delete the one that is a warrant and a police officer. Now, any of these authorized officers may, if necessary, use reasonable force in the exercise of his powers under this act. But then you tell me, okay, we have 39 now where you're deemed. No. So you're saying it's a transitionary, is that a transitionary uh, provision for the persons under the old act have their business going and in transition to get the license under the new act. In that interim period, in some way these two things help, and I cannot see it, that to say I must consent to get this license, that raises a whole another I'm, issue, sir. I'm, I'm, sure as so, you, I'm sure as you think it through, it will become clearer. Well, we just got this two seconds ago, as you may yes, well appreciate. Um, so I'm saying I, I am not in agreement with that particular amendment. I, I can put that on the record with the amendment to um, 20, gosh. <laughs>
The amendment is just taking away all the balance and giving authorized officers carte blanche. You have the power to go in any time, any day, with reasonable force, without warrant. I know the warrant is coming later, but for now, even without we go into that provision to, to, to be considered in, in a little while, Attorney General, using what we have debated so far, you, you, anybody could just go in. And that is the, 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 there's no balance in terms of the rights. Persons who are suspected of having committed or breached compliance with provisions of the act have rights as well. So where does the balance come in? We, I sort of saw it with the original bill. And why are we moving away from that to this, where there is no balance? Uh, thank, you, thank you for that, member. I, I, I think that your concern is an elaboration of the concern earlier noted by the member for Superia. I have noted that concern. I note yours. And I don't think that I can be more clear than I was in my earlier explanation to the member for Superia. Minister of Finance. Yes, madam. Chairman, I think it is crystal clear the opposition is not supporting this, and therefore I am asking that this matter be dealt with by way of vote. And <laughs> okay, so, all right, okay, so, uh, all right, so members, no, 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 the sun. Members, 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 every member here I know has a certain degree of armor, thick skin, okay? Every member here. And maybe we are a bit tired, so uh, our, maybe a bit overly sensitive. Let's just rise above all these distractions and do what we are here to do. Attorney General, I believe you have said that you couldn't make yes. anything. I, I think I've been as clear as I can okay. be so that my, right. my vote would be for us to continue to and consider the other C? amendments. C? So, yes, my, yes, my further amendment, may it please you, Madam Speaker, is to delete subclauses 4, 5, 6, and 7 entirely, and then to renumber 8 as 4, renumber 9 as 5, Renumber 10 as 6. And then I would like to add a new subsection 7. And that subsection 7 will read, and that's an E of the list of amendments circulated, will read, where a magistrate is satisfied by information or oath given by a police officer that there are reasonable grounds for believing that an offense under this act has been or is about to be committed in any dwelling house, he may issue a warrant authorizing the police officer to A, enter at any time within one month from the date of the warrant, the place named in the warrant with force if necessary, and inspect that place. B, detain a person found in that place in respect of whom there is reasonable suspicion regarding the commission of an offense under this act. Or C, seize anything which may be of evidential value for the prosecution of an offense under this act or any other written law. So I'd like to introduce that as a subsection 7 to section 25. And that's the totality then of the six amendments yes. to section 25. Um, Madam Chair, I'll be very brief. The original bill, one of the clauses is subclause 7, 25-7. It says there an authorized officer except a police officer is not entitled to use force to enter a scrap metal site in the exercise of the powers under this section. So, Attorney General, I'll just simply re repeat the concern. Why are we moving away from these provisions which tend to acknowledge the balance of rights and to go to what is being proposed now? And I rest there, Madam Chair. Thank you. Noted, Member. Appreciate it. Okay. The, the question is, that clause 25 be amended as circulated, save and accept clause 25-2, which is amended as follows. An authorized officer may, be at, may at any reasonable time conduct inspections of any scrap metal site and may carry out any other examination as may be necessary to verify compliance with this act and any applicable conditions, requirements, or restrictions 
of a scrap metal dealer's license. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 25 as amended now stand part of this bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 26. The question is that clause 26 stand part of the bill. The question is that clause 26 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clause 26 now stands part of the bill. Clause 27. The question is that clause 27 stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to propose two amendments in the first line of 27.1 to replace the words public officers with the words any person and in the third line, after the, word reason, after the words reasonable times, to introduce the words, which are to be, well, not to be deleted. After the words reasonable times, to introduce the words during working hours or such other times as the scrap metal site is open to the public or otherwise in use by the licensee. Member for Shigona, Swiss. Attorney General, may I inquire who are the persons contemplated under any person? What does Minister, um, Member for, for Urupush, for Shagwanas West, is to give a discretion um, and to remove public officers for the reason that public officers was thought not to be the appropriate persons to be given that particular function. Member for Just on that point about um, you didn't want to confine it to public officers, so you said said any person. Could that any person just be any person? Or could that person have some kind of, you know, have some kind of criteria that you will choose from persons? Well, yes, I, I, I'd, I'd answer that in two ways, Member sure. for Ciparillo. Yeah. One, that, as I've said already to the member for Shagwanas West, that is a discretion to be exercised by the minister, but also I would expect in the scary. exercise of the discretion, the, the post could very well be advertised to pool from, uh, to, to recruit from a pool of persons advertised. The details, the details of this sort of build out will be spelled out in the regulations. Okay. And that's a work in progress. Um, no, no. I'm, Question. Uh, may I Just one minute, please, Member Thank you. Thank you, Madam yeah. Chair. That we do not we object to this clause, but if you're happy with it, please proceed. Sure. The question is that clause 27 be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 27 as amended now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 28 to 38. The question is that clauses 28 to 38 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 28 to 38 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 28 to 38 now stand part of the bill. Clause 39. The question is that clause 39 stand part of the bill. Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The amendment which I wish to propose is to introduce a completely new section 39 to replace what exists in the bill that was laid in Parliament. And therefore, we delete all of what exists in the bill laid and substitute with what I would now read. Section 39.1, notwithstanding the repeal of the Old Metal and Marine Stores Act by Section 41, and subject to subsections two and three, on the coming into force of this section, any license issued under the Old Metal and Marine Stores Act, which is valid immediately before 31st December 2022, shall, upon compliance with sec subsection two by the holder of the license, be deemed to be a scrap metal dealer's license under this act until 14th April 2023, or such later date as the minister may by order determine. Two. The whole of a license under subsection 1 shall submit to the minister a declaration in the form set out in the schedule 
that he consents to the entry of authorized officers on his scrap metal site during working hours or such other times as the scrap metal site is open to the public or otherwise in use for, by him for the purpose of the exercise of their powers under this act. Three, the minister may in writing impose on the holder of a license under subsection one any conditions, requirements, or restrictions as the minister considers necessary and specify the scrap metal sites to which the license applies. And may I just point out, Madam Speaker, that the schedule is reproduced as the second schedule, that is the schedule referred to in subsection two, and that second schedule reads, I blank, insert name of licensee. Yes. We'll have to deal with that when we come to schedules. As it okay. pleases, thank you. Yes. Member for Barrett Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, AG, just at section 39.2, which deals with the general consent that the licensee will give upon, um, I would presume, um, the app, when the license is approved and he gives the consent through the schedule that we will move yeah. later on in the proceedings. Which means that basically he gives a consent that the authorized officer can enter the, prop the premises. The instance where the person gives the consent in the beginning, let's say this year he's granted the permit, he signs the declaration. Next year, an inspection has to take place. And then he says, no, I'm not allowing the authorized officer to come into the premises. Then that is where the 25, three will kick in that they will use reasonable force to enter. I, I'm not sure that I follow, so I'd ask you to repeat the premise that you're operating on. Sure. Where you say the, the license will expire. No, no, not expire, sorry. Okay. License is granted. Yes. He makes a declaration that he consents for entry. Yes. Subsequently, let's say a year later, while so, oh, let's say a few months after operating, he is due for an inspection, but he then refuses the authorized officer from entering the premises. Yes. Is that where the section 25.3, as amended earlier, will kick in, where the authorized officer can use reasonable force to enter into the premises? Well, I, I wouldn't want to be so clairvoyant member for Bharataria San Juan to anticipate what could happen into the future. I would expect that if a licensee in this deemed section operating until the 14th of April 2023, having consented to the inspection of his premises by a licensee, while that license is current, then refuses to allow the inspection, a reasonable exercise of the power could very well be that the person, the authorized officer, could report back to the minister and that license could be revoked. Or suspended. Or suspended. It's an offense. It's an offense also. And it is also an offense. So the, the question of the use of reasonable force is, is presumptive as arising at that point. So then why did we insert the power for them to use reasonable force if then the minister will revoke the license? We don't it's know. It's, it's, no. it's a discretionary power. Then, then you can't. You see, you're giving authorized officers. You're giving a wide. Can we, members? The person who has the audience right now is the member for Baratara Salmon. I am having difficulty in hearing what the point he's trying to make, and I'm sure it's impacting on what the Attorney General is hearing too. All right. So could everybody else? If you wish to make a contribution, once that light goes on, you'll get your turn in turn. Member for Samuel Baratar Samuel. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, it's unacceptable to say they don't know because this is a very, it's because of, it's a very dangerous power that you're giving authorized officers to enter a person's property, use reasonable force without the supervision of the court because they can enter without warrant. And my point that I'm making here is that subsequently the person does not consent. Does that provision kick in where the authorized officer will now use reasonable force to enter into the person's premises? Because this, in fact, will trample upon one's constitutional rights and there's no supervision of the court. Sorry, um, member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West. Ma'am, just to remember, just to remind those who are contributing right now, the police as it currently stand can enter premises, any premises, without a warrant if they have reasonable grounds to suspect a crime is being committed or about to be committed. Eh? Just one minute. One minute. One 
minute, please. One minute, please. Member for Paratari Sanon. Thank you very much. Now, I listened to what Portis Way North Centre and West said, but the situation here is distinct from that because this is not in relation to the commission of any offence. This is dealing with authorised officers entering and searching a person's premises to see whether or not there is compliance with the licence that was granted by the minister. It's not anything about the criminal offence in this particular provision. Finish the point because I thought it would have been obvious. What we're dealing with here, you have the member for Sawa Barataria asking a number of what if this and what if that, right? As the Attorney General said, and quite rightly, it would be open to the minister to then revoke the license, to suspend the license, etc. He then asked, the member for Sawa Barataria then asked, well, on what circumstances would they apply the reasonable force to enter, etc.? And, and exactly as the Attorney General said, we can't sit here whole night and say, well, in these circumstances, this is what will happen, etc. If there's a crime being committed, then it may be reasonable for them to enter the premises and to do what needs to be done. All right, uh, Minister of Finance. I would also submit, Madam Chairman, the concept of reasonable forces in Clause 25, which you have already dealt with. This clause only deals with the license and consent to the powers within the act. It has nothing to do with the matters being raised. We understand that they object. I think that's obvious. Dr. you wish to ask something? Yes. Um, Attorney General, in relation to the 39.3, um, in the, the, the proposed amendment, um, a person applying for the license, uh, uh, they are required to satisfy certain um, criteria put forward certain information, et cetera, under the Act itself. I missed what you... Yeah, I'm, I'm making reference to 39.3 and the, the, the proposed amendment. I'm saying that under the, the Act, a person applying for the license, they, they, they are required to supply certain information. The minister will renew, will grant license, et cetera. Um, in 39.3, what has been contemplated here in terms of the minister imposing conditions as the minister considers necessary. Are you able to give us some um, foresight as to what this may entail? What it entails is that we are currently in a situation where there are persons who currently hold licenses. Those licenses exist under the current legislation, which is to be repealed when this law becomes, when this bill becomes law. At that point, the deemed sections of this act will come into effect on the assumption that the Senate, we pass it here, the Senate passes it, and the proclamations that we propose to bring into effect are properly brought into effect. The persons who have the licenses today will apply in the form of the schedule for the license to be continued, and it is within the discretion of the minister issuing that license and it is not for me to say now, because I am not Okura with the particular individual circumstances of any applicant, what conditions or restrictions the minister may impose. But the minister has a discretion to exercise all of her powers under the Act. So that's, that's my understanding. The question is that clause 39 be amended as circulated. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause 39 as amended now stands part of the schedule. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. Now stand part of the bill, I'm sorry. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 40 to 41. The question is that clauses 40 to 41 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 40 to 41 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 40 to 41 now stand part of the bill. New clause 42, consequential amendment. The question is that the new clause 42 be read a second time. Those in favor say aye. aye. 
Those against say no. I think the eyes have it closed. This clause will now be read a second time. New clause 42, consequential amendment. The question is that clause, the new clause 42 be added to the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The new clause 42 will now be added to the bill. New, new first schedule proceeds of crime act chapter 11, 27 amended. The question is that a new first schedule be read a second time. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The new clause, the new first schedule shall now be read a second time. New first schedule proceeds of Crime Act, Chapter 11, 27, amended. The question is that a new first schedule be added to the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The new first schedule will now be added to the bill. New second schedule, consent to entry of authorized officers. The question is that a new second schedule be read a second time. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The new second schedule will now be read a second time. New second schedule, consent to entry of authorized officers. The question is that a new second schedule be added to the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The new second schedule will now be added to the bill. So the question is that a new first schedule and a new second schedule stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The new first schedule and the new second schedule now stand part of the bill. Honorable members, the question is that the bill be now reported to the House. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. This committee meeting is now adjourned. I wish to report that the scrap metal bill 2022 was considered in the committee of the whole and approved with amendments. I now beg to move that the House agree with the committee's report. Honorable members, the question is that the House agree with the committee's report on the scrap metal bill 2022. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that a bill entitled an act to create measures to regulate the business of dealing in, a scrap, in scrap metals and for other related matters be now read a third time and passed. Honorable members, the question is that a bill entitled an act to create measures to regulate the business of dealing in scrap metals and for other related matters be now read a third time and passed. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Create Measures to Regulate the Business of Dealing in Scrap Metals and for Other Related Matters. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this House to now adjourn to a date to be fixed. Honorable Members, as we all know, we are in the blessed and holy season of Advent, which precedes Christmas.
that special time of the year that brings family and loved ones together in joyous celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, who for Christians is the way and the life. Therefore, before I put a question on the adjournment of the house, I will invite members to bring greetings on the special occasion of Christmas. <laughs> Member for Diego Martin Northeast. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I may need some extended speaking time. So important is this occasion. Celebrations will start as soon as we are due. Member for Diego Martin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the Christmas season, especially in the West, is a mix of pre-Christian, Christian, and secular traditions. The etymology of the word Christmas originates from the phrase Christus Mess, first recorded in the year 1038, which means the Mass of Christ or Christ's Mass, literally. Christmas is a time of spiritual reflection on the important foundations of our Christian faith. It's a celebration a time when Christians celebrate God's love for the world through the birth of the Christ child, Jesus. It is the second most important Christian festival, the first being the resurrection. The Christmas story is recorded in the gospel according to Luke chapter two, verses four to 19, and also in Matthew chapter one, verses 18 to 25. However, Madam Speaker, most biblical scholars prefer Luke's account, which is as follows. So, Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes, in cloths, and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men, on whom his favor rests. We Christians, Madam Speaker, believe that God sent his only son to be the atonement for all our sins so that we would not be separated from God. However, many Christian traditions vary in significance and symbolic meaning. For example, some exchange gifts because of the three wise men who visited Jesus and brought him gifts. Others follow a poem titled A Visit from St. Nicholas, which was penned in 1822 and popularized the tradition of exchanging gifts and is actually the origin of the story of Santa Claus. St. Nicholas was born in the third century in what is modern day Turkey. Much admired for his piety and kindness, St. Nicholas became the subject of many legends. It is said he gave away all his wealth and traveled the countryside helping the poor. The name Santa Claus evolved from his Dutch nickname, Sinterklaas, 
a shortened form of St. Nicholas, which Dutch settlers brought to North America in the 17th century. In Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker, in addition to our religious tradition, it is a time for family, a time for sharing, a time for fraternity, a time for charity, and a time when persons of all cultures and religious backgrounds celebrate this most important festival with we Christians. It is noteworthy, Madam Speaker, that although people celebrate Christ's birth on December 25th, he may have been born on a different day. Historians tell us that the church in Rome began formally celebrating Christmas on December the 25th in the year 336 AD during the reign of Emperor Constantine, who had made Christianity the religion of the empire. Some speculate the date was chosen to link with the winter solstice on the Roman calendar. But for Christians, the true meaning of Christmas is the celebration of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that through our belief in Christ, we are children of God. And therefore, Madam Speaker, on behalf of the government, on behalf of the People's National Movement, on my own behalf, I wish all of us and the nation a happy and holy Christmas and a bright and prosperous New Year. Thank you. Member for Siparia. Greetings from the member for the Ego Martin North East. We'll now get our greetings from the member for Superior. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I want to thank the honorable member for his greetings to all of us. And it seems he's very joyful. So I want to join with my colleagues here on behalf of the opposition members of parliament on behalf of the opposition UNC, I offer here in this esteemed house to all parliamentarians, to all members of the parliamentary staff, and indeed our nation, a very merry and blessed Christmas. So Christmas is more than what we know it as the festive lights, the gifts, the food, the pageantry, which we all enjoy. Christmas represents one of the greatest events in our world, one of the most special events in the faith of our Christian brothers and sisters, and one of the most beautiful events which we all look forward to each year, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, as I offer these Christmas greetings, I also take the time to offer to our Catholic community a holy and blessed Advent season as they continue to undertake reverent prayer and acts of charity as they prepare for the celebration of the birth of the Lord Jesus. One of the most inspirational elements of Christmas can be found in the story, as the former, our colleague just spoke about, in the story of the nativity where Mary and Joseph, unable to find an inn, and birth was given to the Lord Jesus in a humble manger, which was visited by the three wise men and shepherds from afar. The world must find comfort that despite how turbulent times can be, despite how uncertain events can seem, God will always find a way for his children to fulfill their purpose. The story of Christmas at every angle offers us hope and enlightenment, which we so need in the world right now. The story tells us that after Jesus was born, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream warning Joseph to flee in an effort to protect baby Jesus and Mary from Herod. As a will, we must find hope that whatever dangers, whatever threats face us, persistent prayer and faith in the Lord will ensure that the Lord protects us all. For me, the most special <clears throat> element of Christmas is kindness. Kindness has been a foundation of the Christmas story. Kindness has been a foundation of every faith in our world, and kindness is the one quality 
which has uplifted us as it will from time to time. Over my many years as a member of parliament, I have often looked forward to Christmas, as for many years my team and I have engaged on a week-long distribution of toys, of gifts, of relief for those in need. As a matter of fact, it was kindness, the same kindness which we all desired Christmas, which was a defi defining driver of the government I led. At Christmas, we always ensured we lowered prices on necessary food items. We ensured proper relief for the most vulnerable and delivered help to those most in need. Today, I cannot simply offer a generic message, Madam, because each day I see in the media so many of our citizens are in dire need. I've seen so many saying that they face a grim Christmas. And today, I make a call to government to have a heart. Christmas is not just about happy greetings, but about actions of love. Only last two weeks, thousands across the country were affected by floods. And today, I make a call for more assistance to be provided to those most in need. There are measures government can take to help the burdens of persons at this time. Temporary cutting of the cost of basic food items, which has been done before and did not bankrupt the Treasury. We did it before when we were in government. Let us continue to be our brothers and sisters keepers and ensure that our citizens feel some comfort and joy this Christmas. Madam Speaker, as I close once again, I take this opportunity to thank all the parliamentary staff who have worked tirelessly to support us as parliamentarians. On the behalf of the opposition and on my own behalf, I wish each and every one of you and across our land a joyous and blessed Christmas as well as a prosperous New Year. I thank you very much. Honourable Members, I too wish to offer warm greetings to the entire nation on the occasion of Christmas. Over the past couple of years, Christmas has been overshadowed by uncertainty of the pandemic. However, for many Trinbagonians this year, Christmas will be celebrated with a sense of hope for new beginnings. This year, let us not forget to be our brother's keeper as we prepare our homes and meals for the season. I urge you to also prepare your hearts by sharing with each other and spreading Christmas cheer through benevolence. I encourage you to give, give of your time, treasure, and talent to those less fortunate so as to ensure that we each do our part in fostering hope and happiness. Let us unite as we did during the pandemic and share empathetic love, a love that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has so taught us to share. As we enjoy our pastels, punch de creme, black cake, sorrel, and ginger beer. Let us remember to always be that beacon of hope and a symbol of peace and love for each other. As 2023 approaches, I take this opportunity to remind you that where there is respect, tolerance, hope, love, light, and life, the purpose of God will abide. On your behalf, I take the liberty to wish the clerks of both houses the procedural clerks, and all the staff of parliament who so diligently serve us all a holy, sacred, and joyous Christmas and a healthy and prosperous 2023. On behalf of the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, on, on behalf of my family and myself, I take this opportunity to wish you members and all of Trinidad and Tobago a very happy, holy, and safe Christmas and a bright and prosperous new year. Merry Christmas to you all. Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to a date to be fixed. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned to a date to be fixed.